tradition of giving all the right ingredients, uninhibited, and exposing the hard, cold facts about the Watchtower Society. <laughs> Disney. Well, there you all are, and hello, everyone, and welcome in to our program tonight, Awakening After the Watchtower. We've got a former Jehovah's Witness. He is from Tennessee, originally from Rhode Island, so he's a New England man. His name is Eric, and he's got a program that's going to help you tonight as you're leaving the Watchtower. So we're looking forward to his program. Let me bring Eric on right now. Hello, Eric. And hold on one second, Eric. I hit the wrong button here. Let's get you on. Add you to the stream. There you are. Hello, Eric. Hey, how's it going, everyone? How you doing, Rick? Well, I'll tell you, Eric, I, I feel really good tonight. I, I don't know what's going on here, but this, uh, I'll tell you, this announcement has really rocked the witness world. This is unbelievable. Uh, we, we had one of the most listened to programs that we've ever had, Eric. This is That's awesome. This is it's just really, really big what's going on, you know? Oh, for sure. Um, it's so big that, um, you know, I feel bad for all of us disfellowshipped ones. I've been, uh, you know, like you brought up Rich, Borgie, and and myself. Um, I'm talking about myself uh, being disfellowshipped twice. I, gee, I wish they would have made it easier, even though, like, it's still wrong. It's like, uh, you know, these guys aren't doing it out of love. They, it, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. We all did. We're all suspicious of Norway. But anyways, Rick, I just thought I'd add that. Uh, yeah, no, in fact, it's, uh, I'll, I'll tell you what, th this is not, at first I was talking to my wife, Susan, and she's thinking maybe at first this might get more people to come back to the meetings, get the memorial attendance up, but I think it's really going to backfire. I think a lot of the old timers are going to say enough is enough is enough, you know? Uh, me too. I agree, my man. Yeah, we're going to, um, we're going to have a good show tonight. We're going to talk about, um, did you have a double life uh, in the Watchtower? And some people, when I that I've told about this, I didn't live a double life in the Watchtower. But then again, like, what about something so simple as, uh, and maybe this is just my own personal experience, but just to give you guys an idea, what we're, we're talking about, all kinds of different double lives. How about something simple as going out in service, right? And you you gotta you you gotta uh, drive. That that's always fun. And uh, you know, you go in your car. And then, like everybody's coming in, you're like, "Oh shit!" And you like grab a CD real quick that might not, that some brothers and sisters might not <laughs> think is appropriate. You know, just little small things too can add up. But uh, we'll be talking about that tonight, and uh, I'm sure we'll be touching on the changes that have happened in uh, Watchtower's uh, JW uh, broadcasts or up governing body update. Excuse me. All right, we're trying but, to. Yeah, your video up oh here. yeah no problem no problem I'll, you tell me when it's ready and i'll just i'll, I'll keep talking and uh ahead, and yep. uh, get the get the people um uh prepared uh what we're gonna do but we're gonna have a good night guys and yeah so we're gonna talk about um a uh, double life I i'll start with my um my father's uh, small experience he i mean he did live a double life with pot for nine years uh nine or ten years but not even that i'm focusing on i'm focusing on uh, a really small thing is uh he told me that uh his dad was a Mormon converted to uh, Jehovah's Witness and abusive and uh, no sports, no chess. Chess wasn't allowed in the house. That's a war game. Uh, sports was competitive and resembled war in some twisted way. So my, my dad got a radio and he listened to the World Series and his team won. And as a kid, he went, yes. And he woke up my grandfather and my grandfather beat him up, you know, and uh, it's just my whole my my dad was uh, imbalanced in my life when he was a father with sports. It was everything sports. And it was because of the imbalance of not having it to begin with. And I know there's a lot of people listening in the audience. How many people were kept from playing um, high school games, you know, uh, something as simple as basketball? But, you know, um, talking about lying and talking about living a double life, uh, it looks like Rick has this video up. Um, this guy's name is Kurt Metzger, and a lot of you probably know him, and I'm probably saying his name wrong, but he's an ex-Jehovah's Witness. Um, and I've known about this video for a while, but I thought it was appropriate to play this tonight. I am warning everyone, if you got kids, there's a, maybe a few F-bombs. And if it goes past three minutes and 26 seconds, he talks about masturbation and the Jehovah's Witnesses. And I wasn't going to go there with y'all. 
but um, but we're gonna we're gonna see what his uh, take on Jehovah's Witnesses were in uh, living a double life. And uh, if Rick's ready to play that, we'll do that. He was on his knees in the alley in the back. And they're staring like, cut his ear off, cut his ear off, thou short me. He goes, yeah, man, I want to do it, but you know they're all yelling, so I'm just like, fuck it, man, I cut his ear off. And he's like, Oh, you got to speed up a little bit. Um, can you bring it to um, a minute 15? It's okay if you don't. All right, minute 15, okay. And then shut it off at 326. I relate to Art because he was going to be a rabbi. And uh, I was a minister. I actually was a minister. I was a Jehovah's Witness. And uh, I was born into it. Is anybody raised religious in here? This is two different stories, by the way, that connect in a very weird way. You were? What were you? Oh, that's the natural vampires versus werewolves of Jehovah's Witnesses. Oh, they don't like us. You know why? I, I used to live down south. They didn't like me because I didn't believe in hell. Like, why would you get mad at me for that? Well, people hear it and they're like, oh, you can't do your birthdays. And uh, I don't know, Prince, those are the two things. <laughs> it's not well known. It's just a regular doomsday cult. It's no big deal. Um, but I'm not bitter against it. And I, I, you know, I kind of appreciate it, you know, because it, it really taught me how to lie, you know? Like, if you raise religious, that's what it really gives you, the life skill of like who to lie to and when. <laughs> why like you you can't get that from a secular education you need like <laughs> higher stakes you know to really act like your life depends on it you know because your immortality fucking depends on it so that's when you really learn right it's a valuable skill to have i'm sure you got it in spades right you were like were you one of them like blah, 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 those guys yeah so that's the you see how you learn? You first you tell yourself this is God's language. That you tell yourself that, and that's reality. So other lies come easy once you know how to do that magic, right? And you get like a secret life. And you know when when religious people go bad, everyone jumps on them because they think you're not supposed to sin. But it, they're really just doing shit everybody does. It's just they built it up so much that they're not that kind of person. So that's why it's so devastating. You in your head, you're like, I'm not a guy that does that's like this. Right? So when I grew up out of the, the church I was in, I realized everybody was doing like soap opera, epic, just fucking and all kinds of crazy shit that I had no idea as a kid. Like I'm the sucker that followed it, I felt like. Because I really did. You know, like I was, re I was told never to masturbate. All right, Eric, that it? You there with us, Eric? I'm so sorry. My microphone was my, uh, was muted. All right. All right. Well, thank you, Rick. All right. Appreciate Maybe. it. Maybe, Amy. All righty. Thanks, Rick. Yep. So, wasn't that interesting, though, guys? Um, you know, he's got a good point about it. When, once you believe this crazy, bizarre um, unreality that you make a reality like the matrix almost you you make something that's not actual reality into a reality so once you once he he says once you buy that lie you know then it's easy to lie to everyone around around you and that's what the jehovah's witnesses do at the door to the householders when they say you're here to convert us but uh getting off of that he was talking about how they live double lives and it, and it absolutely is true i had to live one uh i was hiding smoking marijuana um, what else did I hide? Like I told you guys, CDs. What about um, if anybody out there was uh, going to the uh, rated R movie? The the worst thing that could happen to you is running to to a witness, right? <laughs> well, a witness that's not cool with that. <laughs> but uh, that's my that's my take on uh, on some of the things of living a double life. And and how sad, you know, my dad having to live a double life for baseball. I mean, come on, you know. 
um, that's something so small. Why, why do you got to hide that? And I used to have to hide like, uh, what was it? Pearl Jam for my father, right? He threw out one of my CDs because I had the F word on it. But then down the road, him and my wife and my brother, the three of them went to a Pearl Jam concert like years later. <laughs> and he hated the band, but then he ended up loving the band and him and my mom have a song together that they like. When, anyways, but we, we went through... Um, like mental hoops and gymnastics for these guys <clears throat> and they didn't let us have a normal life. So we were always maybe not making sure we don't swear around the right per or the wrong person or, and when you always got to keep your cool, um, it, it, it's, uh, what about drinking, right? You gotta, if you, if you like to drink a lot, you gotta hide that. There's always something that you're some little, whether it's major, um, or a small thing, but um, what do you guys think? Is there anyone on the phone that that has a story that they want to tell? That's cool. I I can keep going. Um, I thought I heard somebody. Good evening. Yeah, Eric. Oh, hello. Yeah, yeah, this is a too many phones. You're coming in and out, brother. Hear me? Someone else might be on as well, um, Eric. I I can hear you now, Tim. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, good subject. Um, yeah, thanks, man. Kurt Metzger. Yeah, I, I come across him on the internet and found out later he was a ex witness. Um, yeah, I, I actually like on a current like a well, you could call it conspiracy. I suppose, but stuff that goes on. He, he, knows, he knows a lot about a lot of things going on with the government of the world. He's a clue dude, and then I find out he's an ex-witness. Um, but just personally, I mean, I wasn't in the organisation and really part of 21, but when I was at school, yeah, the swear... The conference has been unlocked. I used to swear relentlessly, and, um, and I had to really tone it down. You had to learn to switch it off. And at one point during my school years, there's these witness kids that got on the same school bus. And so I had to remember not to swear in front of them. But, you know, <laughs> a couple of times you just, you know, I let out this, some pretty loud Fs and I was thinking he's going to dob me in for sure. But it, it never happened. So I don't know if, if they even heard. But you, that's just what you always had to do was just kind of watch what you said around certain people. Um, with, with other things, I, I wasn't interested in you know, living a full-on double life as such, but it was still a totally different life outside of the witness organisation. You had to act, yeah, it, you know, you virtually had to fit in with everyone else and then put on an act. And, and that's really what the organisation teaches you anyway. It teaches you to put on an act in indirectly, but also directly, because they're always concerned about what people see. So, so it's policy on one part for them to show you that this organisation cares about what's hidden and what's not. Like, you know, how many people know about this certain sin and the more that know, that's a bad. So what's that telling you? That's telling you keep things on the lowdown. And and so, yeah, it, 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 in that sense, I, I reckon the religion makes the biggest hypocrites because people live one way and they look like they're squeaky clean, but really so many of them aren't living that way, um, you know, yeah. But good topic. Anyway, Eric, I'll hear from other people. Thanks. Oh, thanks, Tim. Yeah, I appreciate it, man. And isn't it true? Wasn't it draining when you had to put the, the act on or whatever you called it, um, the, the show? You know, um, it, it, when you're inauthentic, it can really it can really take the energy out of you, you know, and not that I'm not saying we were completely unauthentic, um, but you know, some of us at times, you know, or and, and it's just because of Watchtower having such high uh standards or high high control over how we act how we feel how we what we do who we do it with you know but anyways i don't mean to rant everyone thanks tim great comment uh is there someone else that has a story to tell before i keep going just a quick comment uh eric yeah hey rich how you doing buddy i'm doing good i'm doing good good i think the biggest problem or the biggest thing that's hidden is alcoholism you know, particularly mm. among the elders and their wives. It's rampant. I was in that organization for over 20 years as a ministerial servant, worked with elders, hanging around with elders, 
and I saw it. I saw a lot of it. And then they have the audacity to go to a judicial meeting and throw somebody out of the congregation. They have this three-strike rule, which they don't tell you about. But if you report to the elders three different times that you were inebriated or just, you know, got a, a buzz on, that's all it mm-hmm. takes. They'll throw you out. It all depends on the politics of the three elders that are here in your judicial meeting. But drinking is a big, big problem. Also, you get a lot of wandering eyes with the males because they're so sexually suppressed. They go to the beach, their tongue is hanging out and their eyeballs are <laughs> the size of half you know, it's, it's just unbelievable. And they smirk at each other and they have one conduct, one code of conduct at the Kingdom Hall in another code of conduct outside of the Kingdom Hall. You're right. They hypocrites. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Rich. Uh, absolutely, man. Um, they are hypocrites, and you made you yeah. made some good points. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I, sorry, I thought I was. Please continue. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate those two last thoughts. You know, Mr. Borges, what he just mentioned about the alcoholism really is an extension of leading a double life when you think about it, because you're so repressed. That's kind of the only thing you can do. You couldn't do anything else. Like you said, you wanted to play sports, play music. You couldn't do anything, uh, or you had to do it at such a, you know, a, a minimal amount of time that you could never really uh, get good at it. So what's, what, what's the, what's the point, you know? But when you started off, you talked about, uh, Pro Jam album. I had a funny story. A buddy of mine asked me to help him renovate the circuit overseer garage. So here, here we go, you know, on a Saturday on our own time and on our own dime. And we're doing that. And uh, so I brought some CDs to listen to while we were working. One of which was, a, I think it was a Pearl Jam. And, it, and on the album cover, it's just a picture. It's the most innocent picture. It's a, it's a kid or a dog running through a green field. But when they took the picture, it got blurred. You know, it's like a motion picture. And they just used it anyway. So it's just kind of a cool album if you've ever seen it, if you like Pearl Jam. And uh, Circuit Overseer comes, he and his wife, after uh, having had dinner somewhere. And he walks past, and he says, oh, my God. And he picks up the CD. Now, I'm over in the corner someplace, you know, putting up drywall. So he picks up who's, and he reads the name, who's Pearl, Pearl Jam? I didn't know what this is. And he says it with such disgust. So I turn around, and I said, and I look, and he's holding my CD. So I walk straight to him in front of everybody. And I said, mine. What's, what? I said, it's my CD. What's the problem? And so he says, uh, oh, my God, this looks the money. I said, it's a, it's a kid or a dog running through a field. It's just blurry. What's the demonic about that? So then he just looked at me, and he got really angry, and he just looked at me, and, and he said, well, you shouldn't be listening to that. And he throws my CD down, and then he and his wife um, go, go into the uh, to their residence, which was connected to the Kingdom Hall. So when you, when you talked about that album at the beginning, that's uh, – <laughs> I had that same kind of incident happen. Thanks, here. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, it's funny how uh, because we, depending on the elder around the world, is depending whether what music or entertainment or movie or whatever is is good <laughs> for that for their congregation. Um, what was a, I'm trying to think of a band that um, oh, my father hated, which he had the right to, I guess, a little bit. Oh, Rage Against the Machine. <laughs> I had that when I was like maybe 14 or 15, 16, somewhere around that years old. And man, when he found that cassette tape, that shows my age. When he found that cassette tape, he was so mad at me. He, he said, you listen to music that says, uh, F you, I, don't, I won't do what you tell me. And I said, yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know. It was against the establishment uh, back in the day. So it wasn't just complete like um, rebelliousness, you know? Um, but hey, anyways, I'm right, I'm right I one of my favorite bands. <laughs> I, I liked them at one point. I did. Uh, I don't. I don't know if they ever got back together. And I. I really liked Audio Slave. Um, they were my favorite with uh, the band of Rage Against the Machine with um, Chris Cornell, and he passed too. Uh, that's sad. But yeah. Anyways, I digress. Well, they, didn't, they didn't get back together, as far as I know. Yeah. <clears throat> But it's just a con- level of control that they um, have over us, um, and it just and everything. I mean, yeah. So what if the music is profane, prof- profane, or has profanity in it? Like, 
I mean, it just, it, it, who, who is it to you to, to, or for the governing body to tell everybody what to do with themselves? And it's created, uh, and, and, and let's face it, we're all imperfect humans. At some point, people are just going to, are, are just not going to tell um, other people so that they don't, um, you know, stir their lives up in a, in a, or stir a hornet's nest up. <laughs> I, I thought I'd just say hello real quick to um, Nadine and to Fixing My Faith and uh, to everybody in the comments section. Uh, thank you all. Um, I know I'm missing some people, but. <laughs> Hope you got a good night's sleep. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hey, Keith Silver, by the way. Nice to see you here. Your mom likes Motorhead. That's pretty cool. Uh, my mother would not like Motorhead at all. <laughs> Is that the Ace of Spades? Uh, one of those songs they have, I think. Yeah, man, my mom, <laughs> my mom would freak if she heard that. Um, uh, th there was a, a an older band uh, that my my uncle um, used to get uh, not that old, but uh, what what band was it? I can't think of it. But it had a slow start, and um, my grandmother was like, "Oh, this is nice," and then it turns up to be a rocking song. <laughs> oh, this is horrible! If the witnesses were were taught to, that like even heavy metal or rock and roll or rap, all of it's bad, but it's it's not true, and we we had to tiptoe around that just to be comfortable in our lives. You know, is there someone that um, on the phone that wants to say something? Fine. Just want to be sure you get a good night's sleep. We're going to crash. I'm here. Do you hear me? Yeah, I hear someone in the background, kind of, too. Um, I, I don't know if you're on yeah. speakerphone. I can barely hear you. Uh, whoever's trying to talk, go ahead. This, this is your wife. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> Hey, honey. The subject, was a good, the subject was a good idea to me because I feel like the um, the culture that is created by Jehovah's Witnesses is um, that it forces you in the most innocent ways to lead a double life. Just as simple as the um, judgment that they encourage in people where you have to constantly judge everyone around you to make sure they're good association or this or that. And um, it forces people to, um, you're also told that you, you can't fumble your brother. And if these people are so weak and sad that everything stumbles them and you can't fumble your brother, it forces you into a double life. So I thought this would be a good subject to talk about because um, they force you into a double life for the stupidest things. And um, for instance, like my mom, she was just so judgmental of me that I always felt like I was leading a double life because I had to hide who I was from her because she was so judgmental of everything and so harsh because of the organization. And it created a lot of issues with me. And I believe it creates a lot of issues with other people because it's not normal that we're always appealing to everyone else around us when they're narcissists and they're controlling it's craziness. It's craziness. And this is the environment that we are all, a lot of us grew up in or that the organization encourages us to be a part of. So the whole double life thing, it, it comes with a stigma. So a lot of people that are listening might be like, I didn't lead a double life. But you were forced to one way or another because you had to hide something about yourself to somebody. And that's, that's why I thought it was a good subject. So I think that anybody that's mm -hmm. listening, especially JP, if you're listening right now, your whole, your whole uh, story about um, ch yes. chest and having a lie about it, these are subjects that are really good for us to talk about because it's therapeutic because um, we may not see that we were leading double lives, but um, something as simple, I'll give you, uh, for instance, with my mother. She didn't want me to be friends with any of my friends that I grew up with that were Jehovah's Witnesses because they no longer were Jehovah's Witnesses. But I'm loyal and I believed in true friendships and I wasn't that type of Jehovah's Witness. So I still love the people that left the organization. I just, I did have that kind of like attitude where I hope they would always return, but I was loving. And one of my, the, um, the, the girl that I grew up with in the organization, she was my best friend since third grade. She left, but she, and she got married to the Catholic church. I had to, I had to lie to my mother that I was um, in the wedding. I had to tell my mother 
can can someone hear me? Yeah, we're we're here, but babe. I can hear you. Okay, I thought I heard someone talk. There might be someone unmuted on the other line. Go oh, go ahead. Mom? We're listening. Okay, my, but my mother, she um she didn't want me to be friends with these people. And unfortunately I was a pushover Jehovah's Witness, like some of us tend to be, because that's the culture we grew up in, and that's who we're told to be is pushover Jehovah's Witnesses. So what I had to do to be in my um best friend's wedding even though it was completely innocent, is I had to tell my mom that I, I flew out of um, Florida and that I was already back in New England, but I actually had rented a hotel room so that I could be in the wedding, and I went through with the wedding with her. And when I was in the Catholic Church, I didn't do any of um, their traditions or their rituals. And um, I, I, you know, I, I, I still believed in being a Jehovah's Witness. It's just the most innocent things that you do, they make you a double lifer over it. And I think that anybody that's listening right now, we would love to hear your stories because you know there's one thing or another that they make you a double lifer over. And someone that's just exactly drinks true. alcohol. Oh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, please. Thank you. I'm done. Thank you. That's exactly true. And if you excel in a sport, they try to say, well, you know, Thank you, Desiree. Team would like to have you, maybe. They try to say, well, you can't do that. Or if you wanted to go to a rock concert and it, it didn't involve being a pot smoker or anything, it's just going to an expensive rock concert or going to an inexpensive cover band where you're jumping up and down, you're drinking a soda, you're burning calories, it's fun, it's good for the brain, <laughs> and they try to make it like it's some sort of terrible thing to do. Gym membership? sports, things that would be prescribed to you so that you don't overeat, so you're not an alcoholic, all the things that are healthy, unless it's Kingdom Hall and too much cake, and and as Dick Borgie said, secret drinking, there's a million different healthy things that we all should and could and can do, and they made every one of them sound like they were wrong. Amen. That's the point. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Can I can I speak up? Yeah. Just hold on one second. I just wanted to say thank you to Desiree and Pixie for for um, calling in and adding her story. And I just wanted to add to Desiree's story just real quick before we move on to the next caller. Just that um, I want to let the audience know that she really had an unhealthy mother. We both did actually. We both had really narcissistic mothers. Um, but like. Renee, especially my mom, not so much, but Renee, uh, uh, Desiree's mom, I, I guess I don't call her mom because I'm so disconnected from her. Um, she, she, um, is really extreme and she, she would irritate everyone in the audience if you were around her because she's everyone else's conscience. Eric, should you be watching th this movie? Is it rated R? Eric, I don't know if this might be demonized. Eric, it's just like, oh God. The, the, and, and she gets angry, like not just angry, but like, like she had a meltdown with Desiree and I, when we were at the convention, I don't even, to this day, I don't remember what it was, but everybody looked horrified because she was screaming in the top of her lungs at us. And I just took Desiree's hand. We were engaged and we ran away. <laughs> That's all you could do in a situation like that. But some people like Desiree did have to go really far out of their way to live a double life just to keep peace in their life because other people are judging so harshly around them. But um, go ahead. Was there someone that wanted to give a comment? Hi, yeah, yeah. This, is, this is Joe. How are you? Oh, hey, Joe. Sorry to, to put you on the back burner for a second. No, I'm so glad to listen. I, I really have to commend Desiree for speaking up about what she did. She's talking about trueness. Yep. Being true to ourselves. And that's something that a child, is, a, a, a young person, it, it, you know, is working on. They, they, they don't understand what's their trueness. They, they can show it at times, but then maybe they, they start to hide it because they feel they're going to be rejected. You mm -hmm. know, it's, it's, it's such a common thing because a child wants to be accepted. And as we take that further on into life, you know, it, it, it shouldn't be, it's not something that's supposed to be exploited by others or manipulated. You know, and a good parent is not going to do that. A good parent is going to support a person who's dealing 
with their self-concept, their trueness, their needs. Well, this is where it's that Watchtower Society knew people better than they knew themselves. They knew that there would be vulnerable people that, that were struggling with and still trying to develop their trueness, but yet they intercepted them at a point and and, and it, they started to manipulate and control and exploit them, and yeah. it, it, it held out it held out acceptance to them. And how dare they live up to any of their trueness? Otherwise, they would reject them. You would become an unworthy uh, a, a person in the congregation, and so it puts everybody under this this terrible uh, burden of rejection. And so, as Desiree brought out, you know, the, the, the most logical thing at that point for a person to do is, is, to, uh, is to be untrue to themselves just for acceptance. And see, that's not a loving relationship at all. That's a very controlling relationship. And until a person understands that about themselves and unless they're around someone who loves them, they're going to be controlled. They're going to be manipulated. They're going to be exploited and abused. And that's exactly everything that's been taking place in this organization. We're watching people grow up. We're watching people come out and come to understand that they have needs, that they need self-acceptance as well as acceptance by others. But the problem is, we, we don't ever want to give away our trueness just to be accepted. It's a bad, that's a bad bargain to give up our trueness to, to receive something from someone else just so that they accept us. It's a very, very bad transaction. And so many people are coming to understand this. The ones coming out and we're grateful to be able to be with people that are doing this. Um, friends here too. Hi, Eric. Good show. Hey, tonight. Fran. Oh, thank you, hon. Nice How you guys you. doing? Nice to hear. Good, good. We're uh, actually yeah. in Arlington, Virginia. We've had, so far, we started our uh, trip, and we've had three meetups so far. Yesterday, we were in uh, Scranton, PA. We met up with six people plus ourselves. And then uh, in Harrisburg, we met up with a team. P- Emo couple, a really nice couple, older couple. And mm. today we just had, we were in um, Bethesda, Maryland, and we, there was four of us. There was Aaron, if Aaron's listening. Hi, Aaron. And Lisa from Dinah Lost with her husband and two children. And Cam from North Carolina and Manny from uh, Virginia. We had a nice meetup. Tomorrow we're going to meet up near uh, Redmond, uh, Richmond, excuse me, Richmond, Virginia. So it's a three-week XJW North. What do we call this? East Coast Mm -hmm. trip. (laughs) Uh, Is this is this trip including um, my hometown in Rhode Island? Like as you said, you were going, or did you already do that? Okay, we're going to end up in Massachusetts and near Rhode Island. There's going to be some folks. Rhode Island coming up. One of them is well, we board, Yeah, we border it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it'll be the yeah. first first weekend in April. We'll keep you posted. Oh, uh, if if you um if you're if you're near um Rhode Island um you might uh be in near Fall River, Massachusetts. It's like being in Little Portugal. <laughs> wow. <laughs> the best wow. the best Portuguese food you'll ever have, though. <clears throat> well, thank you. It's good to hear it. You know that, Dan. Fall River, Man. Fall River, Man. Yeah. yeah. It, it's not a it's not yeah. a great neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> it's a food that it's a food that counts, Eric. Yeah. <laughs> Eric, I, I, well, I repeat, Eric, that's it's, awesome it's, that you guys are doing. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> it's a joy, Eric, to hear to hear that's Desiree right. speak up about. Isn't it? It's good to hear my my better half. <laughs> It is a joy to hear speak up on it. It's the, that strength that's speaking at that point. That's right. And it's realizing that we have something we have to protect as individuals. And that's our trueness. 
-hmm. Otherwise, unsavory and bad characters will get to get us to steal and give away our trueness yep. for something inferior and something that that the Watchtower Society called truth, yeah. which is not yeah. truth. It's lies and it's false promises. And it's, it's a treasure and it's a pleasure to watch people wake up and realize that, that it's not the truth and they need to protect their, their personal trueness. And we're watching that take place. We're hearing it. And that's what gives us all of our, our joy when we hear and see that. We're so glad to be a part of that. And I'm going to continue to recommend people to live your trueness. Mm -hmm. And Yeah, you just did a show about that, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. Yep, it was a really powerful show. A lot of good points. You're you're right. Um, because well, otherwise we're in, we're being inauthentic to ourselves. So we're 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 being dishonest with ourselves from the start, and then it trickles down that, to everyone else. And that ends up literally living the lie, the very opposite of what a person chose to do to live the truth. You see, that's the trick. That's the snare that that society got people to do to give up their trueness for the lie that they put forth also that they can manipulate and exploit people it's criminal it's absolutely criminal it's a criminal organization that's harmful toward people it's damaging we're seeing the damage all the time with individuals but but on the other side we're also seeing the healing taking place and we're seeing people coming out stronger mm -hmm. because they're understanding themselves and what's going on and this is something that we're very thankful to be a part of and what i say is keep on doing things that are strengthening for you for yourself and for each other mm -hmm. uh, yeah yeah the people coming out are beautiful mm -hmm. and, you, and we need to continue to help each other do that and i'm so thankful to be a part of this yeah thank you eric for what you oh and yeah are doing oh, yeah. Yeah. And and thank you guys for um for the show that you you're continuing to do on on um fixing my faith. You know, we appreciate uh you guys um uh uniting our our family together. Well, all of you members are the stars. Mm -hmm. You're the stars. That's right. <laughs> ah, we'll keep listening. Well, thank you guys. All righty. Well, thank you so much for coming on. We appreciate it. And um I hope I hope you have a safe trip. It's really cool that you guys are doing that. <laughs> All right. Take care. Well, there we have it, huh? It's always good to hear from Fran and Joe. Hey, Stefan. Oh, hey, Stefan. Hello. Hi, Stefan. Hi. Be you. safe out there. Hello. Nice to hear you as well. Yeah. Be safe out there. there. Thank you. Be safe. Thanks, yeah, it's a, challenge. it's a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> In Washington, yeah. it was oh, Washington, Virginia. It's, it's horrible. Oh, boy. Don't, don't you know, go safely through. I have to say, I am so proud of you two guys because I don't know if you know the story here, but uh, Fran and Joe and I all called in on the same day. Yeah. Oh, well, no I, kidding. <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah, I have been listening for months, but I just never felt like I had anything to say. We like each other a beer. Yeah, the two of us, the three of us, all called in at the same time, and they they have since then they just taken off like gang fire. They had their own channel. They still have their own channel. They were. I mean, I'm just so proud of them. I, I, I you know. I, I, I just, I could spit. I'm so proud of them. That's all I want to say. Stephen, yeah, but you know what? Joe's birthday is March 1st, mine is March 2nd, and yours is March 3rd. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly right. Don't forget that. Yeah. Don't forget that. A lot of good stuff happened in March. That's all I can tell you. We, we, look, Stefan, we owe each other a beer. Okay. We'll see, we'll see each other at the next protest. So uh, we'll definitely do that. Oh, Sounds great. Good. Or sooner. Yeah. Or sooner. All right. Uh, before you go, Joe and Fran, uh, one thing I was going to say to you guys is um, that you, um, well, I'm losing my train of thought. Hold on. Oh, um, when we were, t when we were talking about PMOs, um, 
the, or you talked about PMOs a little bit and you guys know, I, I believe, I, I don't want to speak for you, but I think, you know, a lot of PMOs and, um, through, through this journey yeah. and the P, the PMOs have to live a double life too. Like our, our CIA, CIA man, you know, certain people that, yeah. uh, have to yeah. have to live a double life and they're not doing anything wrong. This is the point. And, and it's like that, you know, especially yeah. for older ones, you, you guys that are in your older age, you, you should I mean, everyone should do what they want to do and everyone should have freedom of choice and decision in the mind of their own. But I mean, it, it's, it, there's, there's no one that their watchtower isn't willing to go after, whether it be minors, the elderly, mm-hmm. handicapped people, it doesn't matter. <laughs> if you don't follow that to right. suit, they'll paint you in a bad position when you don't deserve it. And the point, right. And the point here, Eric, it's not, it's not a simple situation of, True versus untrue. It's not. It's a journey. It, it's a path that a person takes. And it's not a straight path sometimes. It really isn't. And so all the PMOs that are out there, I know, I know that they're struggling to work out their situation, to minimize the losses that they know that they potentially could suffer. I know that. And they know that. And that's why we have to have a lot of understanding and support for them while they're working out that difficult situation. I know we went through that, and frankly, we're still, you could call it suffering because of that. But it's, again, that's part of that, that journey for trueness, that, that there, there's costs. There's a, there's a cost for it. Mm-hmm. But frankly, yeah. uh, the cost for being untrue and lying and living, li- literally living a lie, that, that's, you're losing everything. The, the person that literally lives and, and, and trusts and lies, even if, they're conf- even if they're duped by it, it's still a tremendous loss. Because in the end, they're going to have to face that all they did was live the lie. Even if they just realized it, they can do nothing about it at that point except acknowledge it. So the sooner any of us, any of us uh, can, you know, continue to, you know, refine our lives just to live a little truer and, and to manage the losses in a way that, that we can accept, the better it really is. Because otherwise, it's, it's very hard on a person to live with that conflict in their life. It really is. Humans need to live with trueness. We really do. Mm-hmm. It's not the truth that we need to know. It's our own personal trueness that we need to know. It's because like, look at the, look at the uh, politicians. Stuff. Some of the politicians that are lying really hardcore. They don't. They don't look comfortable yeah. while they're doing it. No. Oh my. Goodness. Oh yeah. my goodness. Can, Can I make a point? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Hey, Desiree, go ahead. Oh, I was just thinking uh, along with what what um, he's saying is that um, they. Um, take away. Um, well, oh, I'm so sorry. I, I I'll think of it later. My brain doesn't work as good as it used to. Sorry. Oh, it's okay, hon. <laughs> when it comes back, just interrupt us. Yeah, we're listening, Des. Right. <laughs> but in, anyways, um, you, think, you know, Desiree, it, it truly it's inspiring. Desiree is saying things that's making her strong. It strengthens mm-hmm. me yeah. because it inspires us. Okay. And I'm and, and I'm, I'm so I'm proud of not only her, but you, Eric, and, and everyone that's, you know, working at this because it's uh, it's difficult and it's stressful. But there's rewards. There are rewards in this. And, and that's the beautiful part. Some of us are healers and some of us are speakers and we all can contribute in our own way, even if it's just a quick comment and, uh, or a story to tell or whatever it may be. Everyone, everyone. Otherwise, you know what, I, uh, Joe, if we weren't, if, if the XJW community wasn't doing what they've been doing for so many years, we might not be in this place where (laughs) the governing body announced that you could sisters can wear slacks. I mean, really, we must live rent free in their minds. Uh, I mean, where did they get that? That's not even anything to do with the courts, right? I think Desiree brought that up to me. Uh, that that's just that must be just XJWs getting in their mind because because they must think about it and like it's it is ridiculous for us to have a dress code to go to the meeting. 
you know, they, they are so off base, it's not funny. But, mm. but I mean, they're, on the one side is the governing body that are acting like narcissistic control freaks. But the other side of it, and the only thing that gives them power are the members left in who, who, who go on their decisions and who build them up and who are codependents. They're the ones that give them power. They feed the narcissists what they're looking for. And that's why I, 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 we're so proud of the ones that, that are, are not doing that, the ones that are choosing to back off and choosing to stop giving them power. And, yep. and I know it's, it's difficult at times because it means, you know, exposing yourself. But we're finding more and more people willing to do that. We're here. We're, we're, we're meeting people who are willing to oppose what the elders are saying, to not go according to what they're saying. They're willing to. And they're, you know, they're, they're feeling strong for it. And, and it, everyone in their own turn. And that's what we're seeing. So let's keep supporting each other and doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. Amen to that. <laughs> well said. Yeah. Really, really nice to hear so many brothers in the last couple of phone calls uh, mentioning that you have to live in your own truth. That is so important. And I'd like to throw out a truth about six screens that I think just really needs to be said. Um, I don't know if, if a lot of the audience knows this or not, but, you know, Rick spends about $500 a month to fund six screens, many platforms. Wow. And you know, that is $6,000 a year out of his pocket. And he's been doing it for 20 years. And if you do the math, that is $120,000 out of Rick's pocket. Rick is 75 years old, same as me. And, you know, he's climbing ladders, carrying heavy signs up and down, you know, ladders. And yet he's telling his audience, don't send any money. That is kind of unique uh, amongst evangelists. You know, you know why? You know why, Rich? It's because it's because um, Rick is a real Christian, and he is serving the people, not being served. Unlike the governing body, these these governing nobodies, these these ass clowns that are assuming that they're Moses, and uh, and or when Jesus was on the earth, he served. That's why he was poor. That's why he didn't have a place to rest his head. That's why he, he lived from house to house and he uh, was the Messiah because he showed love and he served the people. He, he didn't um, expect to be served. And it's the opposite with you could almost call a, the governing body Antichrist, in my opinion. But uh, I thought it was a good point. I was just going to add to that. Yeah, you, you're exactly you're exactly right on that. At least if I could just finish. You know, we all I'm know so that Jeffrey Jackson driving a Bentley. All right half a million dollar car. They're all, you know, filthy and rich, but they hide it. Well, they hide everything else. They're filthy rich. You know, if Rick wanted to be on a governing body, he could have. Um, he's not going, he didn't go in that direction. That is for sure. And I think people should understand that Rick's planning on spending $15,000 to rent the auditorium for the conference. And that money's coming from Rick and Sue's bank account. That's where it's coming from. And I would, um, I really hope Rick monetize, monetizes Six Greens soon. Because it's just not fair for a man of his age to be working as hard as he's doing. And, it, and it's, it's not the kind of work that a man 75 years old should be doing. I know that uh, Connie and myself, we're going to be giving Rick and Sue an envelope in Boston to defray the cost of the um, auditorium rental. I just, Rick didn't, Rick didn't ask me to say this. This is all on my own. He's probably going to call me tomorrow and say, Jake, you shouldn't have said that. I don't need money. I'll, I'll work and earn it. But I just want the audience to know that uh, Rick and Sue are going to be celebrating their 10th anniversary next weekend. It'd be nice if somebody could 
send them a card or, you know, just let them both know how What's much the date? they are. Appreciate it. Um, it's the 24th, the Sunday. Or it could be the 23rd. I think it's the 24th. Thanks, buddy. Hey, Rich, I, I, this, is, Rich, this is Joe, and I appreciate you for mentioning that. And, and see, it's the contributions that ones like Rick and you make that inspires <laughs> us to do the same, to make the contributions that we, we can make. It, it, it's, it, that's what moves us, is the, ins the inspiration. And uh, it, it gets us to do everything that we, we can do. We see others, for example, like the elder that, uh, that was in, that was uh, that was interviewed and, and chose to give his phone number and offer to people to call him. We called him, and then we chose to go out and do the same. It was inspiration like that that moves us to do that, and we see that we're seeing that constantly. And um, that's to me, to me, that's spirit. That's that's motivating spirit that, that works among the people that love each other. And that's the thing that's going to make every, all of this work, work as it is. That's, that's the very thing that we trust. We have faith in that. And, uh, and we're, we're seeing that work and happen right now. And, of course, we're going to support Rick, too, and what, what he's doing. Well, you're certainly right, Joe. You're certainly right. And I, I would just add what a lot of people don't know. He's a business genius. He's had a lot of people working for him. He has very good company and so forth. And he's not going that route. He spends 40 or 50 hours just answering emails and telephones and, and doing research for six screens in everybody benefits. And, you know, I, I just think that it would be nice if the audience um, could show some kind of form of appreciation. I am not soliciting money for Rick. Uh -uh, no, he wouldn't take it anyway. <laughs> I just uh, I sent him an anniversary card, and I I put a, um, a, a credit card in there uh, for Longhorn, you know, um, you know th th that's that's just me. That's you know I, I would just mention that Rich because uh, we try to um, mention the anniversaries and birthdays on the show. So I'm glad you did, and yeah. we're yeah. we're going to send them a card too. So I'm, I'm glad you mentioned it. And also, are you and Connie? Are you in um, South Carolina? Yes, easily. We're going to be in Charleston on Friday, March 22nd. Are you anywhere near Charleston? I think we are. Um, frankly, I, <laughs> I just got here. Uh, we've been so busy. Yeah, uh, yeah I'm exploring. You have to play the um, I'll have to look at a map. I don't know, but yeah. give us a call. Yeah. When, yeah. when did you move there, Rich? Right in Charlestown. It would be nice to meet up with you. Charleston, thank you. Uh, uh, so, yeah, we we'll, moved we'll give you a call. That would be great. August the 18th, we, we moved there. Oh, it's all new to you. Yeah, everything's new. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice. Yeah, well, it would be nice to meet up with you. We're going to be, like I said, we're going to be meeting a couple other folks in Charleston. So maybe we can all meet together. That would be nice. I'd like to throw something else out, if I could, Eric. I'll, I'll just do it for a minute. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Thank, thank you, Joe and Fran. Oh, you know, you can stay on if you want. I'm just... Uh, just wanted to say uh, I appreciate you, what you guys do, too. Um, you do a lot for our community. Thank Go ahead, Rick. Rick. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, one of the things that really kind of upsets me is, you know, someone will call in with a comment, and then Rick will follow up with his comment. Now, I don't think there's anybody in the world that has more insight. Even Barbara Anderson, I think Rick has way more insight, although she lived it. But he's probably the smartest guy in the world when it comes to six screens and knowing all the ins and outs of what's happening, you know, and, and, and so forth on that. And he could have easily spent that time, you know, doing a business and making himself wealthy. The other thing I want to say about six screens is this. 
when somebody comments and then Rick comments behind that, right? And somebody gets on here, Rick, 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 Rick. Hey, wait a minute. You know, let the man finish saying something. And I know when I'm doing a program with me and Connie doing a program, you know, we'll say what we have to say. Then we'll say, hey, hit star six if you want to make a comment. You don't necessarily, you know, have to jump in and interrupt somebody. I had a problem last week. Um, I don't have a, I don't have a, a kill switch here on on my end down here in uh, South Carolina. I don't have a control panel, and you get two guys arguing for hours, you know, on something silly, you know. Say what you got to say, you know, and, and get off. I mean, we we love comments, but you know, you're just going on and on and on and on and on, and you know, it you, you, you takes you 20 minutes to make a simple point. I just think you ought to just think about stuff before you comment. That's all I want to say. I I, I don't know if I'm reaching anybody with this, but um, there should be some kind of decorum, especially when Rick's talking. I I really hate it when people interrupt him. Let let him finish what he's going to say, and then he'll he'll say something like the lines are open or it's star six. Hey, Rick. Good program. The uh, the the um the late night program that you and I do on separate weeks it's like the wild I know um, Constance it's like the um, wild wild west <laughs> you know <laughs> you don't know what's coming at you sometimes it's been pretty chill night tonight we've had a uh we've had a lot to break down uh with all these new uh, adjustments um that that kind of feel like a slap in the face to disfellowship people to be honest with you because I'm like nothing's changed because they still are going to decide if you're repentant or not. And that's the whole problem. That That's that's the whole problem that you can't figure that out. See, they're still failing the um, prodigal son, right? Um, analogy or whatever you call it. Uh, they're still failing that because the father forgave instantly without asking any questions. They're still doing it. They right. haven't changed a damn thing, really, in my opinion. I mean, I know they have, you know, but think about how, how it's going to be, right? How awkward. They even made the video awkward with where you see the man talk to the woman who's disfellowshipped and he's like, hi. And she's like, oh, hi. And he's like, it's really good to see you. None of it seemed fluent. And it was just awkward and weird. And she said, thanks and walked away. That's exactly how it's going to go down. It's going to be weird because everyone's used to being treated like a leper. <laughs> you know, Eric, if I can. Yeah. Yeah, Eric, did see that's a wonderful opportunity now for people, members, to stand up for their own dignity and for their self worth and reject their offer and show it by by their resisting it, by leaving. It, it it's an opportunity. See, anytime the governing body does something like that, they look for the power of of compliance yeah. from the ones that are in. They are mm-hmm. in such a powerful, a powerful position, a powerful position to show their lack of support. And this is where, from the ones that we're meeting, we're finding out that they're, they're not giving their support anymore like they normally would. They're, they're realizing they don't have to be those scared little sheep that have to follow. Uh, and, and we're hearing that. And we're and it's so it's so nice to hear. So they they're in a, such a powerful position to exercise uh, power by not complying, by not showing such appreciation for their for their uh, for their uh, the, the um, offers that they're making. Mm-hmm. That they have to stand up for their dignity, mm-hmm. and that strengthens them to do what they have to do when they do that. Yep, absolutely. Can I? Can I? Can I go along with that? Go ahead, Des. Um, Joe has just been making so many good points, and my brain does not work like it used to. But um, I, I agree so much because what they do to us is they they tie your hands behind your back. And they tell you that um, your actions um, matter more than um, 
like what you do and your personal decisions matter more than someone else's conscience. And you can, it's funny because they have all these people that can say they're anointed and they can say it's this mental illness. But um, all these people that are mentally ill can dictate um, yourself in this organization. They, they give that power to other people because they tell you that they tell, or, or they tell the people that um, you're, you're, you can't stumble someone else. But this per- person can be batshit crazy and they can think they're the anointed. And that's sure. okay. <laughs> but right. you, still have to, you still have to live your life according to um, the craziness of that person's conscience. And uh, absolutely, whatever Joe and Fran are saying about true to yourself, or I mean, that's exactly ha- how I feel about it. And um, it's so sad because there's so many people in the organization. Uh, the PIMO is a thing for a reason. That's the perfect, ex- that's a, an exemplification of their policies that you, that you have to be what other people want you to be, not who you are. And it's perfect that that um, I'm, I, I it's it's perfect that he's bringing out that um, they don't uh, about uh, about self expression and they stunt that and stunting that is it's it's the core of your being and anybody that's listening right now I hope you comment because you have to know that somewhere deep inside of you they have stunted you somehow that they have kept you from being your true self somehow. And you could be a really good person, but they can stunt you from being a good person. Why? Because they don't want you to have empathy for a disfellowship person. They give her the example of, I'm sorry, um, I, 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 the, uh, the Bible matters to me, but I'm angry about it. So I don't, I don't retain it. Um, but they bring out the example of like, well, Jehovah punished these people and no, no one should have feel empathy for them. That's disgusting. Um, that's disgusting. Um, he, they're stunting our empathy too. They're stunting our, uh, uh, the qualities that Jesus, I, I mean, if you're a Christian and you believe whether, whether or not even you're, you're an atheist, they stunt the qualities that make you a better person. And you have to live by someone else's conscience, which could be, according to their own standards, a person that they consider crazy. Yep. Um, yeah. um, I'm, there's a lot yeah. more to say, but that's, that's just... De- De- Desiree, you, you make my mind work so much. You're, you're doing such <laughs> good insight. The, the people that love you will support your trueness. People yeah. that don't love you will Especially will undermine... when it's pure and it's for goodness. It's crazy right. that they, they demonize they demonize the most pure heart, yeah. you know? Because, it's they, weird. They see, they, they undermine that so that they can manipulate and exploit people. Yes. That's why they do that. That's why it's yes. so important to protect and enforce and profess your trueness and support yes. others in theirs. Yes. It's just Especially so important. Especially when it's a beautiful person who you are. If you're one of those people that... For, say the elite that that say you will own nothing and eat bugs and be happy. Like maybe these yeah. people need to be looked at. But when you yeah. have a true heart towards God and you love and you actually are looking out for these people that are being misled, they de- they demonize you like you're worse than the elite. That the people that they're saying take the jab, you know, you, you you know the story, brother. I know you you're smart enough. Desiree, they're scared of us because of our power of goodness. They're scared and of truth. us. And truth. And truth. Yep. Because that's right. it's working out against them that we know the that's truth. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And yeah. we don't ever want to play into their hand. We have because out of, of a lack of experience, because of, you know, uh, 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 you know just our immaturity, um, emotional immaturity at times. But yet as we grow and mature, we realize I'm going to support the good that I'm doing. I'm not going to let someone undermine it. I'm going to yeah. defend it and I'm yeah. going to project it. And it helps yeah. others do the same thing. You They're know what's funny? They're scared. It's the most, 
the most evil regimes of history are playing by a similar playbook. It's just that these people aren't completely evil, but they, they're the, to hijack your relationship with God is pretty evil, but it's like, they don't want you to go to war and kill a bunch of people. But on the other hand, <laughs> they, but they can, people, so. <laughs> but Samuel Hurd's ready to fight. <laughs> Hopefully, hopefully, um, hopefully he doesn't consider the whole world hummingbird. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> All the hummingbirds will be stone dead. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I was really shocked. I, I actually laughed out loud when I saw that video when he admitted to killing a bird to see if he had a, was a crack shot. And I'm just like, what? Did you just admit? <laughs> Sorry to get sidetracked, everybody. <laughs> Des got me down a place. <laughs> oh, that's good. Hey, if JP's listening, please call in and give us your story. We want to hear it. <laughs> oh, she's, putting here. The, she's putting the pressure hey, on you, man. You. There you go. There he is. Hey, How's it going, brother? Good. How you doing? Thank you. I, I want to hear your story. It's a really good one. Well, with the thing I was thinking like tonight with as far as like living a double life, it's uh, especially a little, but especially being um, like raised in, I think, you know, as soon as you can comprehend things and understand, you know, the what the religion really puts on you, which starts probably from the age around five or six that's really when you start to live a double life and stuff, because I think like Joe was saying earlier, you know, with kids, they just want to be accepted in that. And that's the primary thing is like a youngster when you're growing up is you're just learning the ropes of, of life to learn how to get along in this world that we live in. That's a very strange and confusing place without, the world of Jehovah's Witnesses being involved in your life as it is. So you're trying to learn this and then there's all these rules and stuff that you learn as you're growing up. But I remember some of the first times as being aware of that I was actually living a double life is like, I remember uh, my parents were divorced and my father was an apostate and he had been raised as a witness, but when he left, you know, I would have to go visit him and he lived on the other side of the country. He lived in West Virginia and my mother and I lived in California and she was a full blown witness and she still is to this day. And, um, this is, you know, as a youngster, like real young, I would have to go there, like get on a plane by myself from out of LAX and fly all the way over there when I was like eight years old by myself on a plane or even younger, not like around seven. And I would, and I would go there on my uh, summer break and winter, winter vacation, which happened to fall during Christmas time. And then summertime, my birthday's in July. So it always happened around my birthday. So even though my father was a, raised as a witness he left later but for some reason and i don't even understand to this day he always really insisted on me celebrating the holidays and all that and put tons of pressure on me really unnecessary pressure since he was raised in the organization i don't know if it was from his uh because he ended up getting remarried so i don't know if it was from his wife or that that he got that pressure but it was it was an overwhelming amount of pressure always to celebrate my birthday and Christmas and then an overwhelming amount of pressure from my mother, you know, to not do it. And, you know, I would go visit them and a lot of times I would celebrate the holidays, my birthday and that, even though I knew it was wrong, you know, according to witnesses and even my mom, she would always call me like the day after Christmas or the day after my birthday, because she would call me, you know, at least a couple times a week to, see, you know, to, because we're we're very close. And she would always ask, "Oh, uh, 
what'd you do yesterday? I say, oh, nothing. Oh, did, did you celebrate your birthday or Christmas? I would say, no. Even though I did, I would lie to her. And then a couple of weeks would go by and then I would arrive back home. And, it, you know, I remember a few days later, a lot of times I would just wake up in the middle of the night and I would just be crying and stuff because I would feel so guilty that I celebrated Christmas and that I let down Jehovah and all that. And I'd wake her up in the middle of the night just bawling and just say, mom, like I lied to you. Like I celebrated Christmas or I celebrated my birthday. And she was nice. You know, she would say, oh, you know, it's okay. You know, you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't have did it, but I could see, you know, you don't feel good about it. And a lot of times she would just say, Oh, you know, just, just go talk to the, to the brothers or the elders, you know, and just tell them like, admit it. So back then we would have a, a book study and I was, was really close to the elder that was the conductor of our book study. So I don't, his name was Charles and I would always pull him to the side. And this one, I was like about seven, eight years old. And I would pull him to the side after book study, or I would tell him before, I have to talk to you after book study. And he would say, okay. And so I would talk to him outside or something. And I would say, you know, I, I celebrated my birthday or Christmas. And he would, and he was always very kind. You know, he would say, it's okay. You know, try not to do it anymore and that. But just the amount of pressure as a kid. And, and that lasted, you know, all to my life, even pretty much I would say to this day now that I, I'm thinking about it, but I think uh, one thing Des was mentioning earlier when I was in, I used to, I was involved with like playing chess and chess tournaments. And I used to always have to go around that and try to conceal what I was doing. Cause at, at the time I was in a chess club and I was playing two or three tournaments a month and they're on weekends. So I was always, pretty much lying about where I was going or other stuff. It, it was just ridiculous. And then they would counsel me. They would say, oh, it's a war game. And then they knew I was going to tournaments. And they would say, oh, well, that's a form of gambling. Because these were tournaments, like some of them were bigger. Like at, sometimes a few times I went to like Las Vegas to play and a few other bigger ones. And you, it would be like two or three day tournaments. So you'd have to get a hotel room. You'd have to pay an entry fee. It, it was a little bit of money just to even do this, but it was something to do. It, it was a hobby, something that I was doing. So I was investing time and money into this and not only just the time to do it, but just to prepare for the tournaments and study games and books and all that and come up with strategies and openings and stuff to play during these games. So that they were just like not having it. Some, some of the elders actually and brothers really liked it because they like chess, but some of them were like, oh, no, like you shouldn't do that. It's a form of gambling and, you know, you're you're wasting your weekends doing that. So sometimes I would just not even be open to uh, to that, you know, to even what I was doing. But but this, you know, double life nightmare went on all through my life, you know, whether I was in or out of the organization, because there was time when I was disfellowshipped when I was younger. And then through my 20s and early 30s, I came back and I was very involved. But even then, I still lived a double life at certain points. And then there was a time when I was a pomy. I was physically out, but mentally in for about eight years. And even that weighed into that part of my life. Like I would, uh, at times I was like dating, you know, women that weren't witnesses that were worldly women. And you can't even really go on a, a regular date, especially if you haven't ever been disfellowshipped or disassociated, but you're trying to just kind of like fade or live a double life. So like you're, you know, you're going on a date and you're like constantly looking over your shoulder to, you know, make sure that, there's no witness there and that, and it's just, it becomes ridiculous. And, and you know, what's frustrating for you, to... you know, what's frustrating yeah, for you is that in, um, in Rhode Island, I remember 
really um, like it's clear as day that when we had gatherings, especially uh, like at the Lazat's house, um, I remember like there was an elder and this other brother who was like just a regular rank and file. And they played chess all the time together right at the, uh, uh, the gatherings that we had. And he, he was like in Vietnam and like, he, he, he was the best chess player in the congregation. Chess was for some reason, wasn't, um, looked down upon, but my dad, his dad, my, my grandfather in Florida, um, who was a Mormon converted Jehovah's witness. He was against chess. Uh, I remember micro machines. I had like, um, some of them that had like were military planes, you know, and had bombs on them and stuff. And he was like, Martin, you know, my dad, and he's like, your son has military uh, toys that that's not acceptable. Just all kinds of stupid stuff. You know how it is, dude. But you made a lot of good points though. That I just wanted to share that. That must be frustrating for you because your congregation was all against it. Whereas mine was, had no problem with it. Cause there's no unity. Like they think there is. Well, well, there is no unity, and it, it wasn't like, actually, a lot of people were, it was kind of like, the. it was really mostly, majority of them were pretty cool with it, especially at when, and when they first heard about it, because I would go to gatherings and bring a chessboard and some would play, it was just like one or two of the older guard of the elders that were like, oh, it's a war game and that, and like, and they're like, oh, yeah, you know, like uh, there was an article about it one time in the wake or something like you could look it up. And, and I did. And sure enough, like they did speak against it. But there was a lot of people that really enjoyed chess and we would play like at picnics and other stuff. And I would tell them I would go to tournaments and they're like, oh, that's really cool. And that and. Um, and then I even one time, even his brother and his and his father, they went to, we would have like a chess club meetup, like in the, during the middle of the week. And one time they even showed up. And so there was a, like quite a few people that had no problem with it, but there was a few, but that goes to show that there's like some kind of a disunity or a, a kind of like a misunderstanding. Like some, there's a, a lot of elders and stuff that weren't even aware that watched our at one time actually spoke out against that so i just think it was kind of strange but um just pulling forward like to now real quick i don't want to talk too long because i'm sure other people want to call in but what i was saying is like this whole thing of living a double life even though i've managed to successfully fade as far as i see and I'm not disfellowship. I'm not disassociated. Um, I don't really plan to because I don't want to give them the time of day unless they really make some kind of serious doctrinal change. Like I already talked about it on the show, like about if they change the blood, the blood doctrine or something like that, I definitely would because right then and there, they'll outright be admitting that they are, you know, murderers are they, you know, are, are guilty of, you know, causing people to die, which is murder. So in that case, probably, but I've managed to just successfully fade. But what I would say is, um, and I haven't been bothered by any of the elders or anybody. When I first faded, like, it, it was a little bit of them bothering me, but I don't even think they'll bother me anymore. But one thing being that about a quarter or so of my family are still witnesses is that in some way I do have to live a double life. There are certain things that I cannot speak to them about. For example, I'm still a Christian and I go to a non-denominational church. I can't call up my cousin who's an elder and tell him that, or I can't speak to it to some of my cousins or my mother or other people because if I do that's like pretty much like suiciding yourself to them because and, and that's what makes it so terrible is because anybody in the world as witnesses would consider it if a family member says you know what I'm I'm just I'm going to a church now or I went to church 
a lot of them will be like, that's great. That's really good. I'm glad. Even if they don't go to church or they're sure, not, a yeah. believer, they would still just say, that's good. I'm happy for you. I'm ha- I'm glad that makes you happy. But if you're, were a witness of that and you tell them that, no, it's awful. It, it's even, it's like the worst thing you can do. Like you could tell them that you're living in fornication <laughs> and you're living with somebody and they wouldn't like it and they would be disappointed with you. But if you tell them you're going to another church, that's even, that's like the worst thing you can do. That's even worse than, than what a regular sin would be just to like what normal people would consider be just sin or not doing something that you should probably be doing. Yep. Yep. You tell them you go to another church. It's like, it's like, that's it. It's like an ultimate. So in that aspect of my life, yeah, I could say it sucks, but yeah, I still do have to live some kind of a double life in some aspect and it's terrible. Now I know and you know what and, and, and JP you can't even talk you can't even talk about Jesus with your mom and and the right way to talk about Jesus from the gospel. You know what I mean? And I'm not it's not a dig against your mom, it's just that Watchtower has stunted her of who Jesus Christ really is. Yeah, you're right. With any of them, with any of her family, I have um and my family as well. I I'm not I'm not picking on your mom. All witnesses. They're, they're deep there. I realized from being on Quora lately, I've been posting and trolling the witnesses with questions. And, and uh they um they they make excuses and they 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 don't accept Christ. I can see it. I can see that they need Jesus in their life just so they can have peace because they're worshiping the governing body, they don't have peace in their life. Yeah, like even her best friend is not blood related to me, but I still consider her like my aunt and we're so close and it's hard to get through or talk. She's actually a little more open to listen to me. Like I explained the whole blood thing, why it's wrong. Mm-hmm. And she didn't have much to say, but she said what I, what I did say did that she can see you know, she can validate what I was saying and understand my uh, differences with the organization on the blood thing. Mm. <clears throat> and she didn't, she wasn't like, oh, I can't talk to you anymore. You're sounding like an apostate or anything. Because I even did talk to her about that. I said, you know, most people, when I bring this up to them, they'll say like, I'm speaking like an apostate or that. I said, I'm not, I'm just speaking reality and truth truth <laughs> i said the only ones who are they want to deem as apostate if they're thinking different from what they're teaching and i said i'm not i said i'm just going based on like what's in the bible and what we know as humans not based off of any you know any man decision and that so i said i'm just going off of that and i said my authority is the bible on that and i hold that over an organization or what's in a, you know, organized to do Jehovah's will book or something like that. I said, you know, and she listened and she said, you know, I see what you're saying, but you know, she still thought that those scriptures, you know, whatever the society uses that. Hey, Hey, Jerry. Kind of just. Hey, Jerry. Um, yeah. uh, Ma- Maverick 587, or I said it backwards. 587 Maverick wants to know if you're a Pimo. No, I, I don't know what I was. What are you? I, I don't know what to. I, I know you was. You're my friend, and I know who you are. But like, I don't know what what you are really. <laughs> you are, you're not disfellowshipped, so. No, I would say technically with those definitions that they have, I'm just a pomo because I'm physically out. I don't go anymore, and I'm mentally out, and I don't believe. Yeah. You faded. You faded. You faded. Basically, you I faded have, without yeah. getting disfellowshipped. Yeah. I haven't just a, I haven't disassociated. I do speak to my family and stuff, you know, that are witnesses. They haven't shunned me yet. And surprisingly, it's weird because I have had some friends or people that I've known as wit as a as a witness and they're shunning me. 
and they're not even my family or anything. And I've never even been disfellowshipped or disassociated. It's just certain things that I've said and that, you know, it just questioning certain stuff has that, that alone. Sometimes if you question too much, that'll put a red light up for people to where they will shun you and stuff. So I have gotten a little bit of that, but uh, other than that, I, I would just say like, um, no, I'm not a, I'm not a PMO cause I'm not, or I'm not a, uh, you're not going to any uh, meetings. You don't give them money. You don't do yeah. anything to the, yeah, you're, you just aren't disfellowships. That's all it is. You faint, you're, you're, yeah, you're I'm faded. Not a, I'm not a PMO. Like I'm not yeah. a PMO. Like you I had a, a, you had an exit stage, you know? exit stage, right. You got, <laughs> you had an exit plan and you got out successfully. Uh, by keeping your mama, yeah. you know, and, and, uh, not having that mark on you. Yeah. I've managed to keep her and just about all my family and and that's, that's cool good. right now. And you have worldly well, family as well. Family. Right. Yeah. And I say that with quotation fingers. A, uh, yeah. I got a lot of worldly family <laughs> and then I've got a lot of, you know, family too, that were raised in and left the organization. Like a lot of my, si all of my siblings, pretty much all of us, and, um, so that's good. And they all understand, uh, the only thing they kind of don't understand is like why I'm so speak up or why I listen to six screens or other stuff. Cause I've sent them like some links, you know, to the, some of the shows or like other channels. And like, a lot of them are like, Oh, like, why don't you just like, let it go. And it's like, why don't you let our families go? I'm, the, I'm well, I'm the youngest out of five and all of them, you know, out of, out of the other four, like this is on my mom's side out of the four, like two got baptized, two never got baptized, but eventually they all left. And my two older brothers that were baptized, they got disfellowship a long, long time ago, but they've never looked back and they're, they're kind of like, well, why did you, but they left very young and they're all older than me and I'm 40 now. And they're like, well, why, why are you so hung up over this shit? And I'm like, well, you guys left when you guys were like, you know, 19 in your early twenties and you moved on, never looked back. I spent, you know, I woke up two years ago when I was 38. So I like, I spent 38 years in this. That's why it's a little different. It, it hung up plus plus when you when you life. really when you truly when you truly love Jesus Christ and what he did for us don't don't you want to defend him when when the witnesses are doing it wrong it's like we, no no the, you, you guys we're trying to help you the witnesses like lash out us with the fangs out but it's like no we and they always say we're attacking them that's all that's what i get on core all the time you're attacking us and i'm like i'm not no, i'm not attacking go ahead go ahead d Go ahead, Des. It's so funny for me to hear some like JP talk and like they they just demonize the most innocent and righteous things. It's um we listen. Um, someone like JP is being he's being um ostracized and he's being demonized and. It's so innocent what he believes in. It's so righteous. It's so righteous. Most of the people that are, are, are talking tonight or that talk at all, there's a few frustrating people that call in, but they're so righteous. And the only thing that Jehovah's Witnesses can do is they can make stupid excuses and it, it, they, they don't necessarily win the argument. They're just trying to, and it's obvious that they're trying to. But I'm really, really grateful that you called in tonight, JP. You have you have a really, really great story, and I was afraid you weren't going to tell your story tonight. But it just shows how trivial trivial they are, and it shows that um, just like it has been talked about tonight, that we can't be our true selves. And our true selves can be very, very, very good people. Uh, for all we know, we're uh, approved by God, but uh, the governing body or 
says that we're we have to um, abide by someone else's conscience, and that person's conscience could be batshit crazy, but we still have to do it. And that that's kind of their conscience. They're batshit crazy a little bit. Anyways, um, thank you so much for telling your story because I was really hoping you would because the whole thing about chess and all that, it just goes to show that you have to lead a double life for some of the most innocent things. And I think almost every Jehovah's Witness could tell a story like that. It's just like, so that I'm not a, a burden on someone else's conscience, I have to hurt myself. And I think, I think almost everybody has a story like that. Uh, yeah. Thanks. I think he does. <laughs> we said that at the same time. <laughs> You know what, Des? Thank you so much for for calling in. Um, everybody loves you a lot, and it, and it adds it makes the show a thousand times better. Thank you, thank you, no, dear. And also, 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 like I'm really, I'm really grateful that he told his story because I was hoping he did. Of course. The whole thing about chess, I it's, I mean, it's it's small, but it's not. We we all have a story to tell, and he has so many other stories to tell. And he's being he's being kept from his family uh, like we all are and um, um thank you so much for telling your story you're welcome hey jp, JP yes hey joe. Yeah, joe i i i hey, you know, joe. jp i really appreciate you sharing that and i'm what i'm going to say now you the situation that you're talking about exactly mirrors exactly what the watchtower organization has done to its members. And I mentioned, maybe I mentioned it before, maybe I heard it, but there's something in the way we, our psychology, the, the, the way we work, the abnormal parts, it's called the devouring mother. Now, it, it, in, in the animal kingdom, when, uh, when uh, a mother, of the, of the animals as a child you, you naturally expect it to rear it to care for it to cherish it to protect it well if for some reason that animal did something horrible to choose to consume it and eat it it would be horrible you would think why is they doing that they're supposed to support it supposed to be careful it, it it's abnormal well in a psychological way the society or a mother could very easily not only raise their child, but also prevent their child from ever becoming independent and could do everything to get the child to remain dependent on the mother because the mother doesn't want to let go of the, of the child. It doesn't want to let go of control of the child. It doesn't want to lose the child, it, 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 and it doesn't care about the child approaching their own personal life. It, 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 it's thinking selfishly. It's not thinking for that child. The organization has done exactly that for its members. As a mother, like the society always said, that they're, they're a mother organization, they're a devouring they do everything, everything to prevent the members from being self-sufficient, strong, capable, making their own decisions, advancing, growing, uh, individual. They do everything to prevent that because all they're trying to do is exploit them. They care nothing about the life of the child except to exploit it. That's, that's what the society has done. It, it's not a healthy relationship. It's a very unhealthy, unloving relationship. It's exactly what the society has done and is, is doing for its members. It's the devouring mother. Now, so if, if the mother is going to choose, the organization is, chooses to be that unhealthy and unloving toward us, we have to be loving toward ourselves. We have to strike out and and assert that love for ourselves. It's, it's, it's right for us to do that. And sometimes that means just resisting the efforts that that, you know, mother is doing. 
you know, it's not normal. In a normal, healthy relationship, the mother rears the child, nurse, you know, we, uh, nurses it, weans it, uh, teaches it how to be independent, urges it to make its own decisions, allows it to make its dis- mistakes, and to become a strong individual so that the, the individual can become useful to others young life. That's that's the natural progression of life. That's healthy. Whenever that doesn't take place, it's toxic. It it, it diminishes. It it takes away life from the individual. And when that happens, well, frankly, we have to assert our own life. And again, that's what's happening there. Individuals coming out of the organization asserting their own life. They deserve it. It's their life. And sometimes, you know, you have to resist the, the, the tendency of the organization or anyone that's, that's preventing, preventing you from living your life. It's your life. You have every right to it. And unfortunately, unfortunately, there are others that don't, don't respect that. That's where self-respect comes in. We need to respect ourselves. We see people. Taking that on, it's strengthening. We see people go from uh, sad and depressed, strong and vibrant and, and working and stepping forward. And it's a beautiful thing to see. It takes time sometimes. And, you know, you're helping each other to do that. And that's something you have to keep supporting each other doing. Assert your individuality and, and your own strength. And, and to resist the tendency for those who prevent you from growing as an individual. They're going to do that. They, you, know, you know, the organization is doing it. They know what they're doing. They know. They know they're, they're stunting our, our um, personal growth. They, they know. In, in order to have control over us, that's, that's the price to pay. They, they want slaves. They yep. don't want healthy individuals. Do as you're told, just like the military. Follow, follow orders, like like Nazi Germany. Yeah. So self-respect demands that we we take up our personal lives and we live our life yep. and assert it. And sometimes that means a stressed relationship, like for example, with our mother or father or, or any. But it's our life. We have every right to that. Again, a healthy mother or healthy organization helps the members to to become strong and independent. And that's where something we have to we have to manage ourselves sometimes. We can't rely on those over us to do it for us sometimes. Yep. Absolutely, Joe. You're doing it. Look, we're all doing it. And that's what the X's are do are striving to do. You're helping each other do it. And th- I'm telling you, when we see it happen, it's inspiring. You inspire others and, you know, seek the inspiration of others, too, that are doing it. Because there are others that are doing it. There are others that yep. are breaking free and going forward. I think what we're doing is working. I think that I think we are in the governing body's mind, and I think that some of the pants thing comes from us because it doesn't come from the courts, Not in, not that I know of. Uh, unless there's some, unless the courts have picked on that, but uh, it's just it's just bizarre that that. It, it, I mean, like think about it when you say it out loud. Hey guys, you can wear pants now. <laughs> um, there was a sister in the comment section, and she made a good point. Uh, Jennifer M. She said, "Uh, co- are the um, are, are the elders going to have rules for colors for these pants? Are will pink be accepted and certain other colors that she meant to, mentioned? I don't have a comment." Eric, the, the right the, the right response by a healthy sister would say that to have you have no right to tell us what we should or shouldn't wear. <laughs> Amen. You telling us, and we will not listen to you. Mm-hmm. We will make our own decisions. That is none of your business. That's exactly what they need to do. It's basically, hey, el- hey, elders. Um. Keep keep your keep your little guy in 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 his pants, you know. 
Hand, handle handle if a woman has tight fitting clothing, it's not the end of the world. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Because they're they're projecting yeah. on us on the sisters. That's what I feel like they uh, they're doing. Uh, I just want to I just want to say one more um, comment from the comment section from Gary Sloan. He said he he mentioned a really good point, um, and he wanted to ask the audience: uh, Do you guys remember when the governing body did a video, and they it was like an interview maybe or like a testimonial, and they were talking about uh, a sister who was. She he said he was deaf, but it, it was actually she, that she was partially blind and deaf. So it was I think that's almost worse. Uh, but he is correct. She was legally deaf and legally blind as well. Um, and um, this is a really sad story because it started with them taking her to the meetings and then um, they cut that off and they made her take the subway and they lived in an, um, the the meeting where she lived and where the meeting was, was a dangerous neighborhood. And they, they made her do that. And uh, she was wearing pants to the meetings and they, uh, they told her no. And in the, and in, in the testimonial, they're like, and we, we showed her through the scriptures to change her mind. And she wore, we got her a dress, but like one dress. And there wasn't, and it was on her own after that. And, and now they're saying like, and so Gary Sloan is saying, like, how does this sister feel that like now she can wear pants? <laughs> they literally have that in their own literature. These these guys don't know, know what they're doing. Are they going to delete that video? <laughs> right, Joe? No, I, I can't believe how much the organization has changed. Huh? Yes, it's oh, great. Oh, nothing. I think so. I think someone said, uh, "Oh, yeah, it's Grace." I, who was that? I don't know. Hello. Oh, anyways. We're just so, go ahead. Sister. Oh, I don't recognize every voice, but anyway, thank you. So, about this uh, Slack thing. This, I can't believe how much organization has changed because I remember this was in the watchtower and they were um, a picture of uh, these fellowship people pro pro protesting outside the kingdom hall wearing signs and um, they were, I remember this, there was a woman there who was this fellowship, and she was wearing slacks, and they were just depicting it as like, this is a bad woman who wears slacks. And I will never forget this picture, and I actually brought it up with the Jehovah's Witness. Are you trying to like say that women are bad if they wear slacks, and they are bad? And I remember I, was, I just talked to them a lot about this issue, and... It's just really annoying to me. I, I can't believe how much they have changed. But I think um, we were talking a lot about how men and the beard and everything. And I think that's really important to bring up those changes because it's really annoying. But I think we should spend equal amount of time on these women wearing slacks because that's really... I mean, all the women who wear a skirt in the middle of the winter, they get urine infections. And urine infections after the other take more medicine, more urine infection. It, ne it never goes away. And many of um, the people who are at the Kingdom Hall are actually old women. So, I mean, this is a serious subject, but... I mean, there are too many subjects this evening. I feel like we won't have time to address everything. This double life, I all also lived it. And um, I feel like I'm not really being authentic. I try to be authentic, but whenever I do, like, talk about the slacks, or then I'm always feeling like nobody is like... If I said something, they didn't like it, and then uh, I just gave up, I guess. But about this uh, Dick Borg, he was talking about that Rick spends money, and this is something I think about on a regular basis. 
And um, here's what I'm thinking also. I think that Rick has this channel for ex-Jehovah's Witness to talk about like being an ex-Jehovah's Witness. And I don't think it's wrong. I mean, one night we talked about movies and we were just hanging out, just having fun talking about movies. There's nothing wrong with that. But what I do think is wrong for me personally is when people try to promote their own issues on the channel. I mean, a person could promote, uh, let's say, uh, being a Swedish Viking or promote uh, being gay, promote a certain president, promote Black Lives Matters, promote, uh, yes, promote your own issues. I think Rick pays because he wants to the issue, main issue should be like ex Jehovah's Witness things. And um, about this pot smoking that has brought, it has been brought up many times on this channel. I just want to say, I don't want to be famous for this pot smoking. I feel like, or I mean, I don't want to be associated with this. And I have read on Google that actually pot smoking can lead to, if I don't remember wrong, maybe. But I think it said you get anxiety, you get a split personality, and I even know people personally. Hey, honey. Hey, 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 Grace. Hey, Grace. Hey, Grace. Hey, Grace. 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 Hold on. Grace. Hello. This person who stopped smoking pot started to be calmer. And it's not as evil anymore. So I think some people, yes, they don't get along well with pot. They get more evil. And some people should maybe not smoke pot because they get more angry. So I think we should <laughs> both alcohol and the pot smoking. It can be dangerous. I can tell you've never so had it. Heard here in Sweden, a lot of people in Sweden who start smoking pot and then they move on to harder drugs. What the heck and it's is the same with alcohol. You start with alcohol, maybe you go to pot and then you go to cocaine or whatever. It may yeah. be dangerous, slippery slope road. So, and I haven't heard so much talking about the side effects from smoking pot on this channel. I mm -hmm. just wanted to say that <laughs> my father, he actually had a diploma for helping out people from alcohol. So he had a 50 year old, dip like it, he was helping them for 50 years. And I'm more into trying to be as, I'm not saying that I could follow it maybe 100%, but I think it's a good thing to drink as little as possible Grace? instead of drink as much as possible. Grace, can I ask you a legitimate question? What What is your point? Can you explain to me what your point is about all this? Well, yes, my point is that Rick pays for this channel, and I don't think that he pays for this channel in order for us to uh, for us to promote our own issues like smoking pot like your okay so like, like your issues with marijuana so like your issues with marijuana you're making an issue with pot right Mary, let me talk to her i'm the one that asked the question um grace um what's wrong with the plant that grew from the ground Will you tell me that I think what's wrong is, the thing that is wrong is that I don't, Rick is paying for this channel for us to promote pot. That's what's you wrong. Promoted and I don't Who promoted pot? Say, let me say, at, at what point tonight did we, um, at what point have we encouraged pot use? What, what, what happened tonight? Explain it to us. But there have been several occasions where people are talking about um, smoking. Name one, pot. name one, name one, name one moment. Several occasions. Several occasions, name one. I agree with Desiree. Please name, name please name an occasion. I'm, I'm, I'm not the computer, so if Put your I money, no, 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 put your money where your mouth is. Come on. Don't, don't make accusations without having evidence. 
Grace, listen, honey, um, we appreciate your comments. And I probably speak from everyone on six screen that say that um, you need to step outside of yourself and look how it looks, what you're saying. Um, I just think that you don't really know what pot is if you're going to do this on a night that we're not talking about it at all. But I promise you, listen, Grace, um, can I promise you something? I, uh, Eric and I have actually talked about him doing a whole show about cannabis and that is your perfect opportunity to like pull all the guns out and wage your war on it but this is what i suggest that you do i suggest that you actually do research and that you come up with studies from scientists that prove your point instead of just arbitrary um thoughts and and it would be a really good subject and we would love to hear from you, Grace. And we would love to have you on that show about cannabis and Eric's going to do one soon. Are you, are you up for that? Or are you, are you willing to be a part of that? Cause we would love to hear from you. Well, I can't promise you anything because usually I'm sleeping, but it well, the, problem is, Grace, the problem is, Grace, is that if you're going to attack something, you need to be in in, in in the ball game with it. You you, you need to okay. you need to uh, um you, you need to back it up. So you yeah. can't just attack a bunch of people for no reason. You can't just attack a bunch of people for no reason. You actually. I'm not attacking anybody. I'm not attacking anybody. I'm just saying that Dick Borgi brought up that Rick pays for this channel, and I feel. Like we should promote being an ex Jehovah's Witness. What is and that that's what Rick cannabis? is paying for. Sweetheart, sweetheart, what does that have to do with cannabis? What does that have to do with something that? Like I could. Um, like here the, is the deal. The I could. I, industry, the pharmaceutical what? industry is the most powerful industry in this country and mostly in the world, and. They do not want to compete with cannabis. So they will lie to you and they will do whatever it takes to make sure that you hate cannabis like you do. Because they will make sure that the number one cause of death in this country in the United States is pharmaceuticals. But you know what? You know what is not the number one cause of death in this country? Cannabis, because it kills zero people. But someone like you wants to come on here and say and demonize it when they have no idea what they're talking about. They only have talking points when the fact of the matter is, is it's a fact. Is that Nor have you ever tried it. And yes, it's not, it's not that it's not healthy for every person because it can be abused. But for the most part, it's so much better <laughs> than any pharmaceutical you could have because Sorry. the pharmaceuticals are actually proving through science that they're they're causing suicides and they're causing mental illness like no one's business and you're sitting here saying that something like that is worse than some the number one cause of death in this country which is pharmaceutical so just there are a lot of pharmaceutical like, deaths that's true she yeah. said there was a swedish study now this week there is a site called medscape it is for doctors I read it every day. I've worked as a reporter. They don't let me comment on there anymore because I'm not a physician. As long as there you wasn't... tell them the truth, they won't let you tell the truth. No, no, no. They don't let me comment on there because I don't have a PhD in medicine. But I read it every day. And there was a new medical study in medical literature that is saying that pot may have some side effects that lead to anxiety in some people. So she's saying that... This do you understand who is funding? Do you understand who is funding these studies? And do you understand... I do, ma'am, and I don't have a dog next? in the fight. Can I, can if I you ha I'm Hold on, on. Calm down, everyone. Listen, ma'am, I know... I know, uh, I know hard you're getting hard. heated, ma'am. We're admitting that they can't even rely on the studies anymore be because there's so much corruption. So, can I say something? I almost died from pharmaceuticals. I just two weeks ago. Thank I was you. Admitted to I, I agree. Does, does too. I was too didn't let me okay. finish my sentence. 
you didn't let me finish my sentence. Will. That's uh, the point. Calm, calm, calm down, everyone. Calm. It's okay. It's okay. We're getting a little heated. It's all right. We can disagree. There's at least, if it's a scientific There's issue. There's a way Dixie is agreeing with you. Thank you. When a study says something may cause. That's Some people get, says. we're getting passionate over this subject. Of it may. Just like as some supplement may make you feel gr great and better, but there's no real proof. And so what all there's they have proof. to do is that they want There is day. proof in this. What I'm saying to you is this is not what the general public reads. It may have been in Grace's Swedish literature or newspaper. It is on Medscape, which is literature for the medical establishment to read and as a reporter i was able to read the study and it did say in some patients anxiety they are letting the public use cannabis that's a fact i'm not here to argue one way or the other i'm older than you i remember the sexual revolution and all that grooviness but the okay. medical establishment itself, now that they're letting people have this, are continuing to look at it. They're also looking at other things like psychedelics for PTSD and headaches yep. and other yep. things. They're looking yep. at it yep. finally. Like mushrooms. I, 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 don't know if, I don't know if you were disagreeing with me, but I agree with you completely. My whole point about it is, is that... Um, that um, we can't trust what's told us. That's the whole point. Some of them um, we can. We have to read yes. the papers that yes. are at PubLit, and you have to well, sit and read thing. very complex here's things. Thing. We're, we're, we're giving stu continuous studies about the COVID, uh, COVID, COVID vaccine and, and the damage it's doing, but no one's taking it seriously. It's just like <coughs> for, for, no one has actually... Um, taking seriously the studies and the information. It's so, taken like, very seriously on certain podcasts. Yes. Honey, yeah, of no, course, I'm but not mainstream media. Really the mainstream media, media absolutely serious. not. That's what she's saying. You know what? You know what? Uh, Pixie, Dr. Drew, and Dr. Phil are two high-profile doctors that have actually spoken out against the... That's uh, what uh, I'm saying. Yeah, I know, I know, but uh, to be honest with you, it's amazing that they didn't lose their careers over it. That's the point. They almost have. I know, honey. I know. I agree with you. I'm just saying, like, please okay. don't honey me. I like you. No, I honey no, people I'm, that I know personally. Listen, I'm a actually, I call people hon I'm too. So too. I live in Virginia. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's nice talking to both of you, but every every issue is going to have. At least two, maybe three sides. So if if we get a more conservative side from Sweden, perhaps it's in her newspaper, and we have to look for it on Medscape here. Hey, hey, listen, I, I'm not. I'm not disrespecting you by calling you honey. I'm a Southern girl, and I. She knows that. She knows that, Desiree. Don't take that as disrespect. I am. It's actually a. A term of endearment. Term of endearment. Anybody hear me? Hello. Yeah, I would love yeah. to hear you. Go ahead, yeah. buddy. This is this is Aaron. Yeah, this is Aaron. Oh. I uh, I hadn't hey, called Aaron. for a little bit. It's it's good to connect with you guys. And uh, I, I I just I came back. I just got back for a little while ago from a uh, meetup that uh, I had in Bethesda, Maryland with uh, Joe, Joe and Fran and uh, a, a few others. Diana Lost, XJW prisoner was there. And it, it, I just want to, I, I missed the first part of the program, but uh, I'm going to go back and listen right, to well, uh, we, love you. we love you. Welcome to the program. There's yeah, usually an audio recorder somewhere on the phone. I'm, I'm going to go back and listen to JP's story. But I, I just kind of wanted to say that, uh, you know, Thinking back to what last week when everything got heated on this program, you know, Susan had to come on and basically try to play referee. And yeah, I thought that was, uh, I think when these kind of things happen, it gives the XJW community a bad look. And that's just, I understand. My opinion. You all don't have to agree with me. But it, what if 
someone who is PMO or, you know, questioning kind of happens to join the live broadcast right during that heat of moment. You know what I mean? What would yeah. they think about the XAW community? That's what we all need to ask ourselves. And look, we all have different opinions on all these issues. I certainly have mine, but maybe, you know, maybe we should talk about certain things and then maybe look, maybe get some meetups together and then, you know, get those other discussions going in, in a, in a, in a more positive way you know, in a live set, in a real live setting is what I'm saying, you know. How do you pretend that what how do you pretend what we've all been through is positive? We all have to come together and we have to, like, I agree with you that it, it should be in a positive way, but, like, it's not always realistic that what we've been through is positive. Can I, can I bring the conversation back to what we were talking about before the uh, marijuana thing came up? For yeah, uh, yeah, because this that wasn't the topic tonight. It came out in left field, but go ahead, man. <laughs> is this uh, the guy from New Hampshire? Who, who is this? Yeah, this is Tom from New Hampshire, yeah. And, Tom, and, Tom, I couldn't remember your name, brother. Sorry. Hey, Tom. That's cool. I haven't been on in quite a while. Uh, yeah, it's good to hear you, man. You doing all right? Yeah, I've been sick since like December 15th because of my blood pressure medicine. We ended up in the ICU and everything. So, but this is, that's totally a different subject at all. I'm I here. got you, brother. Well, I'm glad you're doing all right. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So, my point, though, is as far as like the. the um, because and then you can send it to me or I can upload it to my computer or something because uh, you know, don't get all the drafts I'm supposed to do and the shit and people with different okay. Hey. Somebody's uh, some, somebody's uh, not somebody's uh, not un unmuted or you know what I mean. Someone, please mute yourself. We can hear you. Go ahead, go ahead, Tom. Anyways, um, so oh my God, it was me. Sorry, guys. We're hanging up now. Oh no, you're good. You can just mute and you can come in next. So, anyways, the point that I wanted to make is I totally understand. If, that we were forced not really to live a double life. You know, it was hard to, you know, uh, in our conscience, we tried not to, but also in our conscience, if we had, if we had um, the power, well, so I, I think that I had the power of critical thinking at a very young age. Mm. And I, I knew that a lot of these uh, policies were bullshit. You know what I mean? So, you know, in, in my conscience, my conscience allowed me to, you know, uh, skirt the rules in a certain amount of ways, but I had to learn. I had to lie. We all, I, I believe every Jehovah's Witness had to learn to lie to their parents as a kid. And it's terrible, but we did. And it's almost as if the elder arrangement, um, once we got to know certain people's experiences, if you admitted something, you know, then, you know, you were in trouble, but all you had to do is lie and, and deny and nothing would happen. And it was always a matter of how many people know and things like that. So we all had to, in our own self-preservation, learn to lie to our parents in certain areas. Some people actually did that and got away with doing bad things. Um, and they knew they were bad, but they wanted to because it was fun or whatever. And some of us, I mean, I believe myself, my conscience tells me that I, you know, when I lied, it was because I didn't believe that what I was doing was wrong. Um, you know, and I'm sure that I did things that were wrong and lied also for those reasons, just to avoid from getting in trouble or avoid to other people to get in trouble, you know, but it's, it's as if that, um, it's, it's almost like they forced us to be, live that double life in a way and learn how to lie to protect ourselves and to protect our friends, and, and, you know, and, and that's one thing that I've had to actually struggle with after I came out and, and living my own life and 
deciding, you know, uh, you know, trying to, I don't know, uh, decipher whether or not my lie is necessary now, you know, and because the, you know, it is definitely wrong. And that I believe is, has been an issue for me. Um, you know, like my new wife, one of the, one of the, you know, a lot of, a lot of new relationships, one of the most important things is to them is never lie to me, you know, and I had to say, guess what? <laughs> if it's going to protect you, I will probably have to lie to you, you know, and I have learned to do that all my life. I had to learn to lie. I had to, to protect myself and my loved ones, my brothers, you know, and, and my, my family and my cousins. I, I could not admit. As long as I knew in conscience that it really wasn't that bad, but they, I knew that they just had extreme views and it was, and the punishment definitely would not fit the crime. Then we had to learn to lie. So that's one issue that I just wanted to bring up about, um, you know, the, the, um, playing playing chess, you know, and stupid things like that. You know, I, I think that that's something that a lot of people have not actually come to grips with, um, that we all have to learn to lie. That is one thing Jehovah's Witnesses make their kids do. And it's terrible, but it's true, you know. And basically, um, you know, it's all, all these people in Bethel, you know. Uh, yeah, they, as long as they lie about it, you know, they're not going to get in trouble. Uh, these you know, I, I don't you think that that's kind of a side effect of that religion of what we all went through, even if we haven't actually, uh, you know, come to grips with it. If you really think about it, I think that I think that that's something that we all have to learn to do. Can I ask who just gave the comment? What's your name? Tom. Tom, um, my heart breaks for you because. Um, they made the most normal, the, the most normal reaction to what you're going through. They made it a sin. I'm just so sorry because I, we all have gone through it, but your, your story is, your story is our story too. You know, I'm so sorry. Hi, hi, Tom. Can I enter in there? This is Joe. Yes, please. Joe. Yes, please. Hi, you, Tom. Yeah, but hope, that story. Tom, I, thank you. Tom, I certainly hope you're feeling better. That's good to hear. Oh, yeah. Yes, all oh, definitely and, good. And if I can give something from, oh, from my youth, when I was young, among the people we hung around with, you know, the young guys, it wasn't uncommon. It was common. It, when someone basically stuck their nose in someone else's business, it, 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 was, it was a common thing for them to say, mind your own business. Or stop sticking your nose in other people's businesses. Mind your own business. It was right. common. It was a common thing. In other words, right. we, we respected and were taught to respect other people's business. And if they didn't, we were very quick to remind them, mind your own business. And, and that basically kept people being able to remain friendship even when they inadvertently stuck their nose in business that wasn't theirs. You know, it was a warning. Mind your own business. You're not minding your own business. Okay, man, sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, thank you, Joe. You, you've made so many great points tonight, and everybody has. Well look, well, look, this is the problem with the witnesses. I was not born a witness. I was born outside. Yeah. And with the witnesses, you, we were taught Stick our noses in other people's business. Being judgmental. It's not our business. It never was. It still isn't. And everything that I'm noticing... Turn a blind is eye is what we were taught. Turn a blind eye because, yeah. you know, well, even you know, though they told you to tell on each other, at the same time, <laughs> you weren't supposed to. So you had to lie for them. Your salvation, your salvation uh, depends on on other people around you. That's not normal. 
I mean, or, or how you judge other people around you, at least. Sure. In other words, we're not here to judge each other. We're just not. That's what they, <laughs> that's what they want you to believe that you are. I know. Um, I know. Yeah, listen, I know. Eric, can you tell, can you tell your story about Cora? How they, how they, um, said that that was their, their job to judge? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, what happened was I posed a question on Quora because I started getting into this. This is my anti-preaching work. <laughs> and, uh, oh boy, they're nasty on there. And, um, what did I say that got them going about judging? Um, I'm, uh, I'm trying to think of it, Des. Sorry. Uh, I, I had it in my head, but I Sorry. lost it for a second. No, you're okay. Um, so much and I'm trying to, like, I've, I've done, I've talked to so many different people. Oh, this is what it was. I, I don't remember what the question was. It was something about um about unconditional love is, is what I posted and I don't have it in front of me. I'm oh, on the spot. Exactly. But, but, the but let me but let me tell the answer. The answer was um was um we don't this is a Jehovah's Witness, we don't unconditionally love. Our job is to judge and to judge others around us. And I'm like, wow, because the Bible says the exact opposite. This is literally yeah. antichrist. I'm not slandering these people. It's literally antichrist. This is not what Christ taught. It, it, yeah. It's on, yeah. And they're admitting it. That's the yeah. sick part is that they, they openly yeah. admitted it. Yeah. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> and, and that wasn't the only comment I get. Um, the core is very depressing and I actually have to shake myself off of it for a while because the witnesses are nasty on it and they, um, they're defending uh -huh. their faith very like viciously um if i pose a question that they don't like oh you're attacking us here we go ricky bobby again he's attacking every uh, all the witnesses because that's that's how they're felt with their persecution um complex fixing my faith Vern or shauna <coughs> excuse me says uh narcissism yes they're narcissists they are you know it you know, you know it's awesome though the biggest the biggest threat to them is that um they can say oh well this is false against us but actually the xjw community is in alignment with the governing body and we can actually prove that we know what is wrong with them and um the governing body don't have the, the all they can do is do a really sick way of discrediting in us and just, just by by just saying we're apostates that's all that's all they got that's all they got okay. and everyone that's mm -hmm. listening and i hope that there's pimos listening the whole thing with this is that 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 they're creating an army of pimos and yes. and yes and there's a lot of people that don't believe anymore and and there's proof of this and and they're trying to demonize the people that are just saying the truth. And we're the ones that are just saying the truth. We're just saying what's happening. We're just proving what's happening. And they want to do anything that they can to demonize us. That's, that's how they work. That's the best that they have. That's the best that they have. Anybody that's out there listening, I, I want anyone else to chime in. But the anybody else out there that's listening, the best that these people have is to say that we're not credible, no matter how much credibility that we can prove that we have. I mean, that's the best they have. It's sad. But anyways, no. go ahead. We're, we're, tra we're traitors. We're traitors to them, I guess, you know. That's what that's where apostates yeah, are. Of course. Of course. Yeah, no, can I, I give a Oh hey, hi Debbie hi. Moore. Hi Deb, how are you? I just I wanted to tell you Des, I'm really proud of how much you've spoken up tonight. And you right, isn't it great to have Des here? Thank you. I love you, Debbie. I love you too, sweetie. But you made some great points tonight and I just really appreciate everything you've said. And what we were talking about a minute ago with the, um, uh, oh, heck, my, my thought just ran right out of my mind. Honey, I forget the last thing I thought of. Um, which subject? Oh, the one, the, okay. Um, oh, my goodness. 
Um, was it the subject of, of, about um, living a double life, or which, which one? No, we were talking about um, people uh, like telling lies and living living a double life. You know, yeah, yeah. sometimes even if you didn't tell a lie or something, you felt like maybe you did, or you might have. I don't know. Sometimes I would think, well, if they only knew the real me, I mean, like off and on for a while. A good year or two now. Yeah. And then people keep asking me if I'm diabetic. I don't think I Who's am. Who's talking? Oh, we want to hear Debbie. Okay. So What's this happening? is actually. Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. I think this is one of those things like the drunken Bethel, I think. We want to hear Debbie. Uh, yeah, well, and I'm sure it's good. Yeah, we're being, we got infiltrated. Is Rick there? Can you shut this person off? Um, no, we, got we got infiltrated by, some, by somebody. Yeah, okay. Hey Rick, are you, are you there, buddy? I'm sorry to bother you. Now this thing I have where I get out of breath so easily. Yes. Or is somebody there that can? Do you know that if you have your TV on in the background, someone forget to mute themselves? <laughs> I wish I had the control panel. <laughs> it could be somebody trying to do it on purpose there. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what this is. Debbie, can you hear us? I think it's a pasta babe show bleeding over into this. Oh, is that what it is? Is that a pasta babe? Thank you for explaining that. Oh, it is her. Yeah, she said she's she must be on my on my channel too while she's doing her show. Um, shoot. Um, can someone have, can someone text her the pasta babe? Yeah, I'm gonna have to text her. 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 Yeah, I'm gonna have to text we that Rick Farron, we have an intruder. It's 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 a mis mishap, a friendly one by accident. One of the doctors here. What the fuck is happening? It's a pasta babe. Um, let's see. If you all put up with me for a sec, uh, she's not going to get my message. And you you want to make sure there's no blood clot? I don't know what to do. So when you have a like this, and it's because of circulation problems, what happens is this. So let me. I don't know. I don't know what. Uh, and from the pain, yeah, the Maverick, if you can message her, that'd be great. Or if anybody can, I have her number. I just don't. I I I don't. I might kick me off the platform if I do too much on my phone. I don't know. One way valve. Alright, let me see if I can do something, guys. If you can put up with me for one second. The valve is pushed open, blood comes up, and it closes. Comes up, closes. It keeps on moving. That's how is this for show? I don't know what this is. Mechanically. But what happens is in your situation, for example, this is simplified version, but to to make you understand, blood comes through, valve closes. But overshoots, okay. so it opens okay. partially. So blood, you are moving around. Blood is up. <laughs> out of hundred percent pumped up, maybe twenty five percent will drop, and you got only seventy five percent, and it keeps going. So you have some blood kind of dropping, and it is staying in your leg, and it gets pushed out in the tissue. Yeah, I'm and now instead so with this like is a that. blood vessel, but instead of having a leg like this, now because of swelling, you your skin. Well, I sent a message and asked if it was her end because I don't know if it is. I don't know what's going on. Somebody, maybe, maybe somebody was. You know what? You know what probably happened. Somebody's listening to my show and is plugged into her show at the same time. Uh, somebody says she's not live. I don't know what this is. It's going to bubble out. Okay. So that's what's happening. And there's turn, turn with the fluid. Now somebody flow. just let the 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 out. Hey, yeah. hey, hey, Rick, if you're, if you're there, if you're there, Rick, Rick Farron, if you're, if you're there, if you can dump a caller for us. Oh, thank you for telling me that. Yeah, it's not infectious. It's not buzz. It's not infection, okay. but it's a... Oh, shit, she is talking to the doctor. Oh, my God. <laughs> poor, poor Linda. Yeah, it makes us sleep. Mixed together. Well, I sent the text to Linda. Hopefully, she gets it. Number okay. The 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 liquid part, of course, sits out. Thanks, Debbie. But sometimes there is a defect. 
to the point even uh, blood cells can I, come out underneath the skin and now it changes color. Okay, Linda oh, James is not doing her show tonight. So she for, she's on with me and forgot to mute it maybe. I don't know. Something I think that's her voice. I'm, I don't want to assume everyone. Because it's a long term. Huh? I like that because I can explain better. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, you, if you have questions, then we can kind of say, okay. De Desiree, Desiree, you don't understand. She doesn't know she's unmuted. No. It's not no, water. Can we get back to a normal not water and no. I am taking De Desiree, you don't get it. She doesn't. Yeah, that is a different reason. That, that's, that's right. You don't get it. Linda doesn't know that she's unmuted. And she's talking to a doctor. No, that's what I use. No you know, I just need to buy me some more. No, it's okay. You don't know what's going on. If you don't have it every day, so I just I don't know what to do. Uh, do can, can I use your phone? Can be used for like a quick, quick emergency. I'm gonna call her. Yep. In case, in case. I don't know. Hold on, guys. All right, I'm gonna try to fix this. Yes. Um, cutting in. So does like does everyone agree that that's Linda's voice? Is that is that about right? Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry, 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 sorry. Okay, we're gonna get you new ones. Okay, yeah. We're gonna get you new. All right, ones. let's see, because this isn't fair for her either. Um, I'll explain to you. Um, one second. One second. I'll get it's o it's okay. I'm gonna try to fix it, Desiree. Desiree. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I'll, 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 okay. I'll, let me let me see here. It's not very really hot, luckily, but you have a swelling. We know that. Mm -hmm. And uh, let me just make sure. So that white was a bit of the um, ox. Um, this one. The white is for the medicine I put on that didn't come off yet in the shower. Don't worry about it. No uh, worry. Uh, I not but... is, it, is it gone? Hold on, guys. I'm still here. Uh, Hold I on. just called and left a message. With Rick and Susan. Sounds better now. Okay. Oh, it looks yeah. like she got kicked oh, off. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I, I just want to say to the, uh, the the sister from from earlier, um, I, I was not trying to say that people have, that everyone has a positive experience. What I was trying to say is, and this, what just happened is kind of a good example, that this is one of, if not the most monitored and watched XJW broadcasts on the internet. And I I would like to see, you know, a more respectful manner and not have those heated things on this program. That's just me. I'm not saying it won't happen, but you know, we all have bad experiences and all that. But I just want to say that. I wasn't yeah. <laughs> I agree, uh, brother. I, I don't I don't want the heated I don't want the heated arguments either. And I, I I absolutely agree with you. It is late night and it tends to happen more in the late night programs too. Um let's all be honest with each other. People drink and people um pe people get a little more feisty at, at night time. And um it but um and we disagree and that's something that the Jehovah's Witnesses don't do, and that's what's scary, is they is that they all agree. And that's that's what a cult is. See, we, we need to disagree so that we can all learn from each other. That that's that's the beauty of disagreement. We don't have to agree with each other, but but on the rare occasion that we do agree with what someone's telling us, they teach us, and we we grow to be a better person than when, who we are when we learn like that. Um, I, I I say that you can learn from anybody. When I was an auto body for twenty years, and uh, uh, an eighteen year old taught me a little trick about slinging mud and this product that you can put on that, that takes the pinholes right out. And I was I I, I was blown away. I I never saw that before. And the kid was really good at slinging mud. And um. You know, you can learn from anybody. Can I mention something real quick? Sure, Debbie. Um, uh, I, I know what I was trying to t talk about earlier. When Joe was on there, he said that witnesses are all about minding each other's business. And uh, when we're when we like I like I was brought up as a witness from birth, and we were taught it was rude to say mind your own business. You just didn't say that. And if somebody asked you something, you just spilled your guts with whatever they wanted to know. And yeah, everybody was in everybody's business. If you weren't in somebody's business, you weren't a witness, basically. Um, and 
And it, it was hard even for me later. Well, I still can't say it's none of your business. It bothers my conscience to say that because I think I'm being rude. Even though we have to set boundaries, we're never taught to set boundaries. That's why there's so much sex abuse and all kinds of things like that within the organization. Because as kids, like we just, we were taught to, that we could, you know, trust the elders and uh, ask them anything. Well, elders don't have any professional training with anything. They don't know the answers to all those things. And actually, most Jehovah's Witnesses just know a few different scriptures that are here and there throughout the Bible. They don't know how to tie it in with what you know what you're talking about, but and everybody knows the same scriptures, and those exact scriptures cannot, you know, speak to everybody about everything. There's that's why there's the whole Bible, you know. And I know some people on here don't believe in the Bible anymore, but there's a lot of us who still do, and uh, we have to remember that you can't just pick up a a verse out of the middle of the Bible and think that's going to answer everybody's questions because most witnesses, I mean, we were not really taught to read the whole chapter. Or they the take everything out of context. We were really talked about, you know? Yeah. And so many things were misapplied. Yeah. And as far as um, going to elders, really, they don't have any experience or any training, you know, Dick Morgan has said before about that, that, um, you know, they, well, the elders, when they have a committee, uh, majority rules on that committee. The brothers might not agree on anything, but if two of them do, well, they go with that one, even if the one that won't go along with it is really the one that's right. The other two could just have a beef with the one that's talking to them and telling them something. But that's just not the right way to do things. It's not fair, and it is judging, and it's not up to us to judge one another. And, I mean, even if in the Bible, uh, they said, before you uh, ask the brother to take the, what was it, the stick out of his, I remember the rapture from yours. So none of us are perfect, and we don't have any business telling each other that, hey, you're not good enough, or, or uh, earlier when um, uh, Carrie Kay was on the show with Barbara Anderson, she was talking about one of her pregnant friends uh, who got pregnant out of wedlock. She went and talked to the elders, and they still, uh, she was she was sorry and was trying to apologize, and they told her no, but they were just fellowshipping her anyway. She went home, got a shot, got a gun, and put it to her heart and blew her, I mean, blew herself up, killed herself. And that was very traumatic, like for Carrie. And she went, as she was at the Kingdom Hall, and some sisters were chit chatting about how this sister who just committed suicide was not going to be resurrected and this and that, which that was none, that was not their judgment call. And Carrie Kay said she's, uh, Carrie was seven months pregnant. And um, she told them that it, that it wasn't up to them. They weren't the judge. They didn't know, you know, what, how she was going to be judged. And Carrie just walked out because it upset her so bad and it traumatized her. But I mean, Carrie's kids are all grown. So that happened quite a long time ago. And, so this has been going on for eons. Well, she is it, eons old, but I mean, even I'm older than her. And that that judgment and, and the covering over of things and the lying have been going on as far back as I can remember. And they used to say, well, you could lie by omission, which you definitely mm -hmm. can. You can do that on purpose or by accident. And who is it to say? Who Who is with someone else to say whether you did that on purpose or did it by accident. Only you know. And, it's and doesn't it 
conscience. Doesn't it? Doesn't it suck, Debbie? Doesn't it suck, Debbie, for people like us that went through the disfellowshipping process really cruel and harsh that it's easier now? It's like we don't. Where's our uh, reparations, right? <laughs> where, yeah, where? It really. Is. And and you know, in the past, all the brothers that were passed over. We don't even get us. We don't even get a star. A, a sorry, <laughs> a, you know, an apology. Uh-uh. And you never will. And I remember back in the uh, during like the women's lip thing, the sisters would you know buy and wear tried to wear pantsuits to the Kingdom Hall. And they kind of put up with it for a little while, and then they came all out and was like, nope, you know, no more. And they were very dressy, you know, but it was just that women, well, that's why women's loop came along, is because women wanted to have some say, you know, and not be bossed around by men all the time. And so that's, where the pants suit and the burning the bras and all that mess came from. And you wonder, really, you wonder if they'll bring back um, the torn jeans, right? Remember, they were against torn jeans in a video they did. Is that going to be okay now? Yeah. You know, if the slacks are okay. Why can't? And, and she had like um, it looked like she had material that was covering the tears on the knee, so it wasn't even exposing like skin. I just don't understand what Watchtower's deal is with like they want to be like no part of the world. It's like your balls deep in it. <laughs> You guys are in bed with the UN, or oh, yeah, they were. Oh, yeah, right into the, the styles and everything of the world. They used to say that it was wrong to have televangelists, you know. Mm. Uh, yeah, because, I remember that. Yep. Uh, and, and then now they're doing the same thing. They've yep. got their so, own, even channel on Roku. They've got the JW.org thing. Hmm. And I don't have to chime in on. Yeah, go ahead. Hello. Sorry, I don't want to. I don't want to interrupt your thought there, Debbie. But I wanted to chime in on what you were talking about there. Oh, <laughs> um, well, go ahead. Yeah. So at the at the meetup today uh, at Bethesda, Maryland, with uh, Joe and Fran. Oh I, yeah. I, we kind of started talking about this stuff too, and I brought this up, and I I told the analogy of what's happening in the organization. Let's say over the last twenty years since we've left up till now. If you look back at the way this organization was 20 years ago and compare it to today, it's almost night and day the difference. Yet the current, the members that were members 30, 40 years ago, all the way until now, they don't see it because what's been happening is the boiling frog syndrome. And mm, what that yep. means is if you take a yep. frog, if you take a frog and you put him in, in a pot yep. of cold water, slowly turn up the heat, he doesn't notice the temperature is slowly rising until he's cooked and he's dead. However, if you turn the heat up instantly, he jumps out. And I think that's what's happening with all these monumental changes over the course of the last, especially the last few months, even people, the people don't see it and they just accept anything that's thrown at them. Their indoctrination continues to blind them and they, they're serving this manly earthly governing body, you know, and another thing I said at the meetup, and I don't think the average Jehovah's Witness can name even three or four of the governing body members, let alone all of them, or maybe their wives and, and you know, all this stuff. But we know this stuff because we're allowed, allowed, quote, unquote, to research this organization's roots, its history, and et cetera, et cetera. And it's just, it's mind boggling what what's, people will allow themselves to, to subject themselves to. This indoctrination. No, I'd like to add Bro- brother. I have to. I have to mark you G for that comment. You know, like a talk, like you used to get. <laughs> yeah, I mark you G for using an illustration of the boiling frog, dude. That's powerful. That's really. That's really good. <laughs> nice. Nice. We look gotta, forward to your next talk, gotta, brother. Thank you so much. <laughs> I didn't get a W, so thank you for no W. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's right. The W was work on. Okay. <laughs> Mm-hmm. What a bunch yeah, of BS. Can you add a little something to this boiling frog? Oh, sure. Go ahead. Sorry. We're just having fun. <laughs> no, that's awesome. I, I agree with you 100%. And the thing is that we've been hearing about that forever. Um, and it usually was, I think, targeted towards uh, people that weren't witnesses that didn't see what was going on. But 
So back in the 80s when I was disfellowshipped for smoking one cigarette and I wasn't even baptized and I was treated as disfellowshipped and totally shunned by my family until two years later they changed the rules so the light got brighter and the, and the truth no longer was the truth. It, it changed. So we're talking a small change way back then. Now we're talking um, a half a dozen to a dozen changes, uh, like within a really quick period of time, and nobody's actually noticing. I mean, I can see back then, you know, they make one change, and oh, Joe, his light has gotten brighter. And now, Tommy, uh, you weren't baptized, so we even though we've been treating you as as disfellowshipped because that's what we were told to do, and then they changed the rule because you weren't baptized. Uh, we can't shun you anymore. You know, you know, I was totally 100% shy. I was treated exactly as a disfellowshipped uh, baptized person for two years. Um, the light got brighter and the truth changed. And that has always been an issue for me. If the truth is the truth, then it shouldn't change. But then that was one issue that happened that year. But all of a sudden this year, and having how many, how many new lights? Everything is changing and nobody's saying anything. Nobody's actually, I mean, shouldn't people be like, what in the fuck? Right. You know, <laughs> you know it's pretty crazy that, that they, I mean, that just nobody is actually questioning this. And you would think that they would. And that there's got to be some people that are. But I'm just saying, you know, compared to back in the 80s, one thing was pretty rare and then now it's like all these changes are pretty important it's all, that's all I, got. I, I just feel like it's it's just crazy that that they all just stand by and don't even question it you know yep it, then it's weird they keep making excuses for them some of them and then there are people who are conflicted and are questioning it. And uh, I, I don't know what's going to happen. The, the more changes that they make, it's going to get to the point where they're going to cause divisions. I, I believe in my personal opinion, because the, like I think Rick brought out earlier, the people are going to be conflicted with being the conventional Jehovah's witness that they've been a hundred years, you know, not that they've done it a hundred years, but all these changes that they're making have like um, a lot of them have been instilled for about a hundred years. Uh, I think the disfellowshipping arrangement was um, was established in 1950. Let's see, 52, 1952, uh, from Nathan Knorr. But yeah, uh, I don't know. I I hope that there's a, a great awakening like there was in the 70s. And it's funny when I go on Quora and I tell people why do they why did Jehovah's Witnesses say that 1975 never happened? And then they tell me, oh, no, it was just some people. They all have that same thing. But like my grandfather, he was an elder before he passed. And he one day when I was a boy, like a t young teenager, he told me, he's like, Eric, um, in 1975, the Witnesses false prophesied. He like straight up told me. He's like, they made they made a mistake. They, they got a little excited. He said the governing body got excited. But he said, but he said that uh, there was a great exodus from it, and it was Jehovah testing the people to see if they would stay with their organization. So my grandfather, even though he knew, he still fell for it. And I was like, wow. And when I, and so when people lie to me and tell me, oh, no, no, it was, I mean, Fred Fran said in the year 1975, I don't know why he talks like the guy from The Wizard of Oz, you know? Ah, say. Like the, the 50s gangster. <laughs> You say in the year nineteen seventy four. I'm sorry. I'm just... <laughs> there, like we had the Kingdom Ministry back then, <laughs> which I liked that. Well, I used to like all the literature, but um, uh, there it was told years yeah. in advance about nineteen seventy five. That's why they burned it all, yeah. Debbie. Yep. I got baptized that year. Oh, okay. I was fourteen years old, and um, they told us. From the king, from the platform, that you know we couldn't get through Armageddon on the coattails of our parents, and that word coattails, I have heard Linda James say it. I've heard people 
all over, in different spots all over the country who we were all baptized in that same year, we heard those that exact same word. And the word coattails was not used in modern day English, or at least not when, well, it wasn't even when we were baptized and we weren't, we weren't, uh, we weren't that old, you know, that we would have heard something like that. But, but even then, uh, I, one of the things you were talking about a minute ago, I think it was Tom. Yeah, we went along with it. Uh, even I had questions back then. If no one is supposed to know the day and the time of when it was going to happen, and not even the Son of Man, how the heck could the Watchtower Society know Armageddon was coming around October the 4th or 5th? I mean, yeah, they, didn't, didn't they, they, they even have the time, movie? Debbie? Didn't they even have the exact time, what? like the like the, the minute to the minute? Uh, I, I think it was supposed to be that afternoon. Yeah. I don't remember though for sure. I'm not going to. They made a hell of a claim. And that's not the only. Oh, sorry. That's pretty crazy, you know. Um, uh, This this conversation reminds me of uh, one Sunday about three weeks, two or three weeks ago, that um, a a former brother called in. He was an older man. He was in his 70s, I think. He gave his story. And him and um, he and Anne Marie really hit it off, and they started really talking about their experiences in the 70s and the 80s with regards to, to what happened. And they said that it's kind of being glossed over to the point today to where they want the youngsters in the organization to feel like that never even really happened. But yet, when these when these kind of you know people that were around back then really start telling their experiences. It, it comes to light and the, the organization is trying to gloss over this. And uh, Anne Marie was really vocal about how when uh, uh, Fran, Franz came up and uh, he gave his, he, he got up in front of the, uh, the, the auditorium and started talking to the, the audience and everybody was slouching down in their seats. And she, she, she gave a really, really good impression in that, Sunday episode as to what he said with regard to why 1975 didn't happen. He said, yeah. do you know why it didn't happen? Because you wanted it to happen. Who do you think well, they, you They are? put it off of the people. Oh, yeah, um, I, I remember them talking about that. That's yeah. irritating. <laughs> Matt Maverick in the comment it. section says, um, Watchtower is still a Millerite Adventist group. Still looking to the predicting the end, et cetera. No change from 1844. It's so true because I don't know if if, if you guys agree, Debbie and, and the other brother. Um, what about when Stephen Lett said three years ago, I think it's been, uh, we are living in the final part of the last days, undoubtedly the final part of the final part of the last days, shortly before the last of the last days. That was That was three years ago. That's a false prophecy, right? Right? That's a false prophecy, right? Yeah. I mean, three. If you're that close, and three years pass, and then they also said in a, um, I noticed a governing body helper. I can't remember his name. He said that we're in the foothold. No, I'm sorry, we're in the threshold of paradise. And I looked up the definition of threshold just to get it clear. I knew it was a doorway, but that's exactly what it is. They're basically saying we're like stepping through to it. It's like, come on, that's a false prophecy too. Every time they do this, every time they say. The end is is close. We're getting so close. Oh, look, another disaster, another COVID thing, variant. They're going to keep doing it until it doesn't come true, until they've cried wolf so much that there's there's nothing left. And, and you know, a broken clock is right twice a day. And we'll know if, if right there is an Armageddon or, or an apocalypse coming. We'll know the signs. We don't need Watchtower to tell us. We'll know. <laughs> <laughs> That's you know what? There won't be any signs because even in the scriptures. Well, we'll just be going through it. Well, we'll know we're going through it. That's all I'm saying. Like no one can f- predict it. I'm not saying that we can. I'm just saying, oh, yeah, like we'll saying we'll, we'll be going through it. And I'm like, okay, now now it's here. <laughs> well, really, Sorry. it was like in the days of Noah. When people yeah. would be marrying and being given in marriage, they took no sure. note until it was yep. upon them. Well, right. and even in the New Testament, it says that it that 
it, it, will, it will happen like a beep in the night. So that means yeah. you won't be expecting it. You're expecting to go to bed and have a good night's sleep. You're not expecting yeah. some thief to break in on you and take you for everything you got and murder your whole family and stuff like that. But I'm just saying that even all of that has gotten confused talking about the time of the end. I mean, in a lot of the scripture, well, I know we're not supposed to be preaching. Never mind. I was going to start talking. I mean, I the scripture. Oh, you're good. That's for uh, Six Green Sunday, I guess. <laughs> Everybody has been waiting for it since Jesus said that in 2,000 years ago. And every yeah. time there's an event that everybody thinks that it's coming tomorrow or tonight or every day. And that's all it is. It's a thousand years of constant fear. And, you know, we can't escape it. We can't escape it because we have been indoctrinated and it's still in us, even though we think we're unindoctrinated. It's still there. And every time something happens, we think, oh boy, here it is. Oh boy, here it is. Even on six screens, Mm -hmm. we get this guy that comes on and talks about uh, the AI, and he talks about uh, uh, cryptocurrency, and everything is like, uh, you know, that the end is near, and the end is near, and the end is near all the time, and it's it doesn't we we can't escape it. It's well, the it's, thing the thing is is what you're yeah. you're right about something because the thing is is that we can't predict anything and uh cryptocurrency that 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 might not even be a thing uh, most likely you know i mean if the system collapsed the the system collapsed gold gold ain't gonna save you the only thing that's gonna save you maybe is the lord or hey you know what save up some uh, food and some guns (laughs) for a hard time coming um you know are you are you talking about fritz springmeyer uh brother i just want to ask you that Are you? Yeah, I like Fritz. I agree with a lot of, with with what he says, even though he gets a lot of heat. Yeah, but still, you yeah. know, it's the same thing, though. It's the same thing. It's the end is near. It's coming. And well, right. I, 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 I guess I lean towards Alex Jones more because because Fritz, Fritz kind of stays in the same gear, whereas Alex Jones stays up with current events and he's keeping us in the loops and he does he's not predicting the end. You know, he's not he's not saying to uh, really telling you what to do with yourself as much. Um, I, I appreciate Alex Jones just because he, he, helped me, he helped me wake up. Alex Jones is really out there as far as, uh, I, look, I've only been following Alex Jones and Infowars sporadically here and there over the past, I want to say yeah. five years or so, but I know, I know he's been around for a long time. Yeah, but a really long time. Going back to what Fritz, Fritz, going around to what Fritz Springmeier kind of alludes to, I really feel like most people that um, start to wake up should really listen to him because the things that he starts talking when he, especially when he starts talking about the uh, financial system, most mm-hmm. people have not researched properly why we we have the financial system the way it is today, and what, like for example, what inflation is, where it comes from, um, why why prices continue to go up time after time, and where does it all end? Well, we can we can speculate when the currency, let's say when the dollar is going to fail and when they're going to replace it with a CBDC, which they're trying to do in, in China and certain other countries. And we can speculate that cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Litecoin and all the other cryptos are going to eventually take hold that are decentralized and not uh, centralized around a central bank, not issued by a central bank, that that no one controls them. We can speculate that that's going to take over, but we don't know when or if it's going to happen. But we do know that when you use mathematics and you look at the the exponential curve of the debt around the world, it's not sustainable. So we know that something is going to happen at some point. The only thing keeping this this whole financial system going right now is debt. And when that stops, we're going to have a problem. And we're printing, printing we're printing money like it's nothing. We're, the dollar is, is uh, decreasing. That's why gold, people think gold and silver are going up. It's not. The, the dollar's going down. It's been going yeah, down for a long that's time. Right. That's exactly what's going on. And the only reason that, I have a question. the main reason, okay, go oh, ahead. Go ahead. go ahead, sir. What's your question? Isn't that all similar to basically 
people who say that the great tribulation is coming, isn't it all pointing to everything that Jehovah's Witnesses have been beaten into our heads? It really, to me, it's it's when I hear these things, it is as if it's confirming everything that we were told from childhood on, even though we realize this religion is full of shit. But guess what? Maybe you know, you know, and then, then it makes you doubt. You know, and it's like, okay, maybe they are right. Maybe this is coming. Maybe and that's my problem. Okay, I have. But that big, that, that can be the case. That can be the case, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the JWs are that one and true organization that if you have to be a member of it, you're going to be saved. You understand what my point is? Yeah. It's the fact that I've been hearing it all my life that I still, you know, I mean, it's it's been there since I was a baby. Um, so maybe, you know... If, if all this other stuff is actually pointing towards what they were saying, um, maybe they were somewhat right. You know, I, I'm just. Saying but it won't. I'm, it won't go. It won't go the way they think it. It's going to go. You know, it's not going to go the way they think it's going to go. That's the problem. They they think they have it all planned out. They have they have pictures in their artwork where the uh, governments are attacking Samuel Heard. He's in the background on the TV. It's so ridiculous. These guys think so much of themselves. Um, there, there's po it's possible. I mean, listen, with all the migrants coming to uh, Europe and to America, it, it's a takeover, and it could collapse our countries, um, our country and other countries. And yes, there, there could be a great tribulation coming to all of us because it seems like the uh, the powers to be, uh, say the shadow governments, or uh, if you want to call it the Illuminati, or if you want to call it the globalist. It seems like they want to collapse society, and it, it looks like they're doing a damn good job yeah. of trying of trying to do it. At least, you know, who knows what's going to happen? Yeah, but are. you know, a broken clock right. is right twice a day. They're broken. Uh, the witnesses they might get one or two things right, but that's it. You know, and they can't right. predict it, and it can't go the way they think it's going to go. And uh, they think that God's going to protect them through it. Um, I think that Jehovah's Witnesses are going to list the ones that stay in all the way. They're going to listen to the governing body and the governing body going to listen to the governments and they're going to be thrown into the FEMA camps that are scattered around the U S and I think that's what part of their tribulation is going to be. Um, they, uh, you know, the scriptures say, get, get out of her, my people, the witnesses, it's time to get out. Even the PMOs, it's, it's time to run, <laughs> get away from these people because they're about to make decisions that ruin your life. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. It's just a prediction that I, I feel like they're going to send them to FEMA camps. They're already telling them to take the jab. They're already telling oh them God. bad advice. Sorry, I've, I've ranted. Oh, Eric, can I interrupt? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm listening. I'm sorry. It was a rant. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's good. Interesting conversation. Oh, hey, Tim. I was just going to say what I'd like to differentiate between what the, what the witnesses are saying and what someone like Fritz Springmeier says. The witnesses is fear-mongering, which is not a biblical message. Jesus mm -hmm. never said, Jesus says, when you see these things occur, raise your head direct because you know you do. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's meant to be like, you don't have to be scared. Witnesses don't reject that message, you know, and they don't even point to what's actually happening in the world. In fact, they discourage you from what's going, looking at what's going on in the world, stay out of politics, and then they give false analysis of what's going on in the world like with covid they like obey the government everything it says so someone like chris springmeyer it might sound like he's he's trying to warn people in a sense and his message has always been we don't have to be scared of what's to come because Fritz Springmeier is a Christian, and that's what I appreciate about his message he's not fear mongery so while on the one hand it sounds like he is saying what they're saying, it's a totally different message. And, and he's saying actual, whether you agree with him or not, or whether some of what he says, you, you know, p people like Alex Jones put out a lot of truth. Uh, some of it might be a bit hyped. But if you're, if you're watching what's going on in the world and you've got half a brain, you can see the truth to these things. And it is definitely out of alignment with what the witnesses are saying. Now, yeah, the only thing that might be the same is there might be some bad times ahead. But, you know, that that's the only part where it, it goes.
goes along with the witness message. Otherwise, they're giving you a totally false message. And, and, and I hate, that's one thing I even hate about, if, if you're a religion and you're serious about preaching, then tell people what's going on. But the witnesses don't. They, they, they give people a false message about the world and they, they even tell people to stay away from, quote, conspiracy theories, which is just a label you to discredit a lot of truth, not, not again saying that there's not a lot of wacky stuff out there, but they're steering people away from doing research in every avenue of life, and 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 that again, it just boils down to how much of a cult it is. But that, thanks for letting me speak there, and and yeah, I'll, I'll just keep working and listening to you guys. Oh, you're at work, no doubt. I know we got such, we got such a different time change. <laughs> Always good to hear from you, Tim. Thanks for calling in, buddy. You know, such such a good point that you made. I mean, like the, the times are changing and things are getting uh, so much more bizarre. And the the witnesses are uh, they're, they're complying with the government. Uh, it, it's kind of obvious um, to some of us, and I think Tim was bringing that out. And um, it, it's scary to watch because they they say to be no part that they're no part of the world, and they certainly are. And um, I don't I don't um. I don't know exactly what they're going to do, but it, 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 it's scary that what they're, the power that they have over the people. And they're, they're going to, I mean, if they're already preparing the people to do things that aren't um, logical from a human standpoint, uh, that, that, or a strategic standpoint, whatever they say, it's not good. <laughs> but anyways, is there uh, someone that I, wanted to can I share? go ahead? Yeah. yeah I, I want I was wondering if I could, share uh, a, a yeah. current experience of what's happening to me. Uh, yeah, so I actually, Rick invited me to uh, come on the six screens and I'm going to be coming on the 24th and sharing a little bit of my story. I, I'm probably going to try to condense it down to 15 minutes or so because my experiences aren't really that um, aren't really that different from a lot of other witnesses that have you know, left the organization and, and grown up in it and whatnot. Sure, but they're always important. So to know. That, right. But it just so happens that uh, I, I haven't spoken to my mother in almost four years because she's still in, right? Now, I've been out for 18 years. And I don't know if it's just this time period because we know that, that there, there are memorials coming up on, I think it's on the 24th, if I'm not mistaken. Um, my mom, all of a sudden, I think it was earlier in March, all of a sudden I see a missed call from my mom. Now, after almost four years, I have to really question at this point as to why she would try to reach out after almost four years. Well, like, well what's changed, right? Has she tried, has she waken, has, is she in the process of waking up? Like I'm asking myself all these questions and I'm thinking because she, she didn't leave a message, she didn't text me. I'm thinking, okay, that's probably not the case because I would think that if she was waking up, she would definitely be reaching out more fervently. Now, get forward two or three weeks to last night. She calls me twice, doesn't leave a message, doesn't text me. I didn't bother reaching back out because I want to know what her, what's up with her. Like, why is she trying to reach back out after all this time? Tonight, she tries to call me again, twice, right? This time, on the second call, she leaves a message. And she basically just leaves a generic message saying, you know, I want to talk, blah, blah, blah. Give me a call back. So I, I started thinking about like what I'm going to say to her because I'm thinking at this point, I, I really don't want to rekindle our relationship if it's only going to be more of the same, which is her saying, come back, come back, come back. You understand? So here's what happened. I decided to go ahead and compose a message to send to her. And I sent it to her. I said, mom received your message. I'm glad you seem to be well. I have had suspicions that the reason you've reached out right now is to try to get me to the JW Memorial, which I am aware is coming up. I will not be attending that. I also have not changed, nor will I be changing my stance on returning to that organization. I respect your your decision to remain a member. However, as long as that is the case, I don't think rekindling our relationship is a good idea. Because just interjecting here, I don't I don't want more of the same. And then I said, I'm a very I have a very comfortable and happy life now with many positive people in it. 
and and interjecting again, that includes all of you guys, like the XJW community, but it's not limited to that. Mm. So I continue. In fact, I'm the happiest I've ever been, which I am. I cannot allow anything or anyone to derail that. I wish you the best. AF. Those are my initials. I said that. Wow, man. And then, yeah, get a load of this. This is what she said back. She said, I was actually going to ask you to attend the meeting tomorrow at 10 a.m., a special talk entitled, and then she gives the talk title. She says, since it has been 13 years since your dad passed, I thought you would like to hear this special talk. And then she has like seven exclamation marks in a row after that. Oh, so dramatic, right? He always loved reading the true Bible stories to you and knowing and to know no one of them was about Samson. And then like 40 minutes later, sends another message. Have you read the Bible all the way through, Aaron? Even encyclo- even the encyclopedia says that God's name is Jehovah. Does it? Is, is that a fact? Okay, I don't know. Don't let your pride keep you away from the truth. She didn't put quotes in it, but I'm, I'm giving quotes, air quotes. Jehovah is mer- very merciful and forgiving. Wouldn't you like to get to see and hug your father again? When he is resurrected in the coming new world, the paradise, pray about it. And then like 10 exclamation marks. So here's what I said to her at just like, like five minutes ago. I said, send me a picture of you wearing pants to the hall and Alfred Hart witnessing. Also, let me know how many brothers in your hall have chosen to grow a beard since the policy was changed. I'd be very interested to know. And at this point, <laughs> I'm trying to be a little bit facetious because it, it just doesn't matter at this point. Like, she is just, she completely ignored everything I said in my text. Did she not? She completely ignored it. I said, yeah, rekindling our relationship is probably not a good idea as long as you remember but i said i respect that you so is this is this all because of um is this all because of the governing body update is that when she started calling you and uh good night fixing my face thank you for calling in or coming in <clears throat> was that is that what happened brother she, she started calling me just out of the blue and really so really wasn't yeah get a, to get a reason oh, okay she just wants me to turn the off coming up tomorrow but uh yeah i'm not going to be doing that and here's yeah. what she said back to that uh facetious text i just sent her she said several of the and this is a really good thing that i think people should know because this is a real live positive uh, a real live firsthand ca- account of what's going on in you know one of the kingdom halls in in the east coast several of the brothers at our hall are now wearing beards she put seven exclamation marks after that seven exclamation marks i have not worn pants yet but i will sometimes five exclamation marks and then she sends a she sends a picture i don't know what the hell this is from but it could be from one from jw.org or something and there's like a a lady wearing pants next to a a a guy a, a brother wearing a beard who looks like elvis and I, i'm just i'm just being honest here <laughs> <laughs> like this is absolutely right. insane. <laughs> you, you can you cannot listen to this and think that these people have their heads on straight. And this is my own mother. I know, brother. I'm, I'm in the not, same boat. That's it. <laughs> and this is why I don't want to talk to her. And I feel like a lot of people that are missing their family, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, I understand it's different if you're a parent and you have a kid that's still in. Like is the case with certain certain ones. If you're a kid that has a parent that's still in, think about think about finding positive things. Think about why you left. Think about finding positive people, filling your life with those positive people and those positive things that will carry you through. Leave behind the old and in with the new. You can start you can become your own legacy. You can start new traditions. You can leave all of that behind. That's what I've done. Right? I am the happiest I've ever been right now. That's the honest truth. I just started driving for Lyft. And I quit my old job on the spot like a month ago. And all of a sudden, since I've done that, since I made that hard decision, I've had so many positive things happen in my life. I've met a lot of That's good great, people. I've, I've, given over, I've given over 300 rides 
I've talked to so many different people and I actually met potentially, uh, potentially met a girl that a really nice girl at a, at a bar the other night. And I have a date quote unquote with her on Tuesday night to go sing karaoke. So there you go. Like it can be done. You can leave all your old life behind and start something new. I'm really glad to hear that you're not willing to go back, you know, because I was wondering, I'm, I'm like, I don't think this trick is going to work. People have moved on with their lives. A lot of them and the, not for nothing. The indoctrination has worn off on a lot of people on a lot of people that have been out for a long time. I mean, I don't, I don't see many them getting many people from this at all. And, and it's, it's almost like an F you it's like, it's like, Oh, Hey, um, I'm your mother or your father and I haven't, or whatever. And I haven't talked to you in years. Um, do, do, do you want to talk now? Cause I was, I'm told that I can talk to you. <laughs> I think this about wearing slacks is really mind boggling to me. I must be thinking to attend the meeting. Just to see some women well, wearing slacks. Let's not let's not cut the brother completely off because we're going back to slacks and the brother. I just I really I, before oh, we I let know, him go before before we interrupt him, he had a beautiful story, yes. and I just wanted to yeah, okay. Sent, yes, yes. His mother sent that he sent about he if she wears slacks, he wants the picture. So that's why I brought it up. I was the yeah. million. He, he was talking about his mother could wear slacks. Well, um, that got weird. Oh, like awkwardly silent. Sorry, everybody. <clears throat> Uh, let's see yeah. what we're doing for time time here real quick. Uh, we're going to shut it down at one, one o'clock. Um, we've got about a minute left. So I'll, I'll let it go for a few um, more minutes. About the women being equal to men. I mean, Sweden is number one and the United States only ranked fourth place. And I think this is about women starting wearing slacks. That's... Uh, more like women being equal to men that we can wear slacks. And uh, I've been thinking a lot about this because this was a, like almost a prayer of mine that I hoped we were one day going to wear slacks. But now I would be terrified to go to a kingdom hall in slacks. I, I just couldn't do it. Uh, I would wear my dress probably and I, I couldn't wear slacks, I think. To Kingdom Hall. I would be terrified for somebody looking at me like I'm a bad person or something. But sure. I mean, I must, it would be a horrible feeling. I understand. The men. Yeah. I don't, I think, yes, I think men sometimes push women down. Yes. But it's the women also who push, push women down because. I remember like one lady, she said, oh, this girl, she's so good in the house, so she cooks and cleans. And it was like she was telling us, but you all, you are not good in the household. You're not cooking, you're not cleaning. But this girl, she's a good keeping the household. And those kind of remarks, they say uh, to brainwash us into being uh, good in keeping the household. And it's really unpaid household work. And it's to undermine the thing that women could be equal to men uh, when it comes to equal pay, equal responsibility in the household. And like in Sweden, lots of women are doctors and they actually make more uh, money than the man but still they have this system of pushing the women down and I think it goes back to way back in time to push women down and I really this is really annoying to me uh, sorry that's annoying and, to you um, uh, but it's uh, women also say that oh Swim Sweden went too far that's why Swedish men want foreign women, because Sweden went too far being equal. And I disagree. There is actually a study that say 
that if a man and a woman helps out in the household, what happens is the woman is not so tired. And what, what happens is when the women are not so tired, they want to have sex. So it's really good for a relationship. And since men want to have sex with women, I think they should help out more in the household. If they were intelligent, they would do that. But instead, they're like pushing women down, having women carrying the major load of the household work, and it ruins the sex life. And eventually, maybe cheating, divorce, etc. So it's not a good thing. And I really don't like when people are saying, oh, Sweden went too far in being equal. I think Sweden hasn't went too far yet. I think we have a lot of work to do. We still have this problem that men don't help out enough in the household. And uh, we can't go too far, I think, in men being equal to women. Unless okay. you men don't want to have sex with women anymore, then we can stop going, I think. Thank you. Thanks, Grace. Well, I'll tell you what, everybody. Um, I was going to end the show. Uh, Rick asked me to end the show at 1 o'clock. And um, it's 12 o'clock my time, 1 o'clock his. So um, if anybody ha is, has anything um, to conclude with before I conclude with a final uh, little comment. I have something. Yeah, go ahead. This is Tom. Hey, Tom. I'm answer, yeah. I, I just, yeah. you know, I just want to say something. You know, I, well, I, I've been outside changing the wheel bearing in my truck. Um, and now I have a issue with my septic tank. So I have to open that up and I have to break up the solids and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, there are certain roles that we all play. Um, I don't think that my wife wants to go out there and, and change the front wheel bearing. And I don't think she wants to go out and deal with the septic system. Uh, so, you know, it's a quality thing. You know, it's, it's, it's not as black and white as people think. That's all I wanted to say. Yeah, thank you, Tom. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. I, I changed tires on my car, and I know for a fact that a woman who is the Jehovah's Witness, she is a very delicate woman, and she and her husband, they changed two tires each. So a woman can do things. It's not so hard. Oh, no. Yeah, my wife, actually, she knows how to change the brakes and the calipers and all that stuff. I'm just saying my, my wife have, used to my wife used to prep cars and auto body for me and sanding and taping things in her in her dress. Yeah, we all do different things. That's and that, and auto bodies are like like what you were talking about, Tom. Uh, nope, both both trades are very dirty. <laughs> Sorry. No, nobody's <laughs> minimizing anybody. That's that's all. Nah. That was my point. Yeah. In fact, there's a girl that went viral, and the left is picking on her. She's a farm girl. Have you guys heard about her? And uh, she, she, uh, she's just a tom, a tom girl, and she does all kinds. Of, she like noodles. Is that what it's called when you uh, for catfish? She like she'll pick up a monster catfish right out of the right out of the bottom of a, a shallow uh, lake or something, and um, does all kinds of stuff like that. And um, She's getting picked on for not being womanly, but no, that is, I, I, I do think that that's feminine actually, um, you know, and I think that, I think the girl's a sweetheart, uh, the way she does her videos and the way she talks to people. But, um, yeah, there's lady mechanics. Somebody says in here, um, I've worked with, uh, an auto body, uh, women who spray cars, you know, um, uh, there, there's, everybody can do everything. It's just, uh, it's, it's up to what you want to do. Um, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't think that women necessarily as a whole want to go be like a, a truck, uh, a, a garbage man or woman. I mean, there's certain jobs that just don't appeal as much to women sometimes, but sometimes a woman is, has no problem with it. You know, it depends. And there's men who don't want to touch it either. There's men that don't change their tires and Grace does change her tires, you know? So, I mean, uh, it just depends. It, it doesn't belong to a race really. Um, you know, everybody's different. 
Sista, jag har varit svittnad om hur changes så tajer. She looks like a model, she dress like a model, she sounds like a model. And she is very, very girly. So it's not about being a man to change tires. A very girly lady can change tires. I That's do. My point. I don't That's have my, that was my point. That, that was my point. I was, my I'm on your side. Look like a man. Oh, Debbie knows the country girl I'm talking about. That's cool. Yeah, no, there's a lot of people here, uh, women here that do all kinds of man jobs and men who do women jobs. It's all. It, you know, it's all good, man. But anyways, guys, I'm going to um, conclude with the program um, here uh, and end with a final uh, little little thing. But um, if if, there, if anybody has anything else they want to say before I, I cut out, um, um, uh, Rick said one o'clock. It's a little over, but is there anybody that wants to conclude something before I go? Uh, let me look at the comment Eric. section. I don't see nothing. Eric. I, yeah. You know what I think is going to be the next change? Who's this? They're going to have female, they're going to have sisters being ministerial servants. You think so? I believe so. I, that would be something, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I would be shocked. With that, that's going to be a heck of a show on six screens and everybody else covering it on YouTube. <laughs> Yeah. Hey, yeah. Hey, Eric, I just want to yeah. thank you for everything that you do, Eric. You know, you you volunteer your time to come on the program, and uh, I just I enjoy I enjoy the way that you interact with all of us, and uh, you keep everybody engaged, and uh, you tell your own personal experiences, and uh, you're you're a very humble person, and uh, I would be thrilled if one day I could meet you at one of the uh, XJW meetups. <laughs> yeah, man. What's your name, brother? Uh, I'm Aaron. Oh, Aaron. Okay, sorry. I, it's hard to not see the person. Yeah. Um, I do better than that with the yeah, voice. No, I, yeah, I and understand. The more I talk to you, I'll memorize your voice, though. <laughs> right. Yeah, thank you, Aaron. I appreciate your kind words. And um, it would be nice to... to um, I, I, I need to meet um, JP, Jerry, too. And um, Debbie Moore. I, geez, I, I, the list goes on. There's a lot of good people. Thank you, John Marciano, for your nice words in the comment section. But yeah, dude, um, I, I would like to meet y'all. Um, we all we're all healing, and that's the that's the point of it all. We might disagree on things, but we're here we're here to heal and tell our stories, and you know. And uh, thank you, Debbie, for saying great show to Desiree and I. Well. I think I'm going to end the show, you guys. And um, I think the the last thing that I'm going to say in response to, um, I don't know, just how I feel, I, I immediately thought of um, a, a song, a song lyric from um, a guy uh, named Ben Harper. I think his name is. <clears throat> Anyways, the I'm not. I'm going to do you the favor and not sing it. All right. <laughs> so um, let us burn one to end to end. And pass it over to me, my friends. Burn it long and burn it slow to light me up before I go. My choice is what I choose to do, and if I'm causing no harm, it shouldn't bother you. Herb, the gift from the earth, and what it's from the earth is the greatest worth. So before you knock it, try it first, and you'll see it's a blessing and not a curse. That's all I have to say about that, y'all. <laughs> I love everybody here and we can disagree and it's cool. And um you all have a blessed and good night. And um we'll all keep loving I, each I other. And I, I think <laughs> God bless everybody. Love you all. Um thank you, uh, you uh, Booker T. Adams and uh <laughs> but Eric, you should debate Stephen Lett. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> can I do a good job? <laughs> I'll I'll impersonate him. Well, Eric, are you showing Eric, you Sincere and pretentance. <laughs> that guy talks like a freak. All right, everybody. You have a good night. And uh, signing off. Take care. Love you. See, see you in a couple weeks. Take care, Eric. Take care, everybody, Debbie, and everybody. Um, Bye-bye.
Anyone still there? I'm still listening. Uh, I was. I don't know if if Rick is going to end the show on YouTube and keep the phone line on. Sometimes he does that. Sometimes I think they sh shut off the phone line. I don't know. Oh right. So someone has their uh, YouTube on. We can still hear it. It's not me. I don't know who it is. But uh, yeah, I I think we can still talk until Rick ends the program. And that was my point that when Rick shuts off YouTube, sometimes the phone line is still on. Oh, right, uh, I've seen that. But yeah, um, so, so what so time is it where where? What time is it where you live? Oh, right now it's uh one one fifteen in the morning. How about you? It's uh, six six thirteen in the morning. Wow. That's uh that's pretty late. I mean late for me but early for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think actually, I think that was me that had my YouTube going. I'm, I apologize for that. <laughs> apologize for what? I I think uh, I'm using my mobile phone, so I didn't realize that the uh, YouTube was still playing in the background. So I I just I turned it off. Mhm. Mm so yeah, so Grace, um, I, I was thinking about you over the last couple of weeks that uh, you hadn't called in for a while but uh it, it was good to hear you you know called in today and i think maybe last week too a little bit i heard you i think uh, i was talking to what's his name now zachary and uh, brian from canada right yeah you know i'm gonna have to uh to go back and listen to the rest of the broadcast because i uh i missed a lot of it <laughs> That's I, what usually happens to me also because I'm sleeping all the time. Hello. Hey. How you doing, brother? Hey. Hey, Tom. Oh. Hi, Debbie. How are you? That's great, right? Yeah. No, this is Tom. Who, who are you? It's the great the Tom Sweden. Who's the other gentleman? Uh, Aaron. Aaron. And where are you yeah. from? Uh, I'm from Delaware on the East Coast, USA. Oh, nice. Uh, I'm from New Hampshire on the East Coast, so we got the same time. Yeah. Okay, great. So are you thinking about coming to the uh, Still Alive in 25? Definitely. Uh, definitely. Yeah. Uh, I'm definitely thinking about it. Um, it's I just it's so far out. Them. What's that? Yeah, it's just it's so far out that I'm like, can I really commit to, co to going at that you know, something yeah. that's so far out or not. <laughs> well, the good thing is we don't have to get a plane ticket. We can just drive. That's true. That's true. Yeah. And I'm, I'm in New Hampshire, so it's only like a two-hour drive to Boston for me. So I had no excuse. Wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> it was it was a two-hour drive for me today to uh, to go to the meet up with uh joe fran and a couple few others and uh, i had a really good time you know oh where'd you go where was it it was uh in bethesda maryland at a panera bread and uh so there was one guy that was there first and i got there second and joe and fran arrived third and then it was it was a blast <laughs> awesome awesome yeah i'd like to meet up with them sometime they it's pretty cool what they're doing. <laughs> yeah, like literally, Joe and Joe and Frank are on kind of like on tour on the whole entire East Coast, and uh, it's really it's really good how in sync they are and how they can, you know, 
share the responsibilities of what they're doing. Like Joe does all the driving and Fran does the uh, record keeping and everything. It's just, yeah. it's phenomenal. Yeah. And, and they're, they're doing all this with, uh, still with not being able to contact their children. And it's, it's just, it's, it's amazing what they're, the strength that they have. I, I'm, I'm impressed. Yeah, it is amazing. It's totally amazing. It's, it's wonderful. You know, I'm sure it's helping a lot of people. It has to be because it's not an easy situation that we're in. So some of us, it's easier. I mean, I had a lot of worldly relatives and, and, um, things like that. So it was a lot easier for me, I guess. And, and I would say half of my witness relatives had left, you know, so. You know, it's, it's, but a lot of people have nobody and this is going to be wonderful for them. Mm -hmm. So was that, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't have, I I don't have any relatives in Jehovah's Witness, but I do have my best friend still in. Yeah. Are you still best friends? Well, he doesn't like me much anymore, I feel. Yeah. First up, you were you again? Since he became a witness, he started treating me differently. He threw away all the pictures of me and everything. That's tough. Yeah. You said you're in Canada? How can you be in Canada in that far, five hours uh, different? No, I'm in Sweden. Uh, no, Bri- oh. Brian is in Ca- Canada. I was talking about Brian and Zachary. Oh. Sweden. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> pretty neat. It's nice mm-hmm. to talk to you. <laughs> Sweden, that's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you. So how are you these days, Tom? Me? Well, I, I kind of mm-hmm. um, like hinted because of the, the conversation that we're having. Um, I actually, my life was saved uh, last two weeks ago, actually. Tomorrow will be two weeks. Um, I had an allergic reaction kind of to a medicine that I was taking, my high blood, uh, blood pressure medicine. It wasn't really an allergic reaction. It was just a side effect, but uh, they had to intubate me. And uh, then I'll put me under and put a tube in my throat. Kind of scary. Um, Because I couldn't breathe because my throat closed up. And what saved my life was actually blood plasma. And Mm -hmm. so I spent four days in the intensive care unit. And I'm out now and I'm feeling pretty good. So... I'm happy you survived. I mean, it would be very sad if you weren't on six screens anymore. Yeah, no, it was close. They said that if I hadn't have been at the hospital, it actually closed up and wrapped around my voice, my vocal, my vocal cord. And they said usually mm-hmm. once it does that, it's only a matter of, you know, very short period of time before you can't breathe. And if you're not at a medical facility, or somebody doesn't know how to cut you. Uh, you know, I'll give you a tracheotomy. Then a lot of people die from that. So I was there just in time, I guess, and left. But yeah, so I'm happy. <laughs> but anyways, yeah, I've been sick all winter um, from this medicine. Um, I've lost over 30 pounds over the winter uh, from not being able to eat and going out for no reason. And, um, but now everything's mm-hmm. under control. All my blood channels are coming back normal, and I get a new lease on life. So, yeah, that's that's why you haven't heard from me all winter, because I just haven't been able to, you know, participate, because I've been pretty sick. So. Yeah. And that's horrible. That's horrible. That's like a nightmare. Oh, it has been quite a nightmare. But, but I, I you know, it really uh, rung through with, we were talking of somebody had mentioned the pharmaceuticals and I don't know if it was you, you know, talking about marijuana and the pharmaceuticals and stuff. 
Well, the pharmaceutical companies will lie, 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 lie. It's all about just getting people to take their medicine. And I was a perfect example of that. You know, and I almost died because of those pharmaceuticals. That's what almost killed me. It really did. Uh, and that is no lie. That's not an exaggeration. Um, and it had nothing to do with, you know, and, and so anyways, I'm just happy to be alive. I uh, changed my medicine and uh, my blood pressure is back to normal. And every one of my blood panels, because all the medicine that they gave me to try to get my swelling down, uh, almost destroyed my kidneys. So I was on a cut, so I ended up spending, spending extra time in ICU because of my kidneys and stuff. But then I just had my blood panels uh, Thursday, and everything is back to normal. So, and and everything was screwed up all winter, uh, and they were trying to figure out what was going on, and nobody knew. You know, they tried this, they tried that, they tried the other thing. And finally, when this swollen thing happened, and that's what they attacked, and they changed that medicine, everything went back to normal. So it was all because of that medicine. So have you have you stayed home like on sick leave the, in the winter or? Oh, I get laid off in the winter, thankfully. Uh, I work a seasonal job. I work in outside construction on building roads, and um, so I was happened to be on layoff, and so that worked out good. Um, so I didn't miss any work. So anyways, yeah, that's been my story for the winter. And I'm just sharing it with you just because I kind of hit on it earlier. No, hey, uh, it, Tom, uh, did you did you say you, you had potential kidney issues? Yeah, because of all the medicine. So they, they, had, uh, they, they, gave, they gave me everything they could think of to try to get the one to go down. And it didn't work. Uh, and so they had to give me all the pain medicine, all the medicines to make you knock you out to do an intubation to, to put the tube down my throat and wow. the three that they planned on they gave me a maximum of all that and that still didn't work so they had to throw another one at me so because i don't know why but anyways so they had put so much medicine in me um just to get me knocked out so they could put a tube down my throat so that they could let the swelling go down on its own. I mean, they almost had to cut my throat open. It was so close. They used all the different tubes that they had, and they got down to the smallest one, and then, you know, and uh, they didn't know if they were going to be able to get it down my throat. And so if they couldn't do that, then they were going to cut my, my trachea, or it could be a trachea, but out of me. But then I would have been in the hospital another week, probably, to heal. But they were lucky, and they got it down. Wow. Well, that's, that's yeah. good they got it. Yeah, they did. Yeah. And so I, you know, it took me a while. I don't find, but, but the, you know what the medicine was that saved my life? Um, and I didn't, because I didn't, I had, I had, it was, it was weird because I'm in the emergency room and I had a, like, physician, you know, the lead physician, and then they had to bring another one in as a backup. So I had to sign paperwork for both of them. So I had two like surgeon guys, and then I had like six or eight other people. I mean, the, the room was just full of medical personnel and equipment that they were like, "We hope we don't have to use this, but this is all here just in case." Um, and they really took it very serious. They knocked me out, put me under, put the, the, the tube in so I could breathe, and brought me from Laconia down to Concord, New Hampshire. Um, they put me in the ICU there, and I was like right off the main the, the, the main physician that was on duty. He had a window right into my room, um, and so it was like a number one priority room. They really took it very serious, and uh, but they did a really good job, and, and I came out of it. And but I didn't realize till later, a couple of days later, I was talking to one of the doctors. And they're like, yeah, the medicine they used that saved my life was uh, blood plasma. And I was like, well, so if I was a Jehovah's Witness, does that have anything to do with, like, um, so I know they can take certain, um, 
certain parts of blood. Uh, what do they call those things that they are allowed to take? Parts of blood that they can take. And they said no. I, for, you I, I forgot. I actually uh, read this book, uh, The Blood Issue or something by Carl o Olaf Johnson, but I forgot now what it's called. Yeah. Uh, uh, fractions, yeah, blood fractions. So then he took the fractions. I said, so was it fractions or what was it? And they said, nope. Blood plasma is basically whole blood. All they do is pick the white blood cells out. And that's it. So it's everything in the blood except for white blood cells. And that is what saved my life. If I was a Jehovah's Witness, they said that I would not be able to have that medicine. And I would have wow. been intubated probably four or more days waiting for the swelling to go down on its own. Uh, but I was only intubated for like 12 hours or something like that. No more than 24 hours. Before they actually pulled the tube out of my throat. But they said it would have been four days or more for a Jehovah's Witness. Um, but they probably would have lived, you know, but they would have just been more complications, that's all. Um, and I didn't, you know, it was like that's the first time I've ever had any type of blood. I didn't even care. I didn't even question. I just signed the release form, like whatever. You got to cut my throat because I was, I had, you know, I, it was like, I couldn't swallow my spit, you know, <laughs> and uh, I was having a really hard time breathing. So I just signed the forms. It's like, you know, if you guys got to cut my throat and for some reason have to give me blood, which I don't think you probably will. It wasn't even an issue to me, you know, it's like I already know that's not even uh, just not even a, a legitimate you know, thing. But it's but still in the back of my mind. Yes, because I've been programmed all my life about blood, you know. So it's scary, you know, the idea of it. But I was like, you know, it don't matter. I want to live, you know. And I had no idea that's what they, that was the medicine that they would use. But I found out later that, yeah, I had blood plasma. And that's if, you, if you had been a witness, you would have been dead now. Mm -hmm. No, no, I may not. Have, they said I probably would have lived, but it just would have taken a, another extra week or so. You know, uh, I would have been in the hospital a lot longer. And there was a more chance of more damage from being in being out that long, you know. So it's very interesting that it just happened, you know. It's like but I, I started getting sick in uh, like December fifteenth. I started throwing up uncontrollably, couldn't eat, I had no energy, um, I was hallucinating, um, you know, I just it, it was just like nobody knew what was wrong. We didn't know, you know, and there was no. But then when I finally, you know, I did some blood tests, and they were like, "Yeah, worried about my red blood cell count. Everything was way off. You know, everything was off, and they didn't know what was going on. So I I quit drinking and alcohol, and that helped because that was the common, you know, the combination of the alcohol and that medicine. Um, was just destroying everything. So, um, mm -hmm. so I was I was feeling better, but then all of a sudden my throat closed up, and then they found out it was the wisinopril that I was taking, and so now that's supposed to be an allergy, but it's not really an allergy. It's just you know a side effect, possible side effect, it's rare. Uh, <clears throat> so they changed my blood pressure medicine to something else. So, um, you know, damn, I love it. And it's working. My blood pressure is good. My kidneys, they kept me an extra day because my kidney function was almost, uh, they were worried, you know, that I was going to renal failure. So they had to keep me over the night for an extra night. And it went down 0.002. And they were like, well, at least it's going down. So we're going to let you go home. Um, and my liver function was wicked high before. And then... Just the other day, I had all my blood work done, and my my liver function is perfect. My kidney function was back to perfect. My sodium level was back to perfect. So all the problems that I was having, I mean, I had to have CAT scans, and ultrasounds, and all that other stuff, you know, trying to figure out what the hell was going on. And then, then I ended up in the hospital with this, 
And now that that's under control and we got rid of that medicine, everything is back to normal. So, yeah. So now I get to, I can unload on my life normal again. I haven't been able to do anything all winter. I, I started working on my tractor at the beginning of the season, uh, like in uh, November or whatever. And I had all my tools on a fold out table by my tractor so I could fix it. And um, I threw a tarp over that and my air compressor and everything. And it sat there all friggin' winter because I had no energy to even go out and pick them up. So once I got all better and got out of the hospital and everything, and it was like I had energy. I went out, I got all my tools and brought them inside, let them thaw out, uh, you know, get the water off them. Because even though they were under a tarp, they got wet. Because they sat up there all winter because I wasn't able to do a friggin' thing all winter. I had no energy, none. I mean, I couldn't even, I couldn't drive, couldn't focus to drive. I couldn't, you know, I was, you know, I mean, a couple of times I thought I was going to die. My wife thought I was going to die. They didn't, nobody knew what was going on with me. Nobody knew what was wrong with me. But it was all that medicine. It was the side effect of the medicine. Almost killed me. Yeah, but... you know, it's, a, it's a scary thing when you don't hear a person a long time on, on six screens. You you wonder what happened to them uh, or you don't know where people go. Yeah. You know, it's not something, you know, I'm sharing it with you two. You know, it's not something at all. You know, it's no big deal. But the thing is, you brought up the thing about medicine and, you know, the, the you know, and the thing about pot. And the thing is, you know, plus natural, but this wasn't natural. And it almost killed me. So, lots of things you know, have saying, there's, an argument, there's just an argument to be made. I'm not, I definitely do not want to argue with you. I just want you to know. No, no I'm, I'm, I'm not arguing. I'm just saying that lots of things have side effects. And it could be pot, it can be medicine, it can be alcohol. Lots of things have side effects. And... Often we don't realize what is the problem. Why am I having this reaction? Or and then when we eventually find out, we usually get surprised. Yeah, it's, it was crazy. It really was. Yeah, I hey, Tom. I got a new doctor and everything. <laughs> Tom. Yeah. Yes. You said you were on Lactanapril. Are you still on that? No, I'm now. I'm, they put that on an allergic thing for me because that that almost killed me. Western Pro is what almost killed me. What are you uh, taking instead of it? Uh, I'm it, uh, uh, I got a new new one. I can't. They changed something. Changed something else. Amlodipine, I think it's called. Amlodipine. Amlodipine? Are you in heart failure? No, no. It's for high blood pressure. For hypertension. Okay, I must be thinking of another one that starts with an A. Yeah, no. I've been on less real from when I went in heart and kidney failure a few years ago. And they told me I could never get off of it because it was what was controlling the, the um, stuff between my heart and my kidneys. And I've been scared to get off of it. But, I mean... Uh -huh. But I, I, I've been, they've had me on a, a whole lot of medicines, and I've been getting off a lot of them. And I've been turning down like a statin drug. I won't take that. And then the rheumatologist wanted me to take something like Fosamax, but that she kept saying, "Oh, it's not going to hurt your kidneys," because I've been in kidney failure and I've had kidney cancer and nephritis and all kind of stuff. And uh. I've got lupus, but I've had those complications that lupus has too. And um, and she was asking me, well, uh, and I've broken probably 30 bones at least oh, since I was like in my mid 40s. What are you do uh, working with? But uh, you do work with Evil Can Evil? Yeah, I guess. No, my bones and, and black ice just don't go together too well. <laughs> right. Wow. But, but, isn't, uh, there, isn't there something about if you drink uh, too much water, you can actually damage the kidneys or something? I don't remember. Do you remember? Oh, my, I, I, I have oh. had kidney 
cancer and kidney disease, and it runs in my family. Both of my grandmothers died from it, and my daughter had to be on uh, uh, kidney dialysis, and and then she had to have a kidney removed on one side, and I had to on the other side. So just, it's not drinking too much water. It's not drinking too much of anything. It's just a genetic thing, you know, that we have no control over, but the the key thing, though, is to not drink too much of anything but water, you know, unless it's like herbal tea or something. And I've tried to get off a lot of the pharmaceutical drugs and get on a lot of uh, herbal medicines uh, mm. to keep from having so many side effects. And I don't want to be addicted to that many, you know, they have me on like 25 prescriptions. And I don't want to be dependent on that many different medicines, and there's no way they can convince me that if I'm on that many different medicines, that some of them medicines are not going to interact well. They're, you know, there's got to be some of them that just aren't going to go with the other ones, and they don't even know yeah. half the effects. And the doctor that wanted me to take that Fostamax to rebuild my bones said, oh, well, unless you're on kidney dialysis, it's not going to bother your kidneys. And I said, but the research I've done says something different. Mm-hmm. She says, well, let me print you off a, 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 a thing about it, about it so you'll feel more comfortable about taking it, which I never did take it. But the very first line of that thing, of drug, about uh, the warnings about that drug, was do not take this if you've ever had any kind of kidney problems. You know, it doesn't matter if you're on kidney dialysis or anything, period, if you've had kidney problems. And I'm going to just throw it lots, of, lots of uh, doctors, they don't know what they are doing, talking about because they, they are not educated enough and they are supposed to go and read because we have a, a big, big book here in Sweden. And then they have additional information like on the internet that uh, probably only the doctors read. And you're supposed to read through everything. And then there can be lots of medicines that don't mix. But they don't read it, I think. And uh, lots of people, they don't read the fine print on each medicine either. They just take them because the doctor said so. so. It's really dangerous. Yeah, I've got a friend. Go ahead. Oh. Sorry, I, I just I, I heard you guys talking about the whole kidney thing, and um, well, yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, even though I'm only forty, I'll be forty-one in August, and uh, you know I might be a young guy by certain certain standards, but <laughs> I, I had a scare that uh, I I might potentially have some issues with one of my kidneys, um, what and I, I I well. I noticed that uh, I had a few months, actually, no, it was probably about a year to a year and a half ago that I had some unusual symptoms such as bubbly urine, and that's mainly the, the, the symptom. Now, it's not really discoloration, such as like orangish, reddish type of thing, although the color kind of varies sometimes, but, but I, I won't dwell on that. The point is, I still feel great. I still feel like I'm in good shape. But I still have the bubbles in the urine sometimes. And I went to the uh, doctor not that long ago, and I had some tests done, like a uh, ultrasound and a blood analysis. But to be honest with with all of you, I have not. uh, Well, first of all, they haven't called, you know, and and usually my doctor will call me if they see a problem with my test results, right? Now, I'm kind of scared to, like, call them and find out the results because what if I do have a problem? You know what I mean? Oh, well, you need to find out here. You need to find out. So you, you need to be a front more afraid to find out. Because if you don't find to. out if there is something wrong, it, you might wait till it's too late to fix it. And you're still really yeah. young. Right. They, you they the test done. Like I said, I had the test done. And I don't think they, I think they certainly would have called because they're going to get the results, right? They got the results. I feel like they would have called if there was something abnormal. They're busy. You're not. You can't, can't leave it up to them to call you anymore. That's what. That's something that I'm trying to get through to my daughter too. 
Uh, she says, well, they didn't do this. They, I said, yeah, well, they probably haven't thought to do it yet. They might think somebody else did it, and somebody else might think somebody else did it. No, you got to take your care into your own hands and take responsibility for finding out what test you've had, what the results are, what the results mean, and all that right. kind of stuff. Hey, can I throw something well, else in? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I- all right, in June of 2022, I had the same issue. My throat closed up. I went to the doctors, got it fixed, to the emergency room, got it fixed, and nobody ever um, figured that it had anything to do with that medicine. So they just, all they cared about was the symptoms, and then they got the symptoms to go away. They did not worry about what caused it. Um, their issue and their most important thing is to, you know, just get rid of them. And it's profits so, over people. Right. So, you know, it, you have to, you do have to, I mean, I didn't know this and I never, I never questioned what caused this, you know, I mean, but that could have been my responsibility to question. It. And then the, maybe they could have looked into it and said, oh, guess what? You're on a medicine that that's a symptom. You know, that happens sometimes. But on their own, they're so busy. You know, they have a thousand, a thousand patients, you know what I mean? You know, and all they're concerned is, okay, you're better now. So we're not, you know, they're not going to do a bunch of research. They don't have the time. You know, so it is up to us to be a little proactive on some issues. Just saying that, you know, I definitely don't practice what I preach because I obviously did not do anything about it. But hindsight, 2020, and it's like, oh, well, from now on, I'm going to be a little more proactive. You know? you know? And I suspect that avoid. the test that costs money, that's why they don't hand in too many tests. They just make the basic test. Right. So, I mean, if you don't ask, you're not going to know. So, it's almost important for you to actually take that step. And you're only 40, so, I mean, when I was your age, I could outwork the 20 year old. Right. I, I really can. I'm, I'm, I'm a, you're a what? I, I'm, I'm just, I'm a great worker. I, I quit. I know I said it earlier, but I quit my job about a month ago because they were just basically instituting slave labor with uh, the employees that were at my old company. And I, I just, I dealt with it for four years and I just couldn't deal with it anymore. And ever since I quit that, ever since I quit and started driving for Lyft, like I said, my life has just improved dramatically. You know, like I don't, I don't have health and benefits right now, but um, I can certainly get them if I, if when I want to, you know. But the question is, Aaron, the point is, Aaron, the point is, I'm how would can I make a suggestion? Yeah. Um. You you really a lot of people don't know the importance of having health insurance. Right. Uh, I'll tell you when I when I was twenty three, and I uh, I had health insurance and I didn't know that it was canceled while I was in the hospital, and I was really bad bad sick, and I had been in there for a week. And they thought I had leukemia. I looked like I had leukemia. And uh, I had leukopenia. But it's, that's a side effect of lupus. But after my insurance canceled, they said, well, you really need to be here. But they won't let us keep you because you don't have health insurance. And as sick as I was, they packed my suitcase. I was 23. I had two little kids. They packed my suitcase, and I was a newly divorced woman also. And uh, they called my parents, who had my kids, and told them to come pick me up. And they wheeled me in that wheelchair down on Main Street in Memphis, Tennessee, and left me. And that was the busiest street in the entire Mid South area, it was the main street of Memphis. It was like six lanes of traffic. 
and they wheeled me down there on the sidewalk and left me in a in a wheelchair with my suitcase. I couldn't even mm-hmm. sit up. I was sick. So then I, I and I, I then I was still too sick to go to. The, I mean, I was too broke to go to the doctor because I didn't have my health insurance. Well, once you get diagnosed with something, you cannot get insurance. It will make you uninsurable. Well, it was uninsurable with lupus. You don't ever know what disease you're going to. Nobody plans to get cancer. Nobody plans to have a heart attack. It just happens. My daughter has not been able to get insurance because of having cancer and heart disease and kidney disease. Very poor health because she's got lupus from me also. You know, I mean, it's but, another genetic thing. And we both have that, all the complications you can have with lupus. Right. But but doesn't that fall under the, uh, like, let's say she gets a full-time job with, uh, you know, a 40-hour week and uh, employer and gets employer sponsored health and, and benefits. As far as I understand, now I could be wrong, but the Obamacare um, mandate said that they cannot deny you for pre existing benefit pre existing conditions under the under that particular. Um, well, she has a full time forty hour job. They do not right. offer health insurance, and oh, yes. They might tell you they cannot deny you insurance for pre-existing conditions, but that does not mean that they will treat a pre-existing condition. I used to be a health insurance agent. I specialize in helping people with pre-existing conditions. And insurance language is so tricky, man. I mean, they will... uh, I mean, I went years with no insurance until I got a job with with an insurance company. Uh, but I had I worked for an insurance company for two years, and they wouldn't they wouldn't cover me at all. And then I was only able to buy hospitalization insurance, but you had to have it paying the full premium for was it 12 months or 24 months before it would cover anything pre-existing? And, I mean, you could uh, you could have pneumonia or something and then later on get lung cancer. Well, then they might say, well, you had pneumonia, so that, that means your lungs were weak. It might not have anything to do with the fact that you had pneumonia, that you got lung cancer or something. But if, even if they say they're not going to deny it, that doesn't mean they're going to cover it. Wow. I, I yeah, even with these big insurance really companies. Really oh, yeah. It's, they can, you can get screwed over big time if you're not, if you don't know the way to read a lot of stuff. And still, I mean, sometimes insurance agents don't understand, you know, certain things. You can't know everything about every policy if you're selling a lot of policies. Wow. Mm. It just reminds me it just reminds me of the fact that um life is precious and it's it's so fleeting. I mean, the time that we have here on this planet, I mean, it's finite, regardless of how long we can be here, right? I mean, at some point we won't be here anymore. And that's the the part that I think as all of us as human beings we have to reconcile within ourselves. And it's just, it's sometimes that can be hard, I think. At least for me, it's it's difficult. Yeah, <laughs> we can't imagine one knowledge. day we won't exist. Right. Do you still believe in the Bible, Aaron? I'm not going to say I don't. Um, I believe that, you know, the Bible could have potentially been inspired of God and sent to humans, but I also know that over the thousands of years and millenniums that the Bible could have been altered and changed and, you know, all of that. So, and I, I also, I think that um, we, we need to figure out, for, figure out how to serve God on our own rather than using an organization to do so. 
And oh, yeah. It was because the, the organizations, all the earthly organizations that are there are corrupt. And the corruption extends so far and so deep that it's just, it's mind-boggling. So if we serve God on our own, I don't see how God can not spare those that are, are righteous of heart in the day of his wrath when that comes. And that's just my opinion. Well, no, I was basically asking you more or less if you still believed in God more than anything in the Bible. You know, because yeah. you don't need a religion or anything to serve God. And um, um, in that new governing body video uh, I sent to a bunch of people, I wrote a long comment in the comment section, and uh, one of the things I, I mentioned was, um, oh, good grief, my, my brain keeps disappearing on me. Oh, well, one thing, you know, y'all were talking about the blood a little bit ago and how the Watchtower came out with the blood fractions and all that crap and the plasma and what, how each thing is different from something else. Well, the Watchtower, I, I imagine they're going to come out and say taking blood is fine because the blood that the Bible was talking about was that of animals and not humans. And they didn't have blood transfusions back when all that was written. So Watchtower just interpreted that the way they wanted to. They used to say that having an organ transplant was cannibalism. Do you remember that? Any of y'all? Well, they changed that. So then they're like, well, you know, now you can have an organ transplant. But that's just what I'm saying. They put their spin on what they want to tell people to believe, whether they know what they're talking about or not. And they don't know a lot of what they're talking about. And right now, I imagine the investors, because you know there are investors in the Watchtower Society itself. And they're the ones that are probably trying to get them to do whatever they can to retain members and to um, get more uh, followers. And, um, oh, heck, what's going to say? All they have to say is um, we have been reviewing the scriptures and uh, the governing body has come to realize that the scriptures actually do not prohibit um, medical use of blood. That we finally realized that it is talking about eating blood, and um, you know we were wrong about that. Uh, we don't have to apologize, but um, now we realize that you know by reexamining the scriptures that. Jehovah was talking about, um, and in the apostles were talking about not eat blood, not dead. And so now, you know, that's all they got to do. That's exactly what they've done with all the other changes. Well, we realize the scriptures do not say that you can't have a beard. Well, it never did. And the beard they, thing was stupid to begin with. That never made any sense. If they couldn't have with a beard thing, though. The blood thing is exactly the same. And I saw yeah. they got a boot to twist it and they will have to swallow it, hold fine and sinker. And that's all. You know, then eventually they're gonna have to because we can't go down from it. But anyway. I mean it's it's not really the governing body who owns uh Jehovah's Witness, it's the shareholders. I understood that they are the one who really cause the sh shots and not the governing body. Yeah, that's what I was meaning, uh, Grace, that, that they're the ones that make the decisions and they're wanting them to get more members because they're losing money on the, on it, because the watch there is just another business to them. It's a, it is a corporation. It is a business. And I mean, and all businesses are about making profit. And man, they've been, they've been making bukus of money over the, you know, over the years. But the thing is, there's so many lawsuits against the Watchtower organization now because of the sex, the child sex abuses. And I saw on TV on um, 
one of the news shows that all there's been all together fourteen brothers sent to prison in Pennsylvania because you know they're exam they're uh, taking out all the congregations in Pennsylvania. The attorney general is because of um, so much that was going on in that in that um, state. But I mean, it's going on all over the world. What came out, you know, in the Australian Royal Commission. That's why so many people left then, with because that was all about exposing the watchtowers, uh, covering over and hiding pedophiles in plain sight. You could, your kids could be sitting right next to a, a child molester, you know, a pedophile, and it could be an elder. Because a lot of these brothers are elders, and you know what they do with elders and stuff that are pedophiles? They don't just fellowship them. They send them to another congregation and let them start all over. Because that's just like the, what the Catholics did with the priests. They would just send them to another parish, and then oh. they would start all new victims. But actually, Jehovah's Witnesses are worse because they send with them a letter of recommendation that they are good with the children and teenagers or something. Uh, so they are worse than the Catholic Church because there the priest doesn't get the letter of recommendation. How do you know that? But uh, it was told, I think, here on six screens. No, it was uh, this woman, what's her name now? Selena Vertoloma, she told this. Oh, because I wasn't aware of that. Well, the other thing that's worse about Watchtower, they won't apologize. They won't say they did anything wrong, at least the Catholic Church. They did apologize, and they let a whole bunch of, of uh, priests go, you know? Um, and I don't think yeah. Watchtower will ever probably admit that they, well, they won't admit that they've done anything wrong with the child sex abuse either, and that's just ridiculous. I don't recall they ever admitted making any mistakes. They are telling they don't. lies. Oh, well, you know what? That's another thing. We were always taught there's one thing God cannot do. God cannot lie. If Jehovah had been letting this quote unquote earthly organization who was considered to be his mouthpiece on earth, he would not let that organization tell tell its followers one thing and then ow, Skylar, stop it. Oh. Are y'all still there? I'm here. Is anybody still there? I'm, I'm sorry, my cat ate me. Hmm. But. Oh, boy. I mean, they are completely out of order. And God is the, supposed to be the God of order, or orderly, or how you say. So, this is just well, out it, of order. It's all over the place. What's going on? Well, I mean. It would make Jehovah be being a liar if he, I mean, if he told them something was new light, say, 50 years ago, and then they come out and say, well, it's new light, saying that old light wasn't true. Okay, that means Jehovah let them lie that many years, because Jehovah knows everything. You know, he knows the end before, at the, the beginning before the end, and the end before the beginning. And I, uh, I don't know. I just, um, of course, that brings up another question. If he knew the most important, no, that is the number one right there. That is the number one thing for me, a hundred percent. Truth is the which truth. Which one? The truth does not change. The truth is the truth. The truth does not change. So when yeah, happens, it doesn't change. Right. Right. So right. That is the right. number one issue. The number one issue for me that no. No, I have not had any elder be able to fix it for me. I have not had any circuit overseer be able to fix it for me. They <laughs> all, nobody has the answer about that. And and that has always been my biggest issue. Yeah, I've always said that too. How old are you, Tom? 
55. Hmm. Oh, dang, I'm older than you, too. <laughs> How old are you, Grace? Oh, that's a intimate question, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> no, I'm just three, Grace. You know what, Grace? Right? Yes, I read in the chat. You know, I read in the chat section, they said, Grace is 70 years old and she's changing tires. <laughs> <That's what they laughs> Grace, Grace, if I want, if I, if I want to guess, I think you're 63. No older. There's no way you're older than 63. That's my guess. I stand by it. 63. Yeah. So am I, no Grace. Older. I just turned 63 in February. <laughs> When's your birthday? Right. Well, when is your birthday? Question. I don't understand why uh, why people think I'm seventy years old. That's so weird. Oh, they're just they're just playing around, Grace. They don't know nothing. That's why. Right. I was at, when is your birthday? What month? Uh, we're we're not supposed to think about signs and birthdays and things like. No, that. I was just. Uh, there's time. nothing wrong with knowing when your birthday is. It's just a month. Right. I was in February. I'm not. To be, I, you know, I still go to meetings sometimes. I was to a meeting this summer, and I was in November to a meeting. So I don't want to reveal my my <laughs> true uh, true identity. Oh, we understand. I, I apologize, Grace. I'm sorry. You don't have to apologize. Well, I just don't see what difference it makes. I just was wondering, when did you turn 63? When, when did you turn I just, 63? It has nothing to do with a sign, what I'm asking you. It's just... No, I never said I, no, I, never said I was 63. It was Aaron. He said, your top's 63. That's what he said. You said you were 63? No, I didn't. It was Aaron said, you, you're, no, you're, no, you're not older than 63. That's what he said. That's oh, I thought said. you said you were 63. Bruce, what, when, right. when were you? What's your birthday? You know, it's good to be a bit mysterious. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Oh, good. Grace, you're falling into that. You never ask a woman what her age is, and you're talking about women uh, being able to, you know, being able to change tires and stuff. Are you falling into that category of a woman who doesn't want to reveal her age? <laughs> no, I'm falling into the category of being mysterious. Nobody knows what I look like, and nobody knows my age. But even if you tell us when your birthday is, we're still not going to know what you look like. Nobody's going to be able to identify you by how old you are. And what <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't think it was that big of a deal. I just was wondering if I was the oldest one on here or not. I love the, I don't want to ask your age. I love this subject. I want to talk about it. We're going to have this uh, convention still alive in 2025. And I was thinking, if people are going to take pictures, maybe I, if I was there, I would end up on a picture and then everybody will know about me. So I wonder what policy are they going to have about taking pictures? Maybe somebody's in the background or. I understand well, that's my problem too because I have I have a son that is a full blown witness and if he thought that I was involved in anything apostate uh -huh. he would not have anything to do with me so I understand yeah. that problem. Well, listen to this. What if somebody would recognize your voice just from you being on a program like this, chit chatting like this? How do you well, know that? Would? For, for one oh. thing. No, they, they are not going to be listening to this if they are a good witness. They're not going to be listening to an apostate channel. I, so I have no problem deal. with that. No, but, but if they say, I will just deny it. Even if they try to kill me, I will deny it. I will just say, it's not me, and you can't prove it. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> I mean, why would you deny it? You would probably rather deny that you weren't a witness. That you weren't a witness. 
she doesn't want to leave the thing. I'm, I'm innocent. I, and besides, I'm not baptized, so I'm innocent in every way. And Tom is not baptized either, are you, Tom? No, but I still have children and relatives that are, so. And if yeah, I, I can I get that. And but listen, they, they, a I lot of still, people... I can still be labeled apostate, even though I'm not yeah. baptized. Yes. Yes, but but you listen, can't even, you can't be sure that a a good witness is not going to listen to an apostate channel. How do you think there's become so many emos? Well, no, they they do, they're not going to say nothing, though. They don't want people well, to know that. They're, they're not going to say nothing. Because if they do, they'll come and talk to me. Hopefully, they'll come and talk to me themselves and we'll yeah. have a good conversation. I think well, I you know, if you know, you can expect you know, to be get called you know, and get. You know, I sound. I think I sound a bit different when I talk English. And many, many of us witness, at least the older ones, they are not that good in English as I am. Even young people in Sweden, they can't really talk English. If you think my English is bad, you should hear them. So I mean. <laughs> I'm not too sure they would uh, listen to this kind of show. Oh, that's my that's my I own statement. We should ask Rick what is the policy going to be for taking pictures because they should have to regulate this. I feel we should ask. Well, you know, even at the happen. regular witness conventions, people took pictures all the time. I mean. You can't really control who takes the picture and where they're taking it. You could, you could be walking down the street and somebody that's just robbed a store have their picture taken right when they're walking past you, and you could be incriminated by it. You don't, you never know when your picture is being taken. What? If, yes. Okay. But if we had the policy, the the danger would uh, drop. All you got to do is wear glasses, and just like Superman, nobody will know it's you. Yeah. Well, yeah. I don't think anybody can actually control being, having oh, pictures. I could wear sunglasses and a hat. Yes. Absolutely. Yep. I'm just going to grow a beard. Oh, wait, I already <laughs> have one. I guess I have to one. Oh, Gray. Do <laughs> that. Grow a beard, Gray. <laughs> if you're a woman of a it's hard to grow look, a beard. <laughs> look, my my I don't know if you all were listening earlier, but my mom texted me and said that yeah. Her, yeah. there's a lot of brother brothers, quote unquote, in her kingdom hall that are wearing beards now. Like it's an okay thing. Like she didn't even know for over a hundred freaking years the reason why beards were banned in that organization. And I had to text her back and tell her that it was because of Rutherford. And she just was like, oh, I will pray for you, Aaron. You know, said it to her. Like, she's not even, she's not listening to what I'm telling her. For Christ's sake. No, I thought it was crazy what you were saying. That she, she just t totally blew off what you were saying and kept talking about what she wanted she to talk about. Like, you didn't say a word. How right. this, this and is, I, 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 that's all I think it is, because I have had a trouble understanding that term, but I believe that cognitive dissonance. Yeah, and I think I, it is. I think I get it. I think I get it. Yeah, but that's definitely but cognitive But I think it's kind of sexy if a guy is clean shaven. I like it. Oh, I like a man yes. with a good... A good beard, though. That's very well groomed. <laughs> I, I like, I, I, I got a woolly booger beard. If, if a guy wants to, if, if it's cold in the winter, I think if a guy wants to have a beard, but I think they should shave the rest of the year. Why? God would have put hair on their face if he didn't want them to have it. May That's another one that differentiates men from women. You know, men have hair on their face. Women do too at some point, but not like a man. You know, we have eyebrows and eyelashes and stuff, and we all have hair on our head. That, but that, that's the problem. 
too many times the, the lines are blurred between a man and a woman. Women have one have strengths one way. Men have strengths another way. But, and women have roll and men have bear roll. That's how we were created. We each have, a man can't have a baby. You know, a woman can. But a woman does not, no matter what she says, does not have the same physical strength as a man. A woman, a woman is usually more emotional than a man, but that does not make her weaker emotionally than a man. Men are Men were made for one thing, and women were created for one thing, and that doesn't make either one either less than or more than the other one. We're all, you know, yeah. we're, we're made to go together, you know. A woman is a compliment to a man. A man is a compliment to a woman. That's why right. homosexuality is not good, because they just don't, that's not natural. But that's, yeah, that's why. That's why I have a problem with the uh, the woke the wokeness the wokeness that's in society today. And uh, oh, you know, you look at you look at people like Bruce Jenner, who is now oh. supposedly named Caitlyn Jenner, changed his uh, changed his identity to a woman and everything. It's just it's so I just I can't wrap my head it's around disgusting. it. I'm I'm sorry. Yeah, I, and then we don't have to be JW to think that, that it's disgusting. We know that as natural human, humans, that's not natural, right? Am mm. I wrong? No, you're right. You're spot on about that. But, but, but what I think is the problem for me is not what they are doing, but they are promoting it on Swedish television. Like oh, they're uh, promoting it everywhere here, too. Well, it's not. Uh, it's promoted to children, and children on Internet, are getting brainwashed from all these TikTok and things, so and they get like they don't know what sex they are anymore. So it's really dangerous. It's brainwashing. And hey, brainwashing right. here, here the public schools, the the kids can tell their teachers that like I don't want to be a boy or I don't want to be a girl, and the school can take them to get hormone treatments by the doctors without even informing the parents. The parents might not have any idea what's going on at the school. The, the, person, the person that drives their kid to school on the school bus might know, but they, they're not allowed to tell the parents. It's ridiculous. It's totally taking all the parental control away from the parents and the school is saying, well, we know what's better for your child more than you do. And that's just wrong, too. And they're putting hormones in the food, even at the school. And that, that they're making people think the food is healthier. Yeah, it might look healthier, but that don't mean it don't have artificial hormones and stuff in it. That, that confuses these kids. They don't know if they're a boy or a girl. And they've, they've even got now a sex called binary or non-binary and and male and female and trans and and lesbians and homosexual homosexuals. It's all it's all a a, a combin, I don't know. It, it's a the making for a disaster for continuing the human race and society as a whole. It's breaking down civilization. Yeah. And, and not only yeah. that, but the the issue that I have with it is. The schools and other organizations are are getting involved in the students' uh, lives, and they're saying that if you don't want mommy and daddy to know that you have this view or whatever, you don't have to tell them, right? They're saying they're trying to go around the parents and letting this letting the, the these little kids decide for themselves what they want for their own sexuality or their own life. And kids don't know that when they're five years old. They don't know when they're right. 15. Every age, right. you can, you're not the same person at 15 as you are at 25. I mean, yeah, you know, and you're not the same five as you will be when you're 15. They got no, they have no business doing that with kids. Actually, parents shouldn't do it either. They should let the kids. Grow up and be and and then if they want to change who they are, let them deal with it. 
and then it's not your problem yeah. anymore. But, I mean, yeah, it is you know, your problem. I but if you take this medicine before puberty, then it damages the bone structure. So your entire bone structure is damaged. It's really dangerous drug. It's not just your bone structure. It's your whole mind and body that it damages because your body is thrown into a mass confusion that it's going to be confused anyway when they hit puberty. But just as a flurry of new hormones are coming, but still, yeah, they, that that will mess up everything. You're right, Grace. Can I say something? Yeah, I'm getting confused just by this discussion. I'm, I'm starting to think I don't know what I am anymore. No, can I can I say something? <laughs> Great. <laughs> That's awesome, Grace. You're freaking awesome. I love you, Grace. Oh my God, that's so funny. <laughs> I love you, Aaron. Hey, I, I gotta say. Go I'm, 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 I'm not 63. I think that was kind of rude, Aaron, that you tell me I, I, I am top 60. Okay, Grace, what's wrong with well, being 63? Wait a minute. Why is it an insult to be said you're 63, Grace? Well, maybe because I'm younger than 63. Well, listen, I know, if, but... I over, if I overestimated, I humbly apologize. I am so sorry, Grace. I think it's, it's because I'm so intelligent that you think a young woman can't be that smart. Yeah, yeah. agreeable. True, true that, true that. You're very intelligent. But you know, I'm the. I have siblings. They have high, higher education than I do. So they are. I'm the stupid one in my family. So everybody in my family. Is one in my family. <clears throat> <clears throat> but I mean, compared to them, I will always be the little one and the stupid one compared to them. So don't call mm -hmm. yourself that, Grace. Don't put yourself down like that. No, I'm not putting myself down. I said compared to them. Compared to them. Okay, but how do you know you're not smart in something they're stupid in? It's true. They have, they have so much education. It's the same thing like when I listen to Pixie. She's educated. She doesn't tell anybody, uh, don't uh, interrupt. She say, take a breath. Pixie, I, mm -hmm. I score genius level, but you know what? I don't have a lick of common sense. My daughter, on the other hand, never graduated high school, but she's got way more common sense than I've got. I just have book knowledge. She knows everything else. <clears throat> wow. <clears throat> so be just because you might think you're less educated Education does not make you smart in every sense. You might excel in something that they don't know nothing about. And they might excel in something you don't know nothing about. You never know. And I know I'm using a double negative when I say what I'm saying to you. I don't, well, I guess you know what I'm talking about. Okay. Well, some people Instead think of, I'm stupid. Some people think I'm stupid just because I have an accent, and I'm usually half awake when I call in, so I'm even more bad. <laughs> yeah, we know we know that you're that you're. It's way early there, because I think it's like four o'clock in the morning sometimes when you call in. I'm 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 starting to think I'm going to be more authentic now because I got complaints. I'm not authentic. I'm going to be more myself now. That's all we have can you be, not more, right? Have you not seen yourself? No, I'm going to be more authentic now because, no, I don't feel I have been myself. I have been, like, living a double life with Jehovah's Witness and everything. And I think, oh, okay. also, I, I think when I'm on six screens, I'm only, I, I'm not really showing my true self. 
people complain that I'm a certain way and when I'm on six screens and when I'm off six screens, I'm different, they say. I'm much more uh, firm when I'm not on six screens. <laughs> Well, I only know I only know the the grace from six screens, and I feel like you are your most authentic self that you can be. And you know what? Uh, years ago, I knew of I knew I know of I watched a YouTube video of a, a man named uh, Jeff Berwick. You can check out his YouTube channel if you'd like to. Jeff Berwick, B E R W I C K. He had a video that was entitled something to the effect of um, be the most authentic truth to yourself that you can possibly be. So he used to walk around with his dogs and walk his dogs around wherever he lived and talk about, you know, talk about the dollar, talk about the economy, talk about all these different things. But this particular topic was of special interest to me because he talked about a lot of things that really hit home with me. As far as, uh, you know, you have to stick true to yourself. And that was, it was a really good message, you know. Check it out. <laughs> you know what? That's why I use my real name. I've never not used my real name. And I even used my maiden name because I had, well, I knew thousands of witnesses back in the, you know, the Mid-South, our family helped get the witnesses uh, started down in the South. Um, I remember when uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated in Memphis because we were under martial law and they had tanks driving around in the streets and we had a few dawn till dust. And, that, and if you got caught out after them, they had the right to shoot you dead without, wow. w without any... Any notification, if you were out, you were might as well kiss your butt goodbye. I mean, one time we were out too late leaving the Kingdom Hall, and man, them tanks rolled right up to where we were, and my dad had to get out with his hands up. It was scary. I mean, because we were scared he, they were going to shoot him, you know, but he, we had my dad explained, you know, what was going on, and they let us go that one time, but they said, don't let it happen again, because back then, we had the meetings at 4 p.m. in the afternoon, and, you know, it's dark by that time, in the winter time, so anyway, I mean, right here, I thought it was good. My hair went out two weeks ago during a blizzard. And I've been trying to keep warm with my gas stove. And my daughter um, went today, and she was at Walmart, and they had a clearance of their radi radiant heater marked down to $20. And wow. she bought me one. Of course, that'll only keep the front of my house warm. It'd be nice to have another one towards the back of the house so my pipes didn't freeze. That man, I thought maybe this freezing cold weather was over. I think the other reason she got it was when she came over this morning. I was asleep, and I was wearing two sets of clothes and gloves, and I had three blankets covering me. It was so cold, and I had like three pairs of socks on, and um, and that was even the stove. I had turned it off during the night. Because I get scared of, of just using a regular gas stove to heat. Because I live in a trailer, you know. It's not real. I don't feel that safe it, here anyway, you know. Is it, pro but, is it propane or not? It's just central heat. You mean the heater um, Tina bought me? It's electric. Yeah. It's uh, electric. It's, and it's got normal, a... Your, your normal stove is, is what kind of... Uh, energy. Oh, it's just regular gas. Okay. Like natural gas? Yeah, natural gas. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's the best kind of gas that you can have, in my opinion. I think it's the cheapest and most efficient. Yeah. Yeah, it is, but I have a gas stove, and I'm in an electric wheelchair. And before 
I one time my wheelchair hit the knob on the stove and I didn't know it. And my daughter said she just got this weird feeling one night and she got up out of bed. She just lives down the street. But she got up out of bed and she told her husband, she says, I got to go check on mom. And she mm-hmm. got here and the gas had been leaking into my house for hours. Oh, uh, oh and she God. opened that door and she said the gas just about knocked her down. And she was wow. in my cat asleep and I was I mean we were totally gone unconscious and mm. she just started you know waking me up and well shaking me to wake me up and then we kind of the cat finally he woke up but um, it's kind of dangerous to have any kind of gas like that because you see on the news how, of houses exploding to smithereens, and usually it's a natural gas leak. Wow. And that's happened to me twice here. Wow. So electric is probably safest for me. And I, part of the reason I'm still on my own is I agree to not cook on my gas stove. But when it's like five degrees outside and inside it feels like it's 20 below zero, yeah. I mean, it's pretty cold and that night during a blizzard it went out and and I was cold but I didn't realize how cold it was getting and it dawned me there's something wrong the heat's not coming on and it was like 40 degrees in the house and I was starting to be able to see my breath in the air Whoa. but, but yeah. uh I called the I called the police. I called nine one one, and I said, you know, I don't know if this would be considered an emergency for anybody. I said, but it kind of is to me. And I told them, and they said, oh well, we're going to get somebody up there right away. Well, a police officer came out here. I thought they was in the fire department actually, but they sent a police officer. That police officer went through like 12 matches trying to relight the pilot light, you know, in my heater. Well, then he left because he couldn't do it. And he said, well, don't turn your your stove on to get warm. And I'm like, well, okay, what am I supposed to do then? So I just put a lot of extra clothes on. I'm usually hot natured. And when I get cold, it's cold. And anyway, so later on, I got thinking, well, what if that officer had turned on the gas? Because I've got, you know, gas heat, natural gas heat. And I thought, what if he did that? And the gas is still going. And I had drift all the way up the side of my door, my front door. You know, the snow was several feet deep. And after the snow gets so deep around your house, it kind of insulates it, you know. But then also the wind was blowing, and if it just kept blowing out the pilot light, but the gas was still going, and everything was plugged up around the house, I was worried about carbon monoxide poisoning, even though I've got a detector for it. Wow, but but the fire department, I, I they sent the fire department out here that time when I called back, and because I was getting scared, and I was I think scaring myself into feeling like there was a gas leak, even because I was starting to feel sick and stuff. But anyway, the fire department came out here. Three men, firemen, couldn't light the freaking pilot light. But they were trying to light it, and you had, it had to go in through a hole. You know, the match did to keep from to get to the pot to the gas to light the pilot. But what none of them thought about was if they had like a a grill lighter, you know, to stick in that hole that wouldn't blow out. None of them thought of that. And I had a big old box of those matches, you know, that you strike on the side of the box. They went through another dozen or two of them. So I had like 
two and a half dozen uh, used matches with five different men totally trying to light the pilot. And none of them did. So my son-in-law comes over another day or two later after it's, you know, I mean, we've got, like, three feet of snow, four feet, five feet snow drift. And he comes over. It takes him, like, 30 seconds to light it. Okay? It was lit. But it still don't work. It's not that the pilot light won't light. It's that the heater itself is messed up. So... I can't afford to get that fixed ever. I mean, I don't know how I would. But anyway, so this twenty dollar here is is pretty. I'm pretty happy with it, you know. Right. So you, she just you it over. Your, huh? You still haven't had your main heater re- replaced since all that incident happened. No, I can't afford to. Oh, wow, yeah. I'm on Social Security Disability, and my my rent takes up half my income, and it don't include no utilities. No, I I don't have nobody else to lean on financially. I don't have any real furniture either. I need furniture, but I I lost everything in 2019, And, and, and I had a lot more money then, you know, but my husband died. And then my son disappeared, and then it was just me. And I had a paid-for house and everything, but I don't know. Well, I, I own this trailer, but I have to pay the lot. And it's like almost $400 just to have the lot. Right, <laughs> yeah. the lot, right. I remember years ago that... How, uh, how much there is the new heater? How much is the new heater done? I have no idea. I know I can't afford it, though. I, I barely, I couldn't even pay my phone bill this month. My brother paid it for me. And it's only $28. Is your brother Jehovah's Witness, or? No, my brother's not a Jehovah's Witness anymore, either. He, oh, we were. A- that, 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 that explains everything. If he had been a Jehovah's Witness, he probably wouldn't have paid it for you. Statistically, I mean. Oh, well, he left me in a witness way before I did. I mean, I, I, be, I have been a, like a PEMO since 1993, but I didn't wow. want to leave my parents by themselves, and I stayed. My dad died in 2000, but my mama didn't die till 2006. And that's when I started to leave, but I still wasn't completely out for a couple more years. Wow. But. I'm still not out. I'm still floating in sometimes. But I heard, I think, Apostle Babe Linda James, she say uh, 85% floating. Really? Well, well, gr- Greg, listen, there's there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, look, if you're still trying to find, you know, your truth and what's what's right by your standards in your life, that's there's nothing wrong with that. I mean no, you I know still be a belt that way. Yeah. No, I no, I'm perfectly I know I know everything. I know what's true and what's false. That's not the problem. I feel it's the problem it's like a, Lots of my friends are Jehovah's Witness, and uh, I'm used to going there, and uh, I've been to other churches in my city also, and there are problems there also. They don't want to celebrate the Sabbath, and it really annoys me. Hmm. Are other religions or witnesses? A free, a free church in Sweden. They don't want to celebrate the Sabbath. Oh, really? Wait a minute, the mm-hmm. Sabbath or mm-hmm. or the Passover? Because that's two different things. Yes, I'm I'm talking about the Sabbath. It's supposed to be celebrated each Saturday, but the Catholic Church uh, changed the day in the beginning of 300th century. They changed God's day to Sunday, but they had no authority to do that. Yeah, but nowadays people work all different schedules. Not everybody 
can be off the same day of every week. That is true, but we are supposed to celebrate the intent of the law. So let's say I work on a Saturday, then I celebrate it on a Wednesday instead. Well, everybody has a day off, but I mean, what is celebrating it to you? What is? What do you mean? What do you do to celebrate it? Well, I'm supposed to have a day off resting, so maybe I prepared food some. Other Hello? Hello? Grace, are you still there? Hello? We're listening, Grace. Go ahead. Go ahead, Grace. We're listening. What are you, are you still there? I'm here, Hello? but what uh, happened to Tom? Uh, Tom mm -hmm. hasn't spoken in a while. Well, I, I don't want to interrupt. Oh, you're good, man. Look, you. Yeah, you I was just wondering what happened to you. I can't wait for you to say something. Oh, I'm trying to be polite, man. <laughs> well, speak hey, now. Well, you know what? You know what I've learned on this broadcast. If I if I don't interject when I want to speak something, I don't get I don't get heard <laughs> because That's like, right. everybody everybody has something to say on here, and if you don't say, hey, I have something to say, you don't get to get to be heard. <laughs> well, I'm I'm keep that in mind and don't kick me in the ass for doing it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> well, that means you just have some manners, Tom. That's nice. That's, manners yeah, are I good. Was yeah. up, I was brought up as a Jehovah's Witness. Definitely manners was a big part of that. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's why we never said mind your own business and everybody was in everybody's business. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know. I, just, I just want to give a shout out to Rick, to Rick, because even though he might not be listening right now, he's still letting the broadcast go on after all this time. He's been doing this for like twenty years. I mean, that's unfathomable for all yeah. the, all the all the stuff that he does, and and he just he lets it go on for as long as people want to tell their stories and talk about. The Jehovah's Witness community and XJW. He lets it go on like half a night sometimes. It's, it's, he's amazing. <laughs> yes, he is. Yeah, he's a wonderful yeah. person. Well, somebody said I had been naughty, so I was banned from the show. Oh, oh no. Who was that? Yeah, uh, that's why I did. What? That's why I was, uh, I, I was cut off because I have been naughty, they said. Well, you can what? be naughty. I've heard you be naughty. <laughs> I'm just, pull I'm well, just pulling. I'm just pulling your leg, but you believe oh. me. Oh, <laughs> I'm joking, too. I'm joking. Look, the only no, the not. only thing I would say, I, the only thing I would say is if there was the six hour brought the six hour um ex, what's it called expiration happened, where everybody gets cut off in the six hours. But the, it hadn't been six hours yet, so that wasn't the case That's here. Cool. So great. <laughs> no, I have a special phone here in speed, and I can only talk like four and a half hours. But, and okay. then I have to call back. But anyway, here is the deal. He usually sh turns off the YouTube and then only have the phone line going. But now the right. YouTube is still going. So I think yep. that Rick is actually sleeping. Thing. Otherwise, he would oh, turn it definitely. off. I think. Yeah, no, Rick is definitely snoozing right now. There's no question. Yes. <laughs> it's 20 minutes till three where Rick lives. <laughs> You're just tomorrow. No, but yeah. like last last uh, week, last last week they went until like three thirty four in the morning. And how do I remember that? Because I fell asleep and it was still going at like three thirty in the morning. Like it was crazy. <laughs> Well, you know what? I fell asleep too. When I woke up at, at way like about three or four o'clock in the morning, and it was still going, and I just could turn my phone off. <laughs> so I could go back to sleep. No, I I, I woke up. I I woke up like one o'clock, and I heard Rick saying on the show that I can wear slackers or pants, and I was so. Shocked, so I just jumped out of bed and I'm still not uh, calm. 
<laughs> I'm look. I'm still. I'm still in shock about this news. I just want to be honest. I didn't even tune into the program tonight until about 11:30 p.m. Eastern time, because, like I said, I was getting back from a meetup with Joe and Fran and a couple others. And mm-hmm. it, believe it or believe it or not, it was not until that meetup that I found out that this week that that uh, change in their policy organization procedure had changed about women wearing, being able to wear pants. And I, I swear to you, I swear to you guys, like right here and now, I told them at that meetup, I was like, are you guys serious? Has this change actually happened? They said, yes, it happened like yesterday. And I was like, my mind was blown at that point because Rick had already known. He told us weeks ago that this was going to happen and it happened. Did he not? He said, yeah, like, he sure did. He said, we're going to start happening really fast. And, but he didn't yeah, think he this. Knows. He knows. That's like, right. he has some kind of inside information. Rick knows. He's anointed. That's right. He but when Rick, brought, when, when Rick brought it up, I actually said, I think they're going to change these uh, slacker things soon. Wow. Because we have, it's a twi- like in Sweden, it's uh, sometimes twice as cold as in the freezer. So I think uh, I could wear like slackers in the winter when it's really cold, and then I can wear a dress or a skirt when it's... Uh, like fall or uh, spring or not that cold, I mean. You know what used to really what, what irritate me? What season is it there now? You know what used to really irritate me? <laughs> Growing up, I would see the the photos from Africa. Those guys always, they had white shirts, but they didn't wear ties or jackets. Yep. And it was like, why do we have to? It's all hot here in the summer also. You know, it never made sense to me. The, the restrictive policies, honestly, I mean, I respected them and, and, and followed them, but I did never made sense. It was, you know, there was no biblical reason for these things. And I never, they never sat right with me. Honestly, just in. Hey, Tom, my uncle yeah. used to be a missionary over in Africa. He didn't, back have to wear a tie. What? he didn't wear a tie or a jacket, did he? No, they didn't. I mean, and the thing is, uh, the brothers didn't always wear white shirts. They just wore whatever they could find. And, like, they had paper plates, and the sisters would wash the paper plates and, like, hang them up over vines to dry. And they would, you know, all pitch in and, you know, cook something. I mean, it, I mean I'm mean, i talking about, like, for an assembly and stuff that they did all that. But, but no, I mean, and sometimes the brothers, they wore shorts a lot, even to get off. It was just right. because they were very poor, and this and this was all you know. These were different tribes, literally tribes of people that you know were witnesses, and, and then sometimes the different tribes would come together, and each tribe had their own unique look, and they're usually the sisters. You know, always you, you see them. You know, the a lot of the black. Um, well, the black women over there that have the stuff on top of their head, you know, that they can walk around carrying. Yeah. But the sisters would have the, I, I want to say turban, that's what it reminds me of. And they would be, you know, they, they would have those. Uh, the colors were, to me, were beautiful because they they weren't afraid to wear bright, beautiful colors, you know, and the the outfits a lot of the sisters were were really really beautiful, even even from all the different tribes. It seemed like the women were able to. A lot of them wore the used the same fabric to make all their all the women's dresses out of. But that's just it. They all shared everything. You know, it, it was really nice. 
to see how the, the friends over there, but it's a completely different culture than the United States. But yeah, the thing, it, was, the, the thing that always got to me though was they would say that, that everything that applies in the United States applied in everywhere on the world. We were all united. And, but the thing is that we would see that we were not. It was different in different cultures. And there was never a good answer for why. It was just the way it is. Don't question it. And it never, I, I, I was one of the guys that just couldn't swallow it, even at a very young age, because I saw the hypocrisy. And now well, there's different the weather everywhere. And you had to, over in Africa, I mean, it's a lot of desert, you know. And dirt, it's I mean, and, and a lot of them wear shoes. It doesn't matter when it's 110 degrees here in New Hampshire and it's humid. Oh, I know, yeah. Well, yeah, how do you justify that? You, you can't. But listen, I, I grew up in the South. And, I mean, it, it was very uh, strict. I grew up in the Bible Belt in the United States, which is very strict. And then and when I got married in 1977, me and my husband moved <clears throat> from down south all the way up to Wyoming. And I remember we went like to a kingdom hall one time and one of the men came in and he had boots on and he had uh, his knife on him. You know, he'd been I mean, and he, he he came in wearing his hat and his boots and his knife and all the stuff that I, I was like, what on earth is happening? I thought, I can't believe that they allowed all that up there, but they did. It was a very different culture just from the south up to the north. I mean, in the United States, and I know it's, I live in Nebraska, and Man, and it and it's freezing cold, bitterly in the winter. And like you said, in New Hampshire, it's like that in Nebraska in the summer, 110, 112 degrees, sweltering heat. The only good thing different here in the summer is there's a breeze. The bad thing about winter is there's a breeze. You know, so it it. it it's just, it is what it is. No, no, it'd be below zero in the winter, and it'd be really hot in the summer. But the thing is that they claimed that everything was universal throughout the yeah. world. It wasn't, and that was the lie. They never actually explained it. They just said, you know, this is the way it is. Do like it or don't. You know, you're, you're going to wear your mm -hmm. suit coat, and you're going to wear your tie. And it's, it's just like that in every congregation. Every congregation, some congregations let things slide, and some yeah. are just, you know, if you if you sneeze wrong, you're in the back room getting counseled or just fellowship, you know? <laughs> they were really rigid in my congregation. You can still hear me, or? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you something. Yeah, because I heard Rick said something about uh, you can now greet uh, this fellowship, and I tried to look up it in the watchtower also a little bit about it. But I mean, how is this supposed to work? Has any gotten any explanation? In what way are we going to treat uh, this fellowship ones? I don't understand. Have there, has there, there been order? There hasn't been an official. Uh, <clears throat> there hasn't been an official update about this, has there? Well, in the in the talk from the uh, on the YouTube given, you know, by the governing body, it says they can greet you. Anybody can greet you, but they wouldn't uh -huh. want to have a conversation with you. 
Right. So which is that's a, ridiculous, which too. It's like saying, you can say this, but that's it. They're controlling how long you can speak. Yeah, and that's that's really interesting because uh, I, if y'all were listening earlier when, I, when Eric was still on, I was telling my story about my conversation with my mother tonight after four years of no contact. And um, she messaged me until probably close to an hour ago now. And uh, I, t I messaged her and I told her about what happened with the JWs in Norway because her last message to me was, what, what, uh, okay, after I said to her, I said, you, I said, I said, I warned you not twice. I warned you once. I warned you twice. You should have listened. Don't talk to me if you don't want to hear anymore because I told her about the beard policy and, uh, you know, all this 1914. I, I predicted that they're going to change other things like the 1914 uh -huh. teaching, flood doctrine, and only marrying in the Lord, because those are things that Rick has predicted. And basically everything that Rick has predicted recently has come true. So I told her, I said, look, these, these are potentially, potentially the things that are going to happen next. And I said, you know, what I said, and she says, what religion are you now, Aaron? I feel sorry, and we'll pray for you. And here's what I told her back. I said, there is corruption in all earthly organized religions. Child okay. sexual abuse is ran rampant in the Jehovah's organization. Norway Jehovah's Witnesses have lost their legal efforts to regain the state funding support that's offered to all religious organizations. And I predicted it won't be limited to Norway. I said, it means that they can't receive government funding or marry people anymore. And then I sent her the, uh, her the uh, inter <laughs> internet. <laughs> and, and so that's, that's the update so far, you know, like she, she probably went to sleep by now, but you know, I, I honestly, if I'm just being honest right now, I have the strength to accept the fact that I may not receive communication from her for the next, for the next four years. It's been four years. I can wait another four years. She's the one that reached uh -huh. out to me. She's, I didn't reach out to her and be like, hey, mom, how you doing? She said uh -huh. she wanted to reach out to me. The ball is in her court now at this point. I, I gave uh -huh. her warning. I gave her warning two or three times. I said, look, this is, this is not going to go anywhere. I said, you know, this, if you want to talk to me, you have to accept the fact that I'm not going to be a JW anymore. She continued the conversation, and I continued the conversation. So we're going to see how it goes from here on out. So she said she was going. She hasn't done it yet, but she was going to wear slacks at a certain point. She said. Yeah, like let me let me see. Uh, before she sent the picture, she said. Uh, Several of the brothers are now wearing beards. She said she's not worn pants yet, but I will sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Can you believe that? Yeah, I, did she, she, that. I did that really, recently, really closely, and that's a bold move. For I, I guess she must be older than you, so that's a bold move for a woman a bit up in the age and say that also. Yeah, look, she's, uh, I'm 41, right? Uh, almost 41. She's, she's exactly 30 years older than me. So she's 70. She's going to be 71 this year. And she's just going right along with the whole narrative that they're pushing. And, um, look, I remember my mom back in the 90s when I was growing up. She used to love to wear these little pantsuit type of thing. They they mm -hmm. were like a one piece, one piece jumpsuit type of deal, and mm -hmm. they had like they had like a flap in the back where you could drop it to, you know, do your business and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So she used to love to wear this type of thing, and I I think she would love to wear, you know, something similar like in a pants and maybe a two piece outfit, a, a, a mm -hmm. pair of pants and a, and a shirt. To, to cart witnessing or out or at the kingdom hall she would love to do that so now she's probably like yes 
the governing body said we can do it and I'm going to do it. You know, like just, she's a sheep. She's going right along with the narrative. It's, it's, it's just stunning to watch it. Mm-hmm. So now we can have a beard and uh, pants and the guy doesn't have to have a jacket or a tie unless he's going up on the scene. Yeah, she said that um she said that several of the brothers in her hall in, in Maryland, that's where she lives in Maryland, the United States, are wearing beards now. And she's she's just like eating it right up. She's loving it. The governing body are wearing beards too. Right, that's true. I I, actually, I remember um in the um late nineties, early two thousands. Uh, an elder and his best friend was a ministerial servant, and they really were questioning the beard policy. And actually, uh, they both ended up leaving because I think they actually found Raymond Francis' book and stuff, but they couldn't talk about it. But, you know, um, they, you know, uh, I'm just saying, you know, it was, there was never any reasonable answer. I remember the, the, um, the elder that I was studying with told me about them writing to the society and the society, uh, you know, basically the reason why they dressed like they did in no beards was because of Wall Street and stuff like that, you know, and, if they're going to be representing in a business sense, then they they weren't allowed to have beards, but there was no scriptural reason. And there was never any good reason ever. And a lot of people just didn't swallow that, you know. And the same thing now. Now, all of a sudden, they're realizing, Jesus Christ, you know, <laughs> we can't keep playing this stupid game. You know, these people aren't falling for it, you know. And, like, so we gotta smarten the hell up if we want to keep people in because there's no reason why we can't make you happy. There's no reason why they have to wear a tie. We just said they right. do. There's no reason why women have to wear friggin' dresses. We just said they do. You know? And yeah, look, I think, yeah, you know, it's all smartening up. They, they they're losing people and they have to smarten up. That's exactly yeah. right. It's all it's all about what the governing body says it's okay to do. And yeah, it's and, always know, been, it's always been that way. Yeah, well, they but they were so secure before because it didn't matter what they did. They still everybody stayed, and they were constantly growing. So, you know, it was working for them. But now it's not anymore. So now they have to change. It's not like yeah, they, they have to. And yeah, and look but at the, the look reason, at the, but the reason the reason they didn't get any money from Norway was. Uh, was the major reason was the shunning or, or, or the blood door. But the shunning was a big deal for Norway. So I think it's because of Norway, like they say. It's all about the money. Right. I, I agree. sent my mom that story. I would have to agree with you as far as, as, far as their new policy on disfellowship in children. I think that is 100% directed, I mean, connected to the Norway thing. They're, they're all shunning this fellowship in policy. They're not going to change the shunning thing, especially the reason why they don't want anybody that is suspected of being a, uh, 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 somebody that is an apostate because they do not want them, um, you know, is, if, if they suspect or are labeled as an apostate, then those people cannot actually make sense to the other people with the information that they know. You know, that's mm-hmm. their only protection but, as far as that goes. But they are still shunning. They are still shunning. If they shun a state, then they are still shunning. And if you Especially can just the greet the person, yeah. if you can just greet the person, but you cannot talk to them, they, then you are still shunning this person. So I don't but, think but, the Norway like, government... I don't think the Norway government will fall for it. I don't think so. Right. I like to say that um, I, I don't know if I'm not trying to promote this or anything, but I, 
I dabble in different things, right? Like there's this channel called Berean Tickets and uh it's ran by a a, a former elder uh of more than Somebody thirty told years. Tell me about that. Yeah, Berean Pickets. The Eric, his name is Eric his brother Eric Wilson. And um he came out with a a thing saying, well, his definition he did research and his definition of an apostate is uh, someone that has left Christianity altogether, and I feel like if if you're if you're a former Jehovah's Witness and you still believe in the the Bible, you still study the Bible, and you believe in the Bible's teachings, you're not an apostate. You're still a Christian. That's not an apostate. An apostate is someone that has completely rejected all the Bible's teachings and Christianity altogether. That's what he said the definition means. So I, I stand. I think he's spot on with that. Now that's just my opinion. I, I, I I'm going along with that. Well, hey, can I agree but with you? Before it was also... like an apostate was somebody who left their parents' religion. I think wasn't it before? Can, no, I thought an apostate was someone who just changed their belief system from one religion to another or to nothing. But I think to Jehovah's Witnesses, it's if you preach against any of their policies, if you yeah. have information to try to uh, convince them that what they believe is not true, that's all they need. I think that's the biggest thing for them. I don't think that they care about what other people's definition is. If there's anybody right. that's teaching anything that contradicts what they believe, then you are an apostate. So, right. so basically, if if they found out that that we are uh, taking part in an apostate um, platform on YouTube, they would right. label, easily label us an apostate, even though. Right. Not a part. Some of us aren't apostates. I really try not to, you know. I do my best to not um, say anything, you know, against them and their beliefs. You know, I mean, I may may bring up facts, but not in a way that is uh, pushing them away from what they believe or anything like that. But if they knew that I was, that's why you know a lot of people do not want their name. Associated with what we're doing right now, our conversation right now, you know, they know right. I'm Tom from McDonald. I mean, Tom from uh, from from New Hampshire. And right. if if my children heard my voice, you know, they would know. Hey, that's Dad, um, and yeah. he's in an apostate channel, so he must be an apostate. So I can't talk to him anymore. But thankfully, but, they're not be on this channel. But uh, it's all it takes. Right. To it's, it's but here's the thing. The definition but Tom, into them. But Tom, here's the thing. You don't know if potentially your children might be watching this channel. You you don't know. Maybe they're watching it and they're not saying that they're watching it to you because they want to reconcile within their own minds and themselves that hey, that what I'm hearing is might be potentially questioning everything I've ever been taught. You know what I mean? Type of deal. So oh, no, you, that's, you don't, you know, that's perfect. You don't really know. That. Right. That would be, that would be ideal. But I mean, yeah. it, it, that's, that's all it would take for them. Though. You know what I mean? I, I actually, oh. my ex-wife actually, I, I had told her, I said, you've got to stop talking to me about religion because, you know, if, if you keep doing that and I, I have to start defending what I believe, you kind of think I'm a apostate. Well, she took that and ran and said that I was an apostate. She said that I said I was an apostate. And she was actually all prepared to turn my children to never talk to me again because all I said was, if you keep talking to me about religion, you're going to start thinking that I'm an apostate. That's all I said. Don't talk to me about religion because you ain't going to like what I have to say. You know? Right. So, and that's so, exactly... That's yeah, exactly what I told my mom in the text. I, that's exactly what I told her. I said, don't talk to me if you don't want to listen to what I have to say. 
Right. <laughs> yeah, that's what I said to my mom too. You know, and you know. So actually, I brought something up to my son the other day. He was like, "Dad, we already agreed we're not going to talk about this stuff." Yeah. You know? like, sorry, son. I wasn't really. You know, I didn't mean to get into this. I'm sorry. It was. I was talking to him about the blood thing because of my situation, a medical situation. But he was like, because I was telling him how the blood policy is wrong and all that stuff. And he was like, you know, you're, you're sounding like an apostate. So he had to warn me to be careful what I said. Because if mm. he thought that I was being an apostate, then he was not going to be able to talk to me anymore. Hey, you know? Tom. Do you, yeah. Tom, do you think it's possible that he might already think you're an apostate and just be letting it slide because he doesn't want to not have a relationship with you? Well, no, yeah, just because I've been, I guess, I mean, all his life, you know, and so, yeah, he already knows, but as long as I don't do it too, and he's safe, he, he, he can have a clear conscience, you know what I mean? I yeah, he knows, he knows, he knows, because you know? I was raised in it, you know, and obviously I never took to it, you know, and mm. you know, so, yeah, he knows, but the thing is, I just can't say it to him, and that's cool, mm. you know, I got, I appreciate that, and I respect that. Hey, uh, I, I'm, I just Googled the word apostate, although I know the witness meaning might be completely different. But the right. actual word apostate is someone who renounces a religious or a political belief or principle. Now, that doesn't mean that they have to renounce Christianity. They just could say, I'm not going to be a Catholic anymore, but I'm going to be a Baptist. That just means that they're renouncing that religion. And, it, and that's just one of the me and it says like after 50 years an apostate as an apostate he returned to the faith okay that's one yeah. example and then the other one says it means to abandon abandon the adjective is abandoning a religious or political belief or or a principle and uh an apostate well, here's the other one. Uh, apostasy. Uh, some apostasy. They re they do refer to the total rejection of Christianity mm -hmm. by a baptized person having right. at one professed the Christian faith publicly, and then they reject right. it. Right. So and I it, literally cannot. So that's just not. one definition. But that's no, just one definition. According to that, I can never be labeled an apostate because I was never baptized. But, mm. but, but, and the thing is, um, if so, the fact that I associate with apostate um, channels and talk to you guys, um, that is my crime. That's it. But I am not, I do not preach to Jehovah's Witnesses against Jehovah's Witnesses. You know what I mean? I'm not an active apostate that way. Um, the only way I could be considered an apostate is because I do, uh, um, you know, I participate in apostate uh, YouTube uh, forums. That's it. I don't. Oh, I, apostate. I really do not claim to be an apostate. I just agree with a lot of things that. Everybody says, and but I was never baptized, so I can never actually literally be deemed an apostate. Okay, here's the literal meaning of apostate. It is, and this was the, the, the one I always followed, it is a person who abandons his religion, party, mm. calls, etc., I'm an apostate because I did abandon my religion. From that standpoint, I'm an apostate. But, but, but you were baptized, but you the other definition is you did you didn't abandon Christianity altogether, right? That you didn't you right. say that's one of the possible events. One of them. There's several different right. there's several 
different explanations of right. it. Now, in the Bible, apostatized is borrowed from the med- medieval Latin apostatari or something, of uh, late Latin apost air verbal derivative of apostero. Never mind. I'm going to read that. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> I don't want to say. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm not really an apostate. I just I I, I understand and sympathize with apostates, and I do not agree with I do not agree with organized religion. I do agree that Jehovah's Witnesses is definitely a high control group and possibly a cult. And um, the only you know you know I, and but I do also agree that you know. Um, Having grown up that way, um, I learned different moral values that a lot of people wouldn't actually, I wouldn't have had that opportunity to become the person that I am today without all that information, even though it was, you know, thrown at me in the wrong way and there were a lot of lies and all that other stuff. But, you know, know, there are benefits and... So, you know, I mean, I'm, I don't know. I honestly don't. That's I just know. I see, I see so many elderly people that are still witnesses. And it's like, how can you still swallow this? You know, and I know it's all a bunch of bull and lies. And it was a business and not an actual religion. You know, and all mm-hmm. that stuff. So, but I can't, I mean, I can't take my away from it. I can't take my mom. You know, she's just in the twilight of her years, and she's ready to go. But I tell you what, if people, if it wasn't for the witnesses, she would have a very, very bad, you know, her life her would be, her, her quality of life would be a lot worse um, because she has many sisters, I mean, uh, blood sisters that are witnesses, and they take care of her, and the witnesses themselves are are readily available and she really enjoys her meetings and she enjoys the association and the brotherhood and you know so there's a lot of like, very good things to be said about it you know so i would never want to take that away from her and that's why i was like do not talk to me about religion mom because you ain't gonna like what i have to say you know right. I want to happy in your bubble you know and and, and tom and Tom, I, I respect what you're saying about your, you and your mom because it, in my opinion, it parallels what's going on with me and my own mom. Um, and, and the fact that, you know, you, you feel, you seem like you feel like she respects what uh, support she is receiving from the organization. I can, I can appreciate Not the that. The from the people. Right, the good people, the people, the people in the people in the organization. Right, right, right. and that is I, a blessing. I don't understand where your mom's coming from because that's one thing I really do miss about being in the you know in the congregation, being a witness. I did feel like I always had somebody I could go just call and hang out with or something. And since I moved to Nebraska in 2007, uh, I I haven't had a good friend like I did before I moved here. And I mean, and I know a lot of my friends left the organization, but um, one of my best friends went back. Because she, I mean, after several years, she missed her mom and her sister and her son um, and went back just for, I know that's the only reason she went back. She tried to say it wasn't the only reason. But listen, I just, I I Googled what an apostate is, but there's a whole sec, just what is an apostate of a Jehovah's Witness? Listen to what Watchtower Society, this really irritates me. Watchtower Society literature 
says apostates are motivated by vitriolic bitterness and that their writings are poisonous, distorted, and false and display the characteristics of cunning, contrived error, prideful intelligence, lack of love, and dishonesty and are designed to undermine the faith of Jehovah's Witnesses. That wow. is soul based lie. That wow. really that really irritates me bad. That is wrong. Mm. Man. But they don't know uh, that. Because obviously anything that they write is gold and it is inspired by God. So that's what they believe. And we have to right. respect that. Huh? We have no choice but to respect that and to understand that and to try to not fit into that mold when we talk to them, if we want to continue to talk to them. You know, and that's, you know, where, but we were, we were trained well growing up to, like I said, we had learned how to lie and to lie by omission just so that we didn't get beat to the, you know, and, um, oh, we didn't get this fellowship or whatever the hell. Anyways, we all learn to do that, so it's easy for us to do that with them, you know. So, okay, guess what? Uh, I don't agree with what you're saying, but I can easily dismiss it and just continue to love you because you're my mom. You know? mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Amen. Amen, brother. I feel the same way. Wow. Same with my son, you know. I mean, I feel guilty that, you know, that, you know, I pushed him into that. But I also felt that, you know, at the time I was studying and I was getting back into it and I agreed with it. And I also knew that, guess what, if it wasn't for the truth, supposed truth, I would have been uh, associated with a lot of bad characters and I would have picked up some bad habits and I would have been in a lot of the bad situations that a lot of people were in. So it was kind of a right. It really was. So I really, that's how I justified it with my kids. You know, it's kind of, it was kind of So, the, it, you know, it's like, and it works. It works for him anyways, not my daughter. She finally, she, she was like a spring that was held too tight. And now she took off and she's doing her own thing. But she still got a lot of good common sense and a good moral basis to, you know, keep her grounded. And I have a feeling that she's going to be okay, but, um, you know, but she, you know, she, she got baptized at a young age and I was totally against it, but she did it anyways. And she even admits if she had to wait until she's 18, she wouldn't have got baptized, but she got baptized. Uh-huh. At 18, so he's paying the consequences of that, you know, but, but anyway, she started, just, you know, has she, it's, has she, has she started to wake up at all yet, or you don't know? Not really. She doesn't. She 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 well, she woke up about herself. You know, she just realized that it wasn't for her and that she was living a lie. And, you know, so she decided to go on her own. But she is not ready to uncover the lies of the association. You know, and what she was taught because she just is she's in that mental mindset that. Like I was when I left physically, you know, the world's going to end and I'm going to die for my sins and I'm just going to have fun, you know, I'm going to do what I got to do, you know, so uh, but she's also got also a little bit more of a grounded uh, and positive situation going on than I did. So I think she'll be okay, you know, but, you know, I, I went through that and I understand it. It took me a while to, you know, get my in my life back in line. But when I left, it was like, hey, it doesn't matter what I do because I'm going to die anyways. You know what I mean? And that's a terrible thing about that religion when it comes to young people leaving because that's what they feel. They believe that if I'm not, you know, a, a good witness and I'm going to die at Armageddon and Armageddon's coming tomorrow. You know? So mm-hmm. it doesn't matter what I do. And so we make a lot of students and also, we don't know who we are. We have no idea. You know, people say, just be yourself. It's like, how do I be myself? I don't even know who I am because 
I was always told who to be, you know. And so I'm sure she's going through that and learning how to be herself and, you know, and making bad friends and bad choices and learning from it because, you know, that's already happened. And, you know, I, I know I went through that now. Some of us get to it and some of us don't, and hopefully she does, but at least she has a dad that cares that she can call, and, and that's more, you know, that's more than a lot of kids have when they leave. Uh, so. Amen. Amen, bro. That's true. Yep. Hey, Aaron, you, uh, to me, you, you come across as such a mature man i mean mm. you you paid off your house and everything mm. i mean you a lot of i mean you were able to send me retire young i mean i've right. always admired your um your tenacity to get things done you know you set your mind to something and you do it i just want right. to say i've always really admired that about you well, I, Debbie, I appreciate that. And, you know, the thing about it is whenever I come across this conversation with other people, not only people that are in the XJW community, but also those that are, let's say, for example, people that I come across in um, in my car where I'm giving people rides, you know, because like I said, I'm a Lyft driver. And, and uh, that's my, that's what I do now. So I like to talk to people, and I come across people of various backgrounds and faith and everything else from day to day to day, and I talk to people, and I talk to them about this sometimes. It, it, I have to feel it out. I have to feel out whether I'm willing to tell people about my situation or not. And the people that I am willing to tell about my situation, that I, that I tell it, I have to say, you know, this is my situation and it's just, it's just something that happened. It's just a decision that I made when I was like 17, 18 years old. I looked at my situ situation at home and I said, look, my parents are in their forties. They just bought their house, which is the truth. They bought their home and 96, 97, that was when they first bought their house. And I said, at that time, even though I was like 14, 15, I said, that's not going to be me. I said, I'm not going to be 14, 15 years old. And in this situation, to have a home mortgage, all that the stuff that goes along with it. So when I got to until my late teens, even though I was getting involved with a JW marriage at that time, I never wavered from my original thesis, my original perspective in life. I never wavered from it. I said I wanted to buy a house. I said I did it. The mortgage was always in my name. It was never in her name. She was added to the deed of the home because... She said to me, she said, well, Aaron, if you're going to pay for the house and all this stuff, and I'm just going to live in it, what am I gonna, why am I just going to live in it when I don't have a part in it? So her part, her part in it was that she had a, a deed, uh, a place in the deed of the home because that's just how it was, right? And what it just so happened that when I left the organization, we stayed married for yeah, a few years after that. And, and she kept badgering me at, every now and then. She's like, hey, Aaron, did you find anyone else yet? Because we were like divorced and all that stuff by that point. And, uh, you know, I, I was like, well, no, at that time, like, oh, I haven't seen a need to get into a new relationship yet, you know, blah, blah, blah. But it came to a point where, like, I had to find someone else, so I did. And I 
I had to write a letter or whatever was the, you know, thing you had to do with uh, people in the JW organization. So I did that. So I released her from her obligations in her marriage, her former marriage, et cetera. And yeah, it, it was just, it was an interesting experience. And at that point, she released her half of the deed of the home to me. So at that point, from 2012 on, the home was in my name only. Not just the loan, because the loan was always in my name. It was only her. It was only me from that point on. She had nothing else to do with it. So, yeah, that's that's kind of my story. You know? I, well, I, I just, yeah. Aaron, Aaron, you lost your yeah. friends. I got divorced after, I, I was married for 23 years. And, wow. yeah, and I would say the last 10 years were torture. Um, but she, she, she ended up, you know, after we, she, when we got married, uh, she wasn't a witness at all. And she, be, she, we studied and she became a witness and she became a pioneer and all that. And then we had two kids. And my thing was, I did not want my kids to have to move because I used to move a lot when I was a kid in the South. And so I let her have the house. Um, and everything pretty much. I lost just about everything in my divorce. So you could feel that you got to keep your house. Now, I did finally buy it. I was able to. I lived in a camper on uh, a relative's land. And I just paid him minimal rent just to have my camper there and to use a shower and all that. And, um, <clears throat> but I refused to pay full rent because there's no way I could save money. So I saved money and got my credit really good. And then I bought a house just before the pandemic, the December of 2019 before the pandemic. Hit. And, uh, you know, so now I'm back, you know, in the game as far as that goes. But yeah, I was like 50 years old when I bought the house, you know. So it's going to be, you know, I'm going to have to pay it off before I retire, hopefully, you know. I'll, I'll work on that. But the thing is that you have got to keep your house. I did not. And right. And that's the thing, you know. But. And I stayed well, for a few years because I took my marriage vows very serious. It was still death to us part. And she's the one who ended up filing. So I just signed the papers. And it's like, yeah, you can have the house, but I'm keeping my stuff. And you know, Hey, I don't want to be just interrupting, but my phone, my, I've got a third phone going dead now. So I got to get off. Uh -oh. So I'm going to oh, tell you guys. No. Yeah, you're just going to miss me. I'm sorry. And I wanted to find out about all about that girl you met, Aaron, but my phone's dead, so I can't. You'll have to, you'll have to tell me on Messenger, okay? Okay, Debbie. Okay. And, and, and you're, old, you're young enough to be my son. I actually got two kids older than you, so you just consider that I'm your uh, ex- your uh, your new mom that's not a witness, but still Debbie, not your look, mom. Yeah, yeah. Listen, Debbie, you're you're like my godmother right now. Like I seriously oh, okay. consider you. Okay. <laughs> well, I am for I'm Eric, JT, and Brad. I'm I'm I just am collecting sons here. I I feel like I lost <laughs> mine, but you know, I'm making up for it since. I don't have him anymore, but you now I've got all you guys. So, oh, Debbie, okay. I love you so much. I appreciate you. I, I really love, love you. to connect with you. I I love you. I just love. I love so many people. I feel like my love has just grown exponentially with the XJW community, community and it's given me a purpose for my life right. because for a long time I didn't think I. I always was wondering. I always. Wonder, wondered what my purpose was, and I feel like I found it, you know, because I get sent lots of lots of people leaving the organization who don't feel like they've got a friend, 
or nobody to talk to, and I'm there, you know. I'm I'm there, and I'm always, well, I'm usually available. Sometimes I just get too tired to do a, to do a whole lot, but, you know, I've got some health problems, but, and I'm very physically uh, limited with what I can do. But still, I'm a listening ear, and I'm an open heart, and a, a, a warm person. And I just want to help as many as I can and let people know there is life after being a witness and that we'll have real friends and family. Good right. night, guys. My phone uh, is uh, actually dead any second completely. Okay, okay. good night. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Good night, Gabby. Bye bye. All right. Who else is still with us? The Grace, are you still with us? Yes, I'm here. All right. So, Grace, can you tell me what? How is life in your Sweden? You're in Sweden, right? Uh huh. It's winter in Sweden still. I, l- listen, I hear Sweden is an amazing place to live. So tell me, how do you like life there? No, it used to be amazing before the Muslims came. Oh. Mhm. So now we have we have uh, problems with everything. I feel. Is your crime in control? Well, huh? Did your crime increase because of them? I think so, but I don't have the statistics. But I know, I think, uh, like, uh, at least I know this, that people from Afghanistan, they are, they are, statistically, they are in the highest rate of, uh, like, when uh, a bunch of, uh, of several people rape one single person. And they are in a higher rate, even of raping men also. So. You have a lot of fun. Or they have a strange culture. They have uh, dancing boys and things in their country. So. You have a lot of They bring the, the problem is that they bring their culture into Sweden and start doing the bullshit here. So we have problems here. They are burning police cars, throwing stones at the police. They are just wow. acting like we don't have those kind of problems in Sweden. We used to be a paradise. When I was wow. a child, Sweden was a paradise. There hardly ever anything happened here. But now it's just uh, like on I could see on other countries on television. That's what happened in Sweden now. So, wow, not so good anymore. No. Do you have? A but I mean, doctor? we do have. We have a good dental care in Sweden. We have good health care for everybody. I mean, compared to United States, there are a lot of advantages. We don't have stay-at-home moms uh, hardly. No. Uh, we have good daycare centers, and uh, we have problems in Sweden also. Do you can, uh, do you have the homelessness problem and the? Um... Well, I don't know. It's not as big as you have, because Swedish government they rather have a Swedish person like 75 years old living outside and freezing. But if you come from another country, they decide that then they have to give you some place to live. So they treat foreigners better than people who build up Sweden. They do that here too. It's terrible. How about drugs? Is drugs a big problem again? Well, we have drugs, but I don't think we have as big problems as... uh, just my opinion. I'm, I haven't read any statistics, but you see all those people who live outside, people, lots of people from Mexico, they live outside in the uh, United States. We don't have that many people who live outside as you do. You have much more than we do. Hmm. Hmm. 
America, America is more fun because you have more churches and you can go to church and uh, nice songs and uh, just in Sweden only 8% of the population is active Christian so like you're um, it's really hard here because if I talk to somebody they will say well the Bible is a fairy tale and you're stupid and all the what so it's not so nice those kind of things yeah Well, we're, I live in up north uh, where it's cold in the winter, so we don't have the homelessness problem in the winter. As you know, so they all head south, and then they come back in the summer. But it doesn't get as bad as a lot of the cities, you know. So it's really mm-hmm. not as bad, but it's still we have a lot of drug problems. A lot of family members that I know and friends of them that have fallen victim to um, the fentanyl and the methamphetamines, mm-hmm. things like that, where their lives are actually pretty much destroyed. You know, they're useless people because of the amount of drugs that are coming through, and it's so easy for them. And, yeah, we have that. Other than that, you know, we... It's still fairly uh, safe, you know, where I'm at. But, I, you know, it's still, it's still, we see it and definitely not as bad as the big cities. But, you know, uh, yeah, I'm just, just curious how it was over there. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Oh, but I love Sweden. I just don't like when people say anything bad about Sweden. It's like talking bad about my mother or something. I get really angry. <laughs> like, if you want to piss me off, say something about Sweden or my mother. Then you will have me after you chasing. <laughs> it's not possible. It's not possible. <laughs> I didn't live. So you live there, uh, Ryan? Are you Ryan or Aaron? Aaron, yes. Aaron. So yeah. you live in uh, Del- where do you live? Maryland. Del Delaware, United States. My mother Delaware. lives in Maryland. She's one state away from me. Right. Well, when I was a young, um, years and years ago, I lived in. Um, Virginia, and it was it was not very pleasant down there back then, <laughs> and I can't imagine it's very pleasant now. Uh, yeah. There was a lot, you know, a lot of all, all the problems in the country seem to be there. <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah, I, I was checking the map today uh, at the, at the gathering. Uh, the uh, the the gathering with the uh, XJWs today that I went to, and um, what ha- what happened was I found that I checked the app, the map, and West Virginia is like Virginia and West Virginia is west of Maryland, so yeah, it's like west to the west, yeah. That's where it is. I just remember it's close. I don't. <laughs> but yeah, I lived in um, 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 when I was, you know, like seven, eight, not first, second, and third grade. We lived down like in um, uh, Manassas, Virginia. Like we were, you know, pretty close to DC. Uh, my old, my stepdad was working down there. Um, and there was a lot of, you know, a lot of poverty and crime back in the late 70s when I was there. Um, and I know it has not gotten any better. So I, and, but up here in New Hampshire, I, when I was a kid, you know, I used to, I used to walk a couple of miles to go to kindergarten. And 
everybody knew who I was, you know. I mean, everybody washed up for uh, other kids and stuff like that, you know. But I remember being down there and kids were being stolen left and right, you know, back then. And I know it hasn't gotten any better. Um, yeah, I, I actually got mugged at, uh, with a by knife when I was, you know, in first grade for my lunch money back when I was down there. Up here, you know, that stuff doesn't happen. You know, so it's pretty, pretty, it's pretty, you know, it's just different all over the country, you know, in different areas. I don't know how Delaware is, but I, I always thought Delaware was really close to Virginia, you know. And I figured you guys, the, the poverty and the crime um, that we had when I was in Virginia, I it was terrible. That was the worst place I ever lived. I had more near-death experiences in Virginia for those two years than I've had in my whole life. <laughs> oh. I wow. Know. I I had a friend. I I met an ex Jehovah's Witness friend in uh, here. I was married in 2004. So I met a friend through 2006, 2007, somewhere around there. So she was in the organization at that time. But when my I left the organization in 06, my wife, we got divorced in 2010. And I kept tabs with this friend at some point and uh she still tries to contact me today her name is cindy oh no and that was my ex-wife's name cindy wow nice yeah. and I, look there's so much involved it, 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 what happened with her she's just tired yeah yeah she She's still dealing with the drama and everything that happened in her life. It got to the point where she feels like she might need to go back to the organization of JWs because she wants the stability of the JWs. Yeah. And I try to tell I try to tell her like, look, this is you have to really think about what you're talking about here, you know, because you're saying. You want to go back to this organization, and this organization is an organization of men. It's not from God, right? Yeah. <laughs> like you need to find out what what you, what's good for you in your life. And she wants me. She just texted me tonight. She's like, "Oh, Aaron, can you come down and help me with these different things?" And I didn't respond to her yet. But I'm just like, hey, I don't even know you anymore. Like, it's been like five, six years since we even talked. I'm like, why are you even texting me now? You know? Careful. Just be careful. Because, you know, are, are you in another relationship yet or no? I, I'm not technically, but I'm in the process of meeting someone. I met yep. someone the other right. night. And Tuesday night, we have a, a date, quote-unquote date, to meet and, uh, like, maybe have a karaoke night. So mm -hmm. I think it's going to yeah. be I think yeah. it's gonna be good for me and her. But yeah, well, Cindy, Cindy's going to do everything she can to fuck that up for you, just saying. She's my friend. She's yeah. Stay the hell away. But, yeah, right. my, my ex, actually, she... She called, and I was actually living with another woman finally after I'd never swore I'd ever get another relationship, but I met my best friend, and and, and um, so, yeah, we were living together, and she was actually calling me, trying, she's like, especially after the pandemic, she's like, Tom, you need to come home, you know, and she would call, and she would end with, I love you, and all that stuff. She had no right doing it. She's the one who filed the divorce. We got divorced, and she knows I'm in a relationship, and I'm happy. And she was, you know, trying to uh, manipulate me, and <clears throat> it was working. I mean, kind, you know what I mean? I mean, Christ, we were married for 23 years, you know what I mean? You obviously, wow. wanna, you know, second-guess yourself and all that stuff. And, and um, yeah, so anyways, just be careful.
raffle. That's all. You know, give yourself yeah. a chance. Give yourself a chance because I'm telling you that it is. I never thought it was possible. I totally swore off women. I was never going to have a relationship, but I just ended up fucking meeting this woman. We became friends. No intention, none at all. And um, and happier than a clam. You know, we were we were together for five years. We had three arguments. You know, after five years of, of of living together, actually, she moved in with me in my camper. I was staying in a camper, saving my money, and she moved in. She actually paid for her apartment still, but she stayed with me in my camper, and we just became best friends. And um, I I bought a house, and then we got married last January. So, wow. yeah, but I, I swear I'd never do that, but I ended up doing it because I did finally meet the right person, you know, and I'm happy. Wow. She's not happy. She doesn't like it when I get on this, uh, yeah. open, you know, and she, she is a little upset that I'm sitting here talking to you guys when I should be in bed or whatever. <laughs> you know, this is like our biggest argument, I think. <laughs> Well, well, look, she she doesn't control you or your life or what you do. So, yeah. Well, she's still going to love me tomorrow. Yeah, it ain't going to matter. <laughs> but, uh, like, is that, like, you know, that's the maximum, you know. This is like, you know, it's not even a big deal. Is, so, is Debbie still... Know, is Debbie still, still is, is, right, oh, no, I is, definitely uh, will. I, I don't... Her name is Cindy. And yeah, look, <laughs> Total I, have not re- I haven't responded to her yet, but I yep. keep thinking about yep. it. I want to, I want to let it mull in my mind, well, decide well, what I'm going to tell her. But uh, I might not respond to her at all, or I might just tell her like, "Look, we don't really have a relationship anymore because it's been so long, and since you left." So, you know, you went to West Virginia, this is Delaware, and she's just not in my life anymore, right? Yeah, she's the one who left you, right? Yeah, absolutely. And her name is Cindy. As a friend. Yeah, I I don't know. All I know is it's very easy because you were, were you raised a witness? I certainly was. I, I was born in 83, and I yep. was raised as a JW from that point on. Yeah. yeah. Well, so you were you were imprinted in your head that marriage is for life. And obviously, even if you had a court, you made that commitment that, you know, part of you wants to think that maybe you can make it. You know what I mean? I'm honest. I'm just telling you from my experience. This is what I thought. You know what I mean? And <clears throat> but you know, it's it's so easy to forget the bad times. You know, I, you know, it's just easy to do that because you obviously fell in love with her for a reason. And same with me and my act. I, you know, that. She was a good person, you know, but she, yeah, her true colors came out later and it didn't work and it is not going to work. And, you know, and I'm just glad that I never got back into it because I would be right back into the same goddamn thing. Okay. She's going to be good for a little while and then it's going to turn into exactly the same bullshit stuff when we got separated because she ain't going to change. She's just going to be at her best behavior, just like when we were dating. She was in her best behavior, you know, and the day we got married was the last day I got to see most of my best friends, you know? Wow. And, you know, I don't know about you, but that's just the way it was. Once we got married, it was like the tables turned and, and I just kept being the guy that was, according to Joe's witnesses, is to let yourself be wronged, you know? So I just let myself be wrong for years and years and years. And then finally it was like, Jesus Christ, how many, how long can I be wrong? I know I'm right. 